Introductions to the Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Introductions by John Kournos and Edward J. O'Brien. When Edward J. O'Brien asked me to cooperate with him in choosing each year's best English short stories to be published as a companion volume to his annual selection of the best American short stories, I had not realized that at the end of my arduous task, which has involved the reading of many hundreds of stories in the English magazines of an entire year, I should find myself asking the simple question, what is a short story? I do not suppose that a hundred years ago such a question could have occurred to anyone. Then all that a story was and could be was implied in the simple phrase, tell me a story. We all know what that means. How many stories published today would stand this simple if final test of being told by word of mouth? I doubt whether fifty percent would. Surely the universality of the printing press and the linotype machine have done something to alter the character of literature, just as the train and the telephone have done not a little to abolish polite correspondence. Most stories of today are to be read, not told. Hence great importance must be attached to the manner of writing. In some instances the whole effect of a modern tale is dependent on the manner of presentation. Henry James is, possibly, an extreme example. Has anyone ever attempted to tell a tale in the Henry James manner by word of mouth, even when the manner pretends to be conversational? I, for one, have yet to experience this pleasure, though I have listened to a good many able and experienced tale-tellers in my time. Now, there is a great connection between the manner or method of a writer and the matter upon which he works his manner or method. Henry James was not an accident. Life, as he found it, was full of trivialities and polite surfaces, and a great deal of manner, style, if you like, is needful to give life and meaning to trivial things. And James was, by no means, an isolated phenomenon. In Russia, Chekhov was creating an artistic significance out of the uneventful lives of the petty bourgeoisie, whose hitherto small numbers had vastly increased with the advent of machinery and the industrialization of the country. As the villages became towns, the last vestiges of the romantic and heroic elements seemed to have departed from contemporary Russian literature. As widely divergent as the two writers were in their choice of materials and methods of expression, they yet met on common ground in their devotion to form, their painstaking perfecting of their expressions, and this tense effort alone was often enough the very life and soul of their adventure. They were like magicians, creating marvels with the flimsiest of materials. They did not complain of the poverty of life, but as often as not, created bricks without straw. Not for them Herman Melville's dictum to be found in Moby Dick, to produce a mighty book you must choose a mighty theme. Roughly, then, there are two schools of creative literature, and round them there have grown up two schools of criticism. The one maintains that form is everything, that not only is perfect form essential and interesting material non-essential, but that actually interesting material is a deterrent to perfect expression, inasmuch as material from life, inherently imaginative, fantastic or romantic, is likely to make an author lazy and negligent and cause him to throw his whole dependence on objective facts rather than on his ingenuity in creating an individual atmosphere and vibrant patterns of his own making. The other school maintains with equal emphasis that form is not enough, 
that it wants a real and exciting story, that where a man's materials are rich and big, the necessity for perfection is obviated. Indeed, rough edges are a virtue. As one English novelist tersely put it to me, I don't care for the carving of orange pips. All I ask of a writer is that his stuff should be big. Undoubtedly some people prefer a cultivated garden, others nature in all her wildness. Nature, it is true, may exercise no selection. Unfortunately, it is too often forgotten that she is all art in the wealth and minuteness of her detail. It seems to me that both theories are equally fallacious. I do not see how either can be wholly satisfying. There is no reason at all why a story should not contain both form and matter, a form, I should say, suited to the matter. Among the painters, Vermeer is admittedly perfect. Has then Rembrandt no art? Among the writers, Turgenev is perfect. George Moore has compared his perfection to that of the Greeks. Is it then justifiable to call Dostoevsky journalese, as some have called him? Indeed, it takes a great artist to write about great things, though it is true a great artist is often pardoned for lapses in style, where a minor artist can afford no such lapses. It was in such a light, with the true honesty and humility of a fine artist, that Flaubert, than whom none sought greater perfection, regarded himself before the towering Shakespeare. This preamble is no digression, but is quite pertinent to any consideration of the contemporary short story, for I must admit that however fallacious is either of the prevalent theories which I have outlined, in practice both work out with an appalling accuracy. Of the hundreds of stories which I have had to read, the number possessing a sense of form is relatively small, and of these only a few are rich in content. Strictly speaking, most of them stick to the facts of everyday life, to the intimate realities of urban and suburban existence. Other stories, and these are more numerous, possibly as a reaction and in response to the human craving for the fairy tale, are concerned with the most impossible adventure and fantastic unreality. Romance with the capital R. They are often attractive in plot, able in construction, happy in invention, and their general tendency may be to fall within the definition of life's little ironies. Yet, in spite of these admirable qualifications, the majority of these stories are unconvincing, lacking in balance, in plausibility, in that virtue which may be defined as the writer's imagination, whose lack is something more than careless writing. How often one puts down a story with the feeling that it would take little to make it a rattling good tale, but alas, that little is everything. A storyteller's craft depends not only on a sense of style, that is, form and good writing, but also on the creation of an atmosphere, shall we say hypnotic in effect, and capable of persuading the reader that he is a temporary inhabitant of the world the writer is describing, however remote in time or space that world may be from the world of the reader's own experience. And the more enlightened and culturally emotional the reader, the greater the power of seduction is a writer called upon to exercise. For it is obvious that all these hundreds of crude Arabian Nights tales and jungle tales and all sorts of tales of impossible adventure appearing in the pages of our periodicals would not be written if they were not in demand by the large public. The question arises, why is it that authors who deal with the intimate realities of our dull everyday life are on the whole so much better as writers than those who attempt to portray the more glamorous existence of the east, of the jungle, of, so to speak, other worlds. 
I have a theory of my own to offer in explanation, and it is this: A, let us say, is a writer who has stayed at home. Let us suppose that his experience has been largely limited to London, or still more precisely to the East End of London. He has either lived or spent a great deal of time here, and without having actively participated in the lives of the natives and denizens of the district, has observed them to good purpose and saturated himself with their atmosphere. He has, in an intimate sense, secured not only his scene, but also, either actually or potentially, his characters. English, of a sort, is the language of his community, and the temper of this community, except in petty externals, is, after all, but little different from his own. He has lost no time in either traveling or in learning another's language. He has had a great deal of time for developing his technique. He has, indeed, spent the greater part of his time in working out his form. He is, as you may guess, anything but a superlative genius. Certainly, we may venture to assume that he is, at all events, a fine talent, a careful observer, a painstaking worker, possessed of inventive powers within limitations. He knows his genre and his milieu, and he knows his job. He observes his people with an artistic sympathy. He is an etcher, loving his line rather than a photographer. Vast mural decorations are beyond him. Then there is B. B is a traveler, something of an adventurer, too. His wanderlust, or possibly his occupation as a minor government official, journalist, or representative for some commercial firm, has taken him east. He has spent some time in Shanghai or Hong Kong, in Calcutta or Rangoon, in Tokyo or Nagasaki. He has lived chiefly in the foreign quarter, and occasionally sallied out to seek adventure in the native habitat. He has secured a smattering of the native tongue, and has even taken unto himself a temporary native wife. A bold man, he has, in his way, lived dangerously and intensely. He has, besides, heard men of his own race, living in the quarter, tell weird tales of romantic nature, perhaps of a white girl who came out east, or of a native girl who had won the heart of an Englishman to his undoing. At last, B has had enough of it, and has come home to the old country, his England, and sits down to his new job, the exploitation of his knowledge and experience of the East. Possibly a few friends who had listened to his tales urged him to set them down on paper, and B, who had not thought of it before, thinks it is not such a bad idea, and getting a supply of paper and a typewriter launches forth on a career as a writer. He is intent on turning out a good tale, and does remarkably well for a novice, but his inexperience as a writer, his lack of form and technique and deliberateness, will hinder his progress, though now and then he will turn out a tolerable tale by sheer accident. The really great man will, of course, break through the double barrier, and then you have a Conrad. That is to say, you have a man who has lived abundantly, and has been able to apply an abundance of art to his abundance of material. But that is indeed rare nowadays, and the whole moral of the little parable of A and B is that in our own time it is given but to few men to do both. The one has specialized in writing, the other in living. And the comparison may be applied, of course, to the two writers who have stayed at home even in the same district. A hasn't much to say, but what he says he says well, because writing means to him something as a thing in itself. He finds compensation in the quality of his writings for his lack of rich material. The whole content of his art is in his form, and that, if not wholly satisfying, is surely no mean achievement. B, on the other hand, 
may have a great deal to say, and says it badly. He thinks his material will carry him through. He does not understand that the function of art is to crystallize, synthesize the materials at hand, to distill the essences of life, to formalize natural shapes. There should be no confusing of nature and art. A mountain is nature, a pyramid is art. We have no man in the short story today who has synthesized his age, who has thrown a light on the peculiar many-sided adventure of modernity, who has achieved a sense of universality. Maupassant came near to it in his own time. Never before have men had such opportunities for knowing the world. Never before has it been so easy to cover space. Our means of communication have never been so rapid. Yet there is an almost maddening contradiction in the fact that every man who writes is content in describing but a single facet of the great adventure of life. Our age is an age of specialization, and many a man spends a life in trying to visualize for us a fragment of existence in multitudinous variations. An empire may be said to stand for a universalizing tendency, yet the extraordinary fact about the mass of English stories today is that, far from being expressive of any tendency to unity, they are mostly concerned with presenting the specialized atmospheres of so many individual localities and vocations. We have writers who do not go beyond Dartmoor, or Park Lane, or the East End of London. We have writers of sea stories, jungle stories, detective stories, lost jewel stories, slum stories, and we have writers who seldom stray from the cricket field, or the prize ring, or Freudian complexes. Yet in putting on record these individual tendencies of the short story, I should be overdrawing the picture if I did not call attention to what general tendencies are in the ascendant. The supernatural element is prominent among these. Stories of ghosts, spiritualism, and reincarnation are becoming increasingly popular with authors, especially with the type I have described as A. This is interesting, since it evinces a healthy desire to get away from the banal facts of one's standardized atmosphere, the atmosphere of suburbia. It may be both a reaction and an escape, and may express a desire for a more spiritual life than is vouchsafed us. The love of adventure and the love of love will, of course, remain with us as long as men live and love a tale, and nine-tenths of the stories still deal with the favored hero and the inevitable girl. This book is to be an annual venture, and its object is the same as that of Mr. O'Brien's annual selection of American stories. It is to gather and save from obscurity every year those tales by English authors which are published in English and American periodicals and are worth preserving in permanent form. It is well known that short story writers in Anglo-Saxon countries have not the same chance of publishing their wares in book form as their more fortunate colleagues, the novelists. This prejudice against the publication of short stories in book form is not to be justified, and it does not exist on the continent. Most of the fine fiction, for example, published in Russia since Chekhov made the form popular, took precisely the form of the short story. It is a good form, and should be encouraged. It is also the object of this volume to call attention to new writers who show promise, and to help to create a demand for their work by publishing their efforts side by side with those already accepted and established. It has been the custom to dedicate Mr. O'Brien's annual selection of American stories to some author who has distinguished himself in the particular year by his valuable contribution to the art of the short story. We propose to adopt it with regard to our English selections. We are glad of the opportunity to associate this year's collection with the name of Stacy O'Monier 
As for the story selected for this volume, that is to some degree a matter of personal judgment. It is quite possible that other editors would, in some instances, have made a different choice. John Kurnos An additional word may be added on the principles which have governed our choice. We have set ourselves the task of disengaging the essential human qualities in our contemporary fiction, which, when chronicled conscientiously by our literary artists, may fairly be called a criticism of life. We are not at all interested in formulae, and organized criticism at its best would be nothing more than dead criticism, as all dogmatic interpretation of life is always dead. What has interested us, to the exclusion of other things, is the fresh living current which flows through the best British and Irish work, and the psychological and imaginative reality which writers have conferred upon it. No substance is of importance in fiction unless it is organic substance, that is to say, substance in which the pulse of life is beating. Inorganic fiction has been our curse in the past, and bids fair to remain so, unless we exercise much greater artistic discrimination than we display at present. The present record covers the period from July 1921 to June 1922, inclusive. During this period we have sought to select from the stories published in British and American periodicals, those stories by British and Irish authors which have rendered life imaginatively in organic substance and artistic form. Substance is something achieved by the artist in every act of creation, rather than something already present, and accordingly a fact or a group of facts in a story only attain substantial embodiment when the artist's power of compelling imaginative persuasion transforms them into a living truth. The first test of a short story, therefore, in any qualitative analysis, is to report upon how vitally compelling the writer makes his selected facts or incidents. This test may be conveniently called the test of substance. But a second test is necessary if the story is to take rank above other stories. The true artist will seek to shape this living substance into the most beautiful and satisfying form by skillful selection and arrangement of his materials, and by the most direct and appealing presentation of it in portrayal and characterization. The short stories which we have examined in this study have fallen naturally into three groups. The first consists of those stories which fail, in our opinion, to survive both the test of substance and the test of form. These we have not chronicled. The second group includes such narratives as may lay convincing claim to further consideration, because each of them has survived in a measure both tests, the test of substance and the test of form. Stories included in this group are chronicled in the list which immediately follows the Roll of Honor. And finally, we have recorded the names of a smaller group of stories which possess, we believe, the distinction of uniting genuine substance and artistic form in a closely woven pattern with such sincerity that they are worthy of being reprinted. If all of these stories were republished, they would not occupy more space than six or seven novels of average length. Our selection of them does not imply the critical belief that they are great stories. A year which produced one great story would be an exceptional one. It is simply to be taken as meaning that we have found the equivalent of six or seven volumes worthy of republication among all the stories published during the period under consideration. These stories are listed in the special Roll of Honor. In compiling these lists, we have permitted no personal preference or prejudice to consciously influence our judgment. The general and particular results of our study will be found explained and carefully detailed in the supplementary part of the volume. 
Mr. Cournos has read the English periodicals, and I have read the American periodicals. We have then compared our judgments. Edward J. O'Brien End of the Introductions Story One of the Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story One Where Was Witch Street? by Stacy Omanier from the Strand Magazine, 1921, and the Saturday Evening Post, 1922. In the public bar of the Wagtail, in Wapping, four men and a woman were drinking beer and discussing diseases. It was not a pretty subject, and the company was certainly not a handsome one. It was a dark November evening, and the dingy lighting of the bar seemed but to emphasize the bleak exterior. Drifts of fog and damp from without mingled with the smoke of shag. The sanded floor was kicked into a muddy morass, not unlike the surface of the pavement. An old lady down the street had died from pneumonia the previous evening, and the event supplied a fruitful topic of conversation. The things that one could get. Everywhere were germs eager to destroy one. At any minute the symptoms might break out, and so one foregathered in a cheerful spot amidst friends and drank forgetfulness. Prominent in this little group was Baldwin Meadows, a sallow-faced villain with battered features and prominent cheekbones, his face cut and scarred by a hundred fights. Ex-seaman, ex-boxer, ex-fish-porter indeed to everyone's knowledge x everything no one knew how he lived by his side lurched an enormous colored man who went by the name of harry jones grinning above a tankard sat a pimply-faced young man who was known as the agent silver rings adorned his fingers he had no other name and most emphatically no address but he arranged things for people and appeared to thrive upon it in a scrambling fugitive manner the other two people were mr and mrs dawes mr dawes was an entirely negative person but mrs dawes shone by virtue of a high whining insistent voice keyed to within half a note of hysteria then at one point the conversation suddenly took a peculiar turn it came about through mrs dawes mentioning that her aunt who died from eating tinned lobster used to work in a corset shop on witch street when she said that the agent whose right eye appeared to survey the ceiling whilst his left eye looked over the other side of his tankard remarked where was witch street ma lord exclaimed mrs dawes don't you know dearie you must be a young un you must why when i was a gal every one knew witch street it was just down there where they built the kingsway like baldwin meadows cleared his throat and said witch street used to be a turnin runnin from long acre into wellington street oh no old boy chipped in mr dawes who always treated the ex-man with great deference if you'll excuse me which street was a narrow lane in the back of the old globe theatre that used to pass by the church i know what i'm talkin about growled meadows mrs dawes high nasal whine broke in hi mr booth you used to know your way about where was which street mr booth the proprietor was polishing a tap he looked up which street yes of course i knew which street used to go there with some of the boys when i was covent garden way it was at right angles to the strand just east of wellington street no it warn't it were alongside the strand before you come to wellington street 
The colored man took no part in the discussion, one street and one city being alike to him, provided he could obtain the material comforts dear to his heart. But the others carried it on with a certain amount of acerbity. Before any agreement had been arrived at, three other men entered the bar. The quick eye of Meadows recognized them at once as three of what was known at that time as the Gallows Ring. Every member of the Gallows Ring had done time, but they still carried on a lucrative industry devoted to blackmail, intimidation, shoplifting, and some of the clumsier recreations. Their leader, Ben Orming, had served seven years for bashing a Chinaman down at Rotherhite. The gallows ring was not popular in Wapping, for the reason that many of their depredations had been inflicted upon their own class. When Meadows and Harry Jones took it into their heads to do a little wild prancing, they took the trouble to go up into the West End. They considered the gallows ring an ungentlemanly set. Nevertheless, they always treated them with a certain external deference an unpleasant crowd to quarrel with. Ben Orming ordered beer for the three of them, and they leant against the bar and whispered in sullen accents. Something had evidently miscarried with the ring. Mrs. Dawes continued to whine above the general drone of the bar. And suddenly she said, Ben, you're a hot old devil you are. We was just having a discussion like. Where was Witch Street? Ben scowled at her, and she continued, "'Some says it was one place, and some says it was another. I know where it was. Of course, my aunt, what died from blood poison, after eating tin lobster, used to work at a corset shop.' Uh, "'Yes,' barked Ben emphatically. "'I know where Witch Street was. It was just south of the river, afore you come to Waterloo Station.' It was then that the colored man, who up to that point had taken no part in the discussion, thought fit to intervene. Nope, you's all wrong, Cap'n. Which street were alongside the church, way over where the Strand takes a sideline up west? Ben turned on him fiercely. What the blazes does a blankety nigger know about it? I told you where Which Street was. Yes, and I know where it was, interposed Meadows. You're both wrong. Which street was a turnin' runnin' from Long Acre into Wellington Street? I didn't ask you what you thought, growled Ben. Well, I suppose I've a right to an opinion. You always think you know everything you do. You can just keep your mouth shut. It'd take more'n you to shut it. Mr. Booth thought it advisable at this juncture to bawl across the bar, Now, gentlemen, no quarrelling, please. The affair might have been subsided at that point, but for Mrs. Dawes. Her emotions over the death of the old lady in the street had been so stirred that she had been, almost unconsciously, drinking too much gin. She suddenly screamed out, don't you take no lip from him, Mr. Metters, the dirty thieving devil. He always thinks he's going to come it over everyone. She stood up threateningly, and one of Ben's supporters gave her a gentle push backwards. In three minutes the bar was in a complete state of pandemonium. The three members of the gallows ring fought two men and a woman, for Mr. Dawes merely stood in a corner and screamed out, Don't! Don't! Mrs. Dawes stabbed the man who had pushed her through the wrist with a hat-pin. Meadows and Ben Orming closed on each other and fought savagely with the naked fists. A lucky blow early in the encounter sent Meadows reeling against the wall, with blood streaming down his temple. Then the colored man hurled a pewter tankard straight at Ben, and it hit him on the knuckles. The pain maddened him to a frenzy. His other supporter had immediately got to grips with Harry Jones, and picked up one of the high stools, and, seizing an opportunity, brought it down crash on to the colored man's skull. The whole affair was a matter of minutes. 
Mr. Booth was bawling out in the street. A whistle sounded. People were running in all directions. "'Beat it! Beat it, for God's sake!' called the man who had been stabbed through the wrist. His face was very white, and he was obviously about to faint. Ben and the other man, whose name was Toller, dashed to the door. On the pavement there was a confused scramble. Blows were struck indiscriminately. Two policemen appeared. One was laid hors de combat by a kick on the kneecap from Toller. The two men fled into the darkness, followed by a hue and cry. Born and bred in the locality, they took every advantage of their knowledge. They tacked through alleys and raced down dark mews and clambered over walls. Fortunately for them, the people they passed, who might have tripped them up or aided in the pursuit, merely fled indoors. The people in Wapping are not always on the side of the pursuer. But the police held on. At last, Ben and Toller slipped through the door of an empty house in Aztec Street, barely ten yards ahead of their nearest pursuer. Blows rained on the door, but they slipped the bolts and then fell panting to the floor. When Ben could speak, he said, If they cop us, it means swingin'. Was the nigger done in? I think so. But even if he wasn't, there was that other affair the night before last. The game's up. The ground-floor rooms were shuttered and bolted, but they knew that the police would probably force the front door. At the back there was no escape, only a narrow stable-yard where lanterns were already flashing. The roof only extended thirty yards either way, and the police would probably take possession of it. They made a round of the house, which was sketchily furnished. There was a loaf, a small piece of mutton, and a bottle of pickles, and, the most precious possession, three bottles of whiskey. Each man drank half a glass of neat whiskey. Then Ben said, We'll be able to keep em quiet for a bit, anyway, and he went and fetched an old twelve-bore gun and a case of cartridges. Toller was opposed to this last desperate resort, but Ben continued to murmur, it means swingin', anyway. And thus began the notorious siege of Aztec Street. It lasted three days and four nights. You may remember that, on forcing a panel of the front door, Sub-Inspector Wraith, of the 5th Division, was shot through the chest. The police then tried other methods. A hose was brought into play without effect. Two policemen were killed and four wounded. The military was requisitioned. The street was picketed. Snipers occupied windows of the houses opposite. A distinguished member of the cabinet drove down in a motor car and directed operations in a top hat. It was the introduction of poison gas which was the ultimate cause of the downfall of the citadel. The body of Ben Orming was never found but that of Toller was discovered near the front door with a bullet through his heart. The medical officer to the court pronounced that the man had been dead three days, but whether killed by a chance bullet from a sniper, or whether killed deliberately by his fellow criminal, was never revealed. For when the end came, Orming had apparently planned a final act of venom, it was known that in the basement a considerable quantity of petrol had been stored. The contents had probably been carefully distributed over the most inflammable materials in the top rooms. The fire broke out, as one witness described it, almost like an explosion. Orming must have perished in this. The roof blazed up and the sparks carried across the yard and started a stack of light lumber in the annex of Messrs. Morrill's piano factory. The factory and two blocks of tenement buildings were burnt to the ground. The estimated cost of the destruction was one hundred and eighty thousand pounds. The casualties amounted to seven killed and fifteen wounded. At the inquiry held under Chief Justice Pingaman, 
various odd, interesting facts were revealed. Mr. Lowes Parlby, the brilliant young K.C., distinguished himself by his searching cross-examination of many witnesses. At one point, a certain Mrs. Dawes was put in the box. Now, said Mr. Lowes Parlby, I understand that in the evening in question, Mrs. Dawes, you, and the victims, and these other people who have been mentioned, were all seated in the public bar of the Wagtail, enjoying its, no doubt, excellent hospitality, and indulging in a friendly discussion. Is that so? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, now, will you tell his lordship what you were discussing? Diseases, sir. Diseases? And did the argument become acrimonious? Pardon? Was there a serious dispute about diseases? Oh, no, sir. Well, what was the subject of the dispute? We was arguing as to where which street was, sir. What's that? said his lordship. The witness states, my lord, that they were arguing as to where which street was. Which street? Do you mean W-Y-C-H? Uh, yes, sir. You mean the narrow old street that used to run across the site of what is now the Gaiety Theatre? Mr. Lowell's Parlaby smiled in his most charming manner. Uh, yes, my lord, I believe the witness refers to the same street you mention, though, if I may be allowed to qualify your lordship's description of the locality, may I suggest that it was a little further east, at the side of the old Globe Theatre, which was adjacent to St. Martin's in the Strand? That is the street you are all arguing about, isn't it, Mrs. Dawes? Well, sir, my aunt, who died from eating tinned lobster, used to work at a corset shop. I ought to know. His lordship ignored the witness. He turned to the counsel rather peevishly. Mr. Lowell's Parlby, when I was your age, I used to pass through Witch Street every day of my life. I did so for nearly twelve years. I think it hardly necessary for you to contradict me. The counsel bowed. It was not his place to dispute with a chief justice, although that chief justice be a hopeless old fool. But another eminent K.C., an elderly man with a tawny beard, rose in the body of the court and said, If I may be allowed to interpose, your lordship, I also spent a great deal of my youth passing through Witch Street. I have gone into the matter, comparing past and present ordnance survey maps. If I am not mistaken, the street the witness was referring to began near the hoarding at the entrance to Kingsway and ended at the back of what is now the Aldwych Theatre. Oh, no, Mr. Backer, exclaimed Lowes Parlby. His lordship removed his glasses and snapped out, The matter is entirely irrelevant to the case. It certainly was but the brief passage of arms left an unpleasant tang of bitterness behind. It was observed that Mr. Lowe's Parlby never again quite got the prehensile grip upon his cross-examination that he had shown in his treatment of the earlier witnesses. The colored man, Harry Jones, had died in hospital, but Mr. Booth, the proprietor of the Wagtail, Baldwin Meadows, Mr. Dawes, and the man who was stabbed in the wrist, all gave evidence of a rather nugatory character. Lowell's Parlby could do nothing with it. The findings of this special inquiry do not concern us. It is sufficient to say that the witnesses already mentioned all returned to Wapping. The man who had received the thrust of a hat-pin through his wrist did not think it advisable to take any action against Mrs. Dawes. He was pleasantly relieved to find that he was only required as a witness of an abortive discussion. 
In a few weeks' time the great Aztec Street siege remained only a romantic memory to the majority of Londoners. To Lowes Parlby the little dispute with Chief Justice Pengammon rankled unreasonably. It was annoying to be publicly snubbed for making a statement which you know to be absolutely true, and which you have even taken pains to verify. And Lowell's Parlby was a young man accustomed to score. He made a point of looking everything up, of being prepared for an adversary thoroughly. He liked to give the appearance of knowing everything. The brilliant career just ahead of him at times dazzled him. He was one of the darlings of the gods. Everything came to Lowes Parlby. His father had distinguished himself at the bar before him, and had amassed a modest fortune. He was an only son. At Oxford he had carried off every possible degree. He was already being spoken of for very high political honours. But the most sparkling jewel in the crown of his successes was Lady Adela Charters, the daughter of Lord Fermier, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. She was his fiancée, and it was considered the most brilliant match of the season. She was young and almost pretty, and Lord Fermier was immensely wealthy and one of the most influential men in Great Britain. Such a combination was irresistible. There seemed to be nothing missing in the life of Francis Lowell's Parlby, K.C. One of the most regular and absorbed spectators at the Aztec Street Inquiry was old Stephen Garrett. Stephen Garrett held a unique but quite inconspicuous position in the legal world at that time. He was a friend of judges a specialist at various abstruse legal rulings, a man of remarkable memory, and yet an amateur. He had never taken sick, never eaten the requisite dinners, never passed an examination in his life. But the law of evidence was meat and drink to him. He passed his life in the temple where he had chambers. Some of the most eminent counsel in the world would take his opinion or come to him for advice. He was very old, very silent, and very absorbed. He attended every meeting of the Aztec Street Inquiry, but from beginning to end he never volunteered an opinion. After the inquiry was over, he went and visited an old friend at the London Survey Office he spent two mornings examining maps. After that, he spent two mornings pottering about the Strand, Kingsway, and Aldwych. Then he worked out some careful calculations on a ruled chart. He entered the particulars in a little book, which he kept for purposes of that kind, and then retired to his chambers to study other matters. But before doing so, he entered a little apothegm in another book, it was apparently a book in which he intended to compile a summary of his legal experiences. The sentence ran, The basic trouble is that people make statements without sufficient data. Old Stephen need not have appeared in this story at all, except for the fact that he was present at the dinner at Lord Vermeer's, where a rather deplorable incident occurred and you must acknowledge that in the circumstances it is useful to have such a valuable and efficient witness. Lord Vermeer was a competent, forceful man, a little quick-tempered and autocratic. He came from Lancashire, and before entering politics had made an enormous fortune out of borax, artificial manure, and starch. It was a small dinner-party, with a motive behind it. His principal guest was Mr. Sandeman, the London agent of the Amir of Bakan. Lord Fermier was very anxious to impress Mr. Sandeman, and to be very friendly with him. The reasons will appear later. Mr. Sandeman was a self-confessed cosmopolitan. He spoke seven languages, 
and professed to be equally at home in any capital in Europe. London had been his headquarters for over twenty years. Lord Vermeer also invited Mr. Arthur Toombs, a colleague in the cabinet, his prospective son-in-law, Lowes Parlby, K.C., James Trolley, a very tame socialist M.P., and Sir Henry and Lady Breed, the two latter being invited not because Sir Henry was of any use, but because Lady Breed was a pretty and brilliant woman who might amuse his principal guest. The sixth guest was Stephen Garrett. The dinner was a great success. When the succession of courses eventually came to a stop, and the ladies had retired, Lord Fermier conducted his male guests into another room for a ten-minute smoke before rejoining them. It was then that the unfortunate incident occurred. There was no love lost between Lowell's Parlby and Mr. Sandeman. It is difficult to ascribe the real reason of their mutual animosity, but on the several occasions when they had met, there had invariably passed a certain sardonic by-play. They were both clever, both comparatively young, each a little suspect and jealous of the other. Moreover, it was said in some quarters that Mr. Sandeman had had intentions himself with regard to Lord Vermeer's daughter, that he had been on the point of a proposal when Lowell's Parlby had butted in and forestalled him. Uh, Mr. Sandeman had dined well, and he was in the mood to dazzle with a display of his varied knowledge and experiences. The conversation drifted from a discussion of the rival claims of great cities to the slow, inevitable removal of old landmarks. There had been a slightly acrimonious disagreement between Lowell's Parlby and Mr. Sandeman as to the claims of Budapest and Lisbon and Mr. Sandeman had scored because he extracted from his rival a confession that, though he had spent two months in Budapest, he had only spent two days in Lisbon. Mr. Sandeman had lived for four years in either city. Lowell's Parlby changed the subject abruptly. Talking of landmarks, he said, we had a queer point arise in that Aztec Street inquiry. The original dispute arose owing to a discussion between a crowd of people in a pub as to where Witch Street was. I remember, said Lord Vermeer, a perfectly absurd discussion. Why, I should have thought that any man over forty would remember exactly where it was. Where would you say it was, sir? asked Lowell's Parlby. Why, to be sure. It ran from the corner of Chancery Lane, and ended at the second turning after the law courts, going west. Lowe's Parlby was about to reply, when Mr. Sandeman cleared his throat and said, in his supercilious, oily voice, um, "'Excuse me, my lord, I know my Paris and Vienna and Lisbon, every brick and stone, but I look upon London as my home. I know my London even better. I have a perfectly clear recollection of Witch Street. When I was a student I used to visit there to buy books. It ran parallel to New Oxford Street on the south side, just between it and Lincoln's Inn Fields." There was something about this assertion that infuriated Lowell's Parlby. In the first place it was so hopelessly wrong and so insufferably asserted. In the second place, he was already smarting under the indignity of being shown up about Lisbon. And then there suddenly flashed through his mind the wretched incident when he had been publicly snubbed by Justice Pengaman, about the very same point, and he knew that he was right each time. Damn Witch Street! He turned on Mr. Sandeman. Oh, nonsense! You may know something about these uh, eastern cities. You certainly know nothing about London, if you make a statement like that. Witch Street was a little further east of what is now the Gaiety Theatre. 
It used to run by the side of the old Globe Theatre, parallel to the Strand. The dark moustache of Mr. Sandeman shot upwards, revealing a narrow line of yellow teeth. He uttered a sound that was a mingling of contempt and derision. Then he drawled out, uh, Really? How uh, wonderful to have such comprehensive knowledge. He laughed, and his small eyes fixed his rival. Lowell Parlby flushed a deep red. He gulped down half a glass of port and muttered just above a whisper, Damned impudence! Then, in the rudest manner he could display, he turned his back deliberately on Sandeman and walked out of the room. In the company of Adela, he tried to forget the little contretemps. The whole thing was so absurd, so utterly undignified, as though he didn't know. It was the little accumulation of pinpricks all arising out of that one argument. The result had suddenly goaded him to, well, being rude, to say the least of it. It wasn't that Sandeman mattered. To the devil with Sandeman. But what would his future father-in-law think? He had never before given way to any show of ill-temper before him. He forced himself into a mood of rather fatuous jocularity. Adela was at her best in those moods. They would have lots of fun together in the days to come. Her almost pretty, not too clever face was dimpled with kittenish glee. Life was a tremendous rag to her. They were expecting Takata, the famous opera singer. She had been engaged at a very high fee to come on from Covent Garden. Mr. Sandeman was very fond of music. Adela was laughing and discussing which was the most honourable position for the great Sandeman to occupy. There came to Lowell's Parlby a sudden abrupt misgiving. What sort of wife would this be to him when they were not just fooling? he immediately dismissed the curious, furtive little stab of doubt. The splendid proportions of the room calmed his senses. A huge bowl of dark red roses quickened his perceptions. His career, the door opened, but it was not La Toccata. It was one of the household flunkies. Lowell's Parlby turned again to his inamorata. Um, Excuse me, sir. His lordship says, will you kindly go and see him in the library? Lowell's Parlby regarded the messenger, and his heart beat quickly. An uncontrollable presage of evil racked his nerve centers. Something had gone wrong. And yet the whole thing was so absurd, trivial. In a crisis, well, he could always apologize. He smiled confidently at Adela and said, oh, Why, of course, with pleasure. Please excuse me, dear. He followed the impressive servant out of the room. His foot had barely touched the carpet of the library when he realized that his worst apprehensions were to be plumbed to the depths. For a moment he thought Lord Fermier was alone, and then he observed old Stephen Garrett lying in an easy-chair in the corner like a piece of crumpled parchment. Lord Vermeer did not beat about the bush. When the door was closed, he bawled out savagely, "'What the devil have you done?' Uh, "'Excuse me, sir. I, I'm afraid I don't understand. Is, is it Sandeman?' "'Sandeman has gone.' "'Oh, I'm sorry.' Sorry? By God, I should think you might be sorry. You insulted him. My prospective son-in-law insulted him in my own house. I'm uh, awfully sorry. I, I, I didn't realize. Realize? Sit down, and don't assume for one moment that you continue to be my prospective son-in-law. Your insult was a most intolerable piece of effrontery, 
not only to him, but to me. But I... Uh, listen to me. Do you know that the government were on the verge of concluding a most far-reaching treaty with that man? Do you know that the position was just touch and go? The concessions we were prepared to make would have cost the state thirty million pounds, and it would have been cheap. Do you hear that? It would have been cheap. Bakken is one of the most vulnerable outposts of the empire. It is a terrible danger zone. If certain powers can usurp our authority, and mark you, the whole blamed place is already riddled with this new pernicious doctrine. You know what I mean. Before we know where we are, the whole East will be in a blaze. India, my God, this contract we were negotiating would have countered this outward thrust. And you, you blockhead, you come here and insult the man upon whose word the whole thing depends. I really can't see, sir, how I should know all this. You can't see it. But you fool, you seemed to go out of your way. You insulted him about the merest quibble in my house. He said he knew where Witch Street was. He was quite wrong. I corrected him. Witch Street? Witch Street be damned! If he said Witch Street was in the moon, you should have agreed with him. There was no call to act in the way you did. And you, you think of going into politics. The somewhat cynical inference of this remark went unnoticed. Lowell's Parlby was too unnerved. He mumbled, uh, I'm very sorry. I don't want your sorrow. I want something more practical. Oh, what's that, sir? You will drive straight to Mr. Sandeman's, find him, and apologize. Tell him you find that he was right about Witch Street, after all. If you can't find him tonight, you must find him tomorrow morning. I give you till midday tomorrow. If, by that time, you have not offered a handsome apology to Mr. Sandeman, you do not enter this house again. You do not see my daughter again. Moreover, all the power I possess will be devoted to hounding you out of that profession you have dishonored. Now you can go." Dazed and shaken, Lowell's Parlby drove back to his flat at Knightsbridge. Before acting, he must have time to think. Lord Vermeer had given him till tomorrow midday. Any apologizing that was done should be done after a night's reflection. The fundamental purposes of his being were to be tested. He knew that. He was at a great crossing. Some deep instinct within him was grossly outraged. Is it that a point comes when success demands that a man shall sell his soul? It was all so absurdly trivial, a mere argument about the position of a street that had ceased to exist. As Lord Vermeer said, what did it matter about which street? Of course he should apologize. It would hurt horribly to do so. But would a man sacrifice everything on account of some footling argument about a street? In his own rooms, Lowell's Parlby put on a dressing gown, and, lighting a pipe, he sat before the fire. He would have given anything for companionship at such a moment, the right companionship. How lovely it would be to have a woman! just the right woman to talk this all over with, some one who understood and sympathized. A sudden vision came to him of Adela's face grinning about the prospective visit of La Toccata, and again the low voice of misgiving whispered in his ears. Would Adela be just the right woman? In very truth, did he really love Adela? Or was it all a, a rag? Was life a rag, a game played by 
lawyers, politicians, and uh, people." The fire burned low, but still he continued to sit thinking, his mind principally occupied with the dazzling visions of the future. It was past midnight when he suddenly muttered a low, "'Damn!' and walked to the bureau. He took up a pen and wrote, "'Dear Mr. Sandeman, I must apologize for acting so rudely to you last night. It was quite unpardonable of me, especially as I since find, on going into the matter, that you were quite right about the position of Witch Street. I can't think how I made the mistake. Please forgive me. Yours cordially, Francis Lowell's Parlby. Having written this, he sighed and went to bed. One might have imagined at that point that the matter was finished, but there are certain little greedy demons of conscience that require a lot of stilling, and they kept Lowell's Parlby awake more than half the night. He kept on repeating to himself, It's all positively absurd. But the little greedy demons pranced around the bed, and they began to group things into two definite issues. On the one side, the great appearances. On the other, something at the back of it all, something deep, fundamental, something that could only be expressed by one word. Truth. If he had really loved Adela, if he weren't so absolutely certain that Sandeman was wrong and he was right, why should he have to say that Witch Street was where it wasn't? Isn't there, after all, said one of the little demons, something which makes for greater happiness than success? Confess this, and we'll let you sleep. Perhaps that is one of the most potent weapons the little demons possess. However full our lives may be, we ever long for moments of tranquillity, and conscience holds before our eyes some mirror of an ultimate tranquillity. Lowell's Parlby was certainly not himself. The gay, debonair, and brilliant egoist was tortured, and tortured almost beyond control. And it had all apparently risen through the ridiculous discussion about a street. At a quarter past three in the morning, he arose from his bed with a groan, and going into the other room, he tore the letter to Mr. Sandeman to pieces. Three weeks later, old Stephen Garrett was lunching with the Lord Chief Justice. They were old friends, and they never found it incumbent to be very conversational. The lunch was an excellent but frugal meal. They both ate slowly and thoughtfully, and their drink was water. It was not till they reached the dessert stage that his lordship indulged in any very informative comment and then he recounted to Stephen the details of a recent case in which he considered that the presiding judge had, by an unprecedented parology, misinterpreted the law of evidence. Stephen listened with absorbed attention. He took two cobnuts from the silver dish and turned them over meditatively, without cracking them. When his lordship had completely stated his opinion and peeled a pear, Stephen mumbled, I have been impressed, very impressed indeed. Even in my own field of um, limited observation, the opinion of an outsider, you may say, so often it happens, the trouble caused by an affirmation without sufficiently established data. I have seen lives lost ruin brought about, endless suffering. Only last week a young man, a brilliant career, almost shattered. People make statements without... He put the nuts back on the dish, and then, in an apparently irrelevant manner, he said abruptly, uh, do, do you remember Witch Street, my lord? The Lord Chief Justice grunted, Witch Street, of course I do. Where would you say it was, my lord? 
Why, here, of course." His lordship took a pencil from his pocket and sketched a plan on the tablecloth. It used to run from there to here. Stephen adjusted his glasses and carefully examined the plan. He took a long time to do this, and when he had finished, his hand instinctively went towards a breast pocket, where he kept a notebook with little squared pages. Then he stopped and sighed. After all, why argue with the law? The law was like that, an excellent thing, not infallible, of course, even the plan of the Lord Chief Justice was a quarter of a mile out, but still an excellent, a wonderful thing. He examined the bony knuckles of his hands and yawned slightly. "'Do you remember it?' said the Lord Chief Justice. Stephen nodded sagely, and his voice seemed to come from a long way off. "'Yes, I remember it, my lord. It was a melancholy little street. End of Story One Story Two of the Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story Two The Looking Glass by J. D. Beresford from the cornhill magazine nineteen twenty one nineteen twenty two this was the first communication that had come from her aunt in rachel's lifetime i think your aunt has forgiven me at last her father said as he passed the letter across the table rachel looked first at the signature it seemed strange to see her own name there it was as if her individuality, her very identity, was impugned by the fact that there should be two Rachel Deans. Moreover, there was a likeness between her aunt's autograph and her own, a characteristic turn in the looping of the letters, a hint of the same decisiveness and precision. If Rachel had been educated fifty years earlier, she might have written her name in just that manner. "'You're very like her in some ways,' her father said, as she still stared at the signature. Rachel's eyelids drooped, and her expression indicated a faint, suppressed intolerance of her father's remark. He said the same thing so often, and in so precisely the same tone, that she had formed a habit of automatically rejecting the truth of certain of his statements. He had always appeared to her as senile. He had been over fifty when she was born, and ever since she could remember she had doubted the correctness of his information. She was, she had often told herself, a born skeptic, an ultra-modern. She had a certain veneration for the more distant past, but none for her father's period. Victorianism was to her a term of abuse. She had long since condemned alike the ethic and the aesthetic of the nineteenth century as represented by her father's opinions, so that even now, when his familiar comment coincided so queerly with her own thought, she instinctively disbelieved him. Yet, as always, she was gentle in her answer. She condescended from the heights of her youth and vigor to pity him. I should think you must almost have forgotten what Aunt Rachel was like, dear, she said. How many years is it since you've seen her? Oh, more than forty, more than forty, her father said, ruminating profoundly. We disagreed, we invariably disagreed. Rachel always prided herself on being so modern. She read Huxley and Darwin and things like that. Altogether beyond me, I admit. 
Still, it seems to me that the old truths have endured and will, in spite of all, in spite of all. Rachel straightened her shoulders and lifted her head. There was disdain in her face, but none in her voice as she replied, And uh, so it seems that she wants to see me. She was excited at the thought of meeting this traditional, this almost mythical aunt, whom she had so often heard about. Sometimes she had wondered if the personality of this remarkable relative had not been a figment of her father's imagination, long pondered and reconstructed out of half-forgotten material. But this letter of hers that now lay on the breakfast table was admirable in character. There was something of condescension and intolerance expressed in the very restraint of its tone. She had written a kindly letter, but the kindliness had an air of pity. It was all consistent enough with what her father had told her. Mr. Dean came out of his reminiscences with a sigh. Yes, y yes, she, she wants to see you, my dear, he said. I think you had better accept this invitation to stay with her. She, she is rich, almost wealthy, and I, as you know, have practically nothing to leave you, practically nothing. If she took a fancy to you... He sighed again, and Rachel knew that for the hundredth time he was regretting his own past weakness. He had been so foolish in money matters, frittering away his once considerable capital in aimless speculations. He and his sister had shared equally under their father's will, but while he had been at last compelled to sink the greater part of what was left to him in an annuity, she had probably increased her original inheritance. "'I'll certainly go if you can spare me for a whole fortnight,' Rachel said. "'I'm all curiosity to see this remarkable aunt. By the way, how old is she?' "'There were only fifteen months between us,' Mr. Dean said. So she must be, dear me, yes, she must be seventy-three. Dear, dear, fancy Rachel being seventy-three. I always think of her as being about your age. It seems so absurd to think of her as old. He continued his reflections, but Rachel was not listening. He was asking for the understanding of the young, quite unaware of his senility, reaching out over half a century to try to touch the comprehension and sympathy of his daughter. But she was already bent on her own adventure, looking forward eagerly to a visit to London that promised delights other than the inspection of the mysterious traditional aunt whom she had so long known by report. For this invitation had come very aptly. Rachel pondered that, later in the morning, with a glow of ecstatic resignation to her charming fate. She found the guiding hand of a romantic inevitability in the fact that she and Adrian Fleming were to meet so soon. It had seemed so unlikely that they would see each other again for many months. They had only met three times, but they knew, although their friendship had been too green for either of them to admit the knowledge before he had gone back to town. He had indeed hinted far more in his two letters than he had ever dared to say. He was sensitive, he lacked self-confidence, but Rachel adored him for just those failings she criticized so hardly in her father. She took out her letters and reread them, thrilling with the realization that in her answer she would have such a perfectly amazing surprise for him. She would refer to it quite casually, somewhere near the end. She would write, By the way, it's just possible that we may meet again before long, as I am going to stay with my aunt, Miss Dean, in Tavistock Square. He would understand all that lay behind 
such an apparently careless reference, for she had told him that she never went to London, had only once in her life ever been there. She was in her own room, and she stood, now, before the cheval glass, and studied herself, raising her chin and slightly pursing her lips, staring superciliously at her own image under half-lowered eyelids. Candidly, she admired herself, but she could not help that assumption of a disdainful criticism. It seemed to give her confidence in her own integrity. Hiding that annoying shadow of doubt which sometimes fell upon her when she caught sight of her reflection by chance and unexpectedly. But no thought of doubt flawed her satisfaction this morning. A sense of power came to her, a tranquil realization that she could charm Adrian as she would. With a graceful, habitual gesture, she put up her hand and lightly touched her cheek with a soft, caressing movement of her fingertips. 2. The elderly parlour-maid showed Rachel straight to her bedroom when she arrived at Tavistock Square, indicating on the way the extensive-looking first-floor drawing-room in which tea and her first sight of the wonderful aunt would await Rachel in half an hour. She had been eager and excited. The air and promise of London had thrilled her, but she found some influence in the atmosphere of the big house that was vaguely repellent, almost sinister. Her bedroom was expensively furnished and beautifully kept. Some of the pieces were, she supposed, genuine antiques, perhaps immensely valuable. But how could she ever feel at home here? She was hampered by the necessity for moving circumspectly among this aged, delicate stuff, so wonderfully preserved and yet surely fragile and decrepit at the heart. That spindling esquitoire, for example, and that mincing Louis Quinze settee ought to be taking their well-earned leisure in some museum. It would be indecent to write at the one or sit on the other. They were relics of the past, foolishly pretending an ability for service when their life had been sapped by dry rot and their original functions outlived. Well, if ever I have a house of my own, Rachel thought, regarding these ancient splendors, I'll furnish it with something I shan't be afraid of. With a gesture of dismissal, she turned and looked out of the window. From the square came the sounds of a motor drawing up at a neighboring house. She heard the throbbing of the engine, the slam of the door, and then the strong, sonorous tones of a man's voice. That was her proper milieu, she reflected, among the strong, vital things. Even after twenty minutes in that bedroom, she had begun to feel enervated, as if she herself were also beginning to suffer from dry rot. She was anxious and uneasy as she went slowly downstairs to the drawing-room. Her anticipations of this meeting with her intimidating wealthy aunt had changed within the last half-hour. Her first idea of Miss Dean had been of a robust, stout woman, frank in her speech, and inclined to be very critical of the newly found niece whom she had chosen to inspect. Now she was prepared, rather, to expect a fragile, rather querulous old lady older even than her years, an aunt to be talked to in a lowered voice, and treated with the same delicate care that must be extended to her furniture. Rachel paused with her hand on the drawing-room door, and sighed at the thought of all the repressions and nervous strains that this visit might have in store for her. She entered the room almost on tiptoe, and then stood stock-still, suddenly shocked and bewildered with surprise. Whatever she had expected, it was not this. 
For a moment she was unable to believe that the sprightly, painted, and bedizened figure before her could possibly be that of her aunt. Her head was crowned with an exuberant brown wig, her heavy eyebrows were grotesquely blackened, her hollow cheeks stiff with powder, her lips brightened to a fantastic scarlet. And she was posed there, standing before the tea-table, with her head a little back, looking at her niece with a tolerant condescension, with the air of a superb young beauty, self-conscious and proud of her charms. Hmm. so you're my semi-mythical niece, she said, putting up her lorgnette. I'm glad at any rate to find that you're not, after all, a fabulous creature. She spoke in a high, rather thin voice that produced an effect of effort, as if she were playing on the top octave of a flute. Rachel had never in her life felt so gauche and awkward. Yes, I, uh, you, you know, aunt, I... I had begun to wonder if you were not fabulous, too. She tried, desperately anxious to seem at ease. She was afraid to look at that, to her, grotesque figure, afraid to show, by some unconscious reflex, her dislike for its ugliness. As she took the bony, ring-bedecked hand that was held out to her, she kept her eyes away from her aunt's face. Miss Dean, however, would not permit that evasion. "'Hold your head up, my dear. I want to look at you,' she said. And when Rachel reluctantly obeyed, continued, "'Yes, you're more like my father than your own, which means that you're like me, for I look after him, too, so everyone said.' Rachel drew in her breath with a little gasp. Was it possible that her aunt could imagine for one instant that there was any likeness between them? Our, our names are the same, she said nervously. Miss Dean nodded. There's more in it than that, she said, with a touch of complacence, and there's no reason why there shouldn't be. It's good Mendelism that you should take after an aunt rather than either of your parents. "'And you really think that we are alike?' Rachel asked feebly, looking in vain for any sign of a quizzical humour in her aunt's face. Miss Dean looked down under her half-lowered eyelids with a proud air of tolerance. "'Ah, well, a little, without doubt,' she said, as though the advantages of the difference were on her own side. "'Now sit down and have your tea, my dear.' Rachel obeyed with a vague wonder in her mind as to why that look of tolerance should be so familiar. It seemed to her as if it was something she had felt rather than seen, and as tea progressed she found herself half furtively studying the rattled ugliness of her aunt's face in the search for possible relics of a beautiful youth. "'Ah, I think you're beginning to see it, too.' Miss Dean said, marking her niece's scrutiny. It grows on one, doesn't it? Rachel shivered slightly. Uh, yes, it does, she said experimentally, watching her aunt's face for some indication of a malicious teasing humor. It seemed to her so incredible that this hideous parody of her own youth could honestly believe that any physical likeness still existed. Miss Dean, however, was faintly simpering. I have been told that I've changed very little, she said. And Rachel suppressed a sigh of impatience at the reflection that she was expected to play up to this absurd fantasy. Of course, I can't judge of that, she said, as we met for the first time five minutes ago. No, no, oh, you, you can't judge of that, her aunt replied, with the half-bashful emphasis of one who awaits a compliment. 
Rachel decided to plunge. "But you do look extraordinarily young for your age still," she lied desperately. Miss Deane straightened her back and toyed with a teaspoon. "I have always taken great care of myself," she said. Unquestionably she believed it, Rachel decided. This was no pose, but a horrible piece of self deception. This raddled, repulsive creature had actually persuaded herself into the delusion that she still had the appearance of a young girl. Heaven help her if that delusion were ever shattered. Yet outside this one obsession, Miss Deane, as Rachel soon discovered, had a clear and well-balanced mind. For, now that she had received her desired assurance from this new quarter, she began to talk of other things. Her boasted modernism, it is true, had a smack of the stiff broadcloth savor of the eighties, but she had a point of view that coincided far more nearly with Rachel's own than did that of her father. Her aunt, at least, had outlived the worst superstitions and inanities of the mid-Victorians. Indeed, by the time tea was finished, Rachel's spirits were beginning to revive. She would have to be very careful in her treatment of her aunt, but on the whole it would not perhaps be so bad, and presently she would see Adrian again. She would almost certainly get a letter from him by the last post, making some appointment to meet her, and after that she would introduce him to Miss Deane. She had a feeling that Miss Deane would not raise any objection, that she might even welcome the visit of a young man to her house. The time was passing so easily that Rachel was surprised when she heard the gong sound. "'Does that mean it's time to dress already?' she asked. Miss Deane nodded. "'You've an hour before dinner,' she said. "'But I'll go up now.' I like to be leisurely over my toilet. She rose as she spoke, but as she crossed the room she paused with what seemed to be a little jerk of surprise as she caught sight of her own reflection in a tall mirror above one of the gilt-legged console tables against the wall. Then she deliberately stopped, turned, and surveyed herself, half contemptuously, under lowered eyelids, with a set of her head and back that belied plainly enough the pout of her critical lips. And having admired that haggard image, she lifted her wasted hand and delicately touched her whitened hollow cheeks with the tips of her heavily jeweled fingers. Rachel stared in horror. It seemed to her just then as if the reflection of her aunt in the mirror was indeed that of herself grown instantly and mysteriously old. For now, whether because the reversal of the image by the mirror, or because of that perfect duplication of her own characteristic pose and gesture, the likeness had flashed out clear and unmistakable. She saw that her father had been right. Once, incalculable ages ago, this repulsive old woman might have been very like herself. She slipped quickly out of the room and ran upstairs. She felt that she must instantly put that question to the test, search herself for the signs of coming age as she had so recently searched her aunt's face for the indications of her former youth. But when, with an effect of challenge, she scrutinized her reflection in the tall cheval glass, the likeness appeared to have vanished. She saw her head thrust a little forward, her arms stiff, and in her whole pose an air of vigorous defiance. She was prepared to admit that she was ugly at that moment, if the ugliness was of another kind than that she had seen downstairs. No! She drew herself up, more than a little relieved by the result of her test. The likeness was all a fancy, 
the result of suggestions first by her father and then by Miss Dean herself. And she need at least have no fear that she was ugly. Why, she paused suddenly, and the light died out of her face. Her image was looking back at her stiffly, superciliously, with, so it seemed to her, the contemptible simper of one who still fatuously admires the thing that has long since lost its charm. She caught her breath and clenched her hands, drawing down her rather heavy eyebrows in an expression of angry scorn. Oh, never, never, never again will I look at myself like that, Rachel vowed fiercely. She was to find, however, before this first evening was over, that the mere avoidance of that one pose before the mirror would not suffice to lay the ghost of the suspicion that was beginning to haunt her. At the very outset a new version of the likeness was presented to her, when, during the first course of dinner, Miss Dean, with a lowering frown of her blackened eyebrows, found occasion to reprimand the elderly parlour-maid. For a moment Rachel was again puzzled by the intriguing sense of the familiar, before she remembered her own scowl at the looking-glass an hour before. Do I really frown like that? she thought, and on the instant found herself feeling like her aunt. That indeed was the horror that, despite every effort of resistance, deepened steadily as the evening wore on. Miss Dean had, without question, lost every trace of her beauty, but her character, her spirit, was unchanged, and it was, so Rachel increasingly believed, the very spit and replica of her own. They had the same characteristic gestures and expressions. The look of kindly tolerance with which her aunt regarded Rachel was precisely the same as that with which Rachel regarded her father. When her aunt's voice dropped in speaking from the rather shrill, strained tone that was obviously not natural to her, Rachel heard the inflections of her own voice. And as her knowledge of Miss Dean grew, so also did that haunting, unpleasant feeling of looking and speaking in precisely the same manner. It seemed to her as if she were being invaded by an alien personality, as if the character she had known and cherished all her life were no longer her own, but merely a casual inheritance from some unknown ancestor. Her very integrity was threatened by her consciousness of that likeness, her pride of individuality. She was not, after all, a unique personality, but merely another version, if she were even that, of a Miss Rachel Dean born in the middle of the previous century. Moreover, with that growing recognition of likeness and character, there came the thought that she in time might look even as her aunt looked at this present moment. She also would lose her beauty until no facial resemblance could be traced between the hag she was and the beauty she had once been. For, through all her torment, Rachel proudly clung to the certainty that, physically at least, there was no sort of likeness between her aunt and herself. Miss Dean's belief in that matter, however, was soon proved to be otherwise, for when they were alone, together in the drawing-room, after dinner, and the topic so inevitably present to both their minds came to the surface of conversation, she unexpectedly said, "'But we're evidently the poles apart in character and manner, my dear.' "'Oh, do you think so?' Rachel exclaimed. "'I, uh, it's a queer thing to say, perhaps.' but i curiously feel like you aunt when you speak sometimes and when i watch the way you do things miss dean shook her head i admit the physical resemblance she said 
Otherwise, my dear, we are utterly different." Did she, too, Rachel wondered, resent the aspersion of her integrity? By the last post, Rachel received her expected letter from Adrian Fleming. Her aunt separated it from the others brought in by her maid, and passed it across to her niece with a slight hint of displeasure in her face. "'Miss Rachel Dean, Junior,' she said. "'Really, it hadn't occurred to me how difficult it will be to distinguish our letters. I hope my friends won't take to addressing me as Miss Dean, Senior. Properly, of course, I am Miss Dean, and you Miss Rachel, but I'll admit there's sure to be some confusion. Now, my dear, I expect you're tired. You'd better run up to bed. Rachel was willing enough to go. She was glad to have an opportunity to read her letter in solitude. She was even more glad to get away from the company of this living echo of herself. I believe I should go mad if I had to live with her, she reflected. I should get into the way of copying her. I should begin to grow old before my time. When she reached her bedroom, she put down her letter unopened on the toilet table, and once more stared searchingly at her own reflection in the mirror. Was there any least trace of a physical likeness, she asked herself and began in imagination to follow the possible stages of the change that time would inevitably work upon her. She shrugged her shoulders. If there were indeed any sort of facial resemblance between herself and her aunt, no one would ever see it except in Miss Dean, and she was obsessed with a senile vanity. Yet was it, after all, Rachel began to wonder, an unnatural obsession. Might she not in time suffer from it herself? The change would be so slow, so infinitely gradual, and always one would be cherishing the old, loved image of youth and beauty, falling in love with it like a deluded hyacinth, and coming to be deceived by the fantasy of an unchanging appearance of youth. Looking always for the desired thing, she would suffer from the hallucination that the thing existed in fact, and imagine that the only artifice needed to perfect the illusion was a touch of paint and powder. No doubt her aunt, perhaps searching her own image in the mirror at this moment, saw not herself, but a picture of her niece. She was hypnotized by the suggestion of a pose and the desire of her own mind. In time, Rachel herself might also become the victim of a similar illusion. Oh, it was horrible! With a shudder, she picked up her letter and turned away from the looking-glass. She would forget that ghastly warning in the thought of the joys proper to her youth. She would think of Adrian and of her next meeting with him. She opened her letter to find that he had, rather timorously, suggested that she should meet him the next afternoon, at the marble arch at three o'clock, if he heard nothing from her in the meantime. For a few minutes she lost herself in delighted anticipation, and then slowly, insidiously, a new speculation crept into her mind. What would be the effect upon Adrian if he saw her and her aunt together? Would he recognize the likeness, and, anticipating the movement of more than half a century, see her in one amazing moment as she would presently become? And, in any case, what a terrible train of suggestion might not be started in his mind by the impression left upon him by the old woman. Once he had seen Miss Dean, Rachel's every gesture would serve to remind him of that repulsive image of rattled, deluded age. It might well be that, in time, he would come to see Rachel as she would presently be, rather than as she was. It would be a hideous reversal 
of the old romance. Instead of seeing the girl in the old woman, he would foresee the harridan in the girl. That picture presented itself to Rachel with a quite appalling effect of conviction. She suddenly remembered a case she had known that had remarkable points of resemblance, the case of a rather pretty girl with an unpleasant younger brother, who, so she had heard it said, put men off his sister because of the facial likeness between them. She was pretty, and he was ugly, but they were unmistakably brother and sister. Oh, it would be nothing less than folly to let Adrian and her aunt meet, Rachel decided. In imagination she could follow the process of his growing dismay. She could see his puzzled stare as he watched Miss Dean and struggled to fix that tantalizing suggestion of likeness to someone he knew. His flash of illumination as he solved the puzzle and turned with that gentle, winning smile of his to herself, and then the progress of his disillusionment as day by day he realized more plainly the intriguing similarities of expression and gesture, until he felt that he was making love to the spirit of an aged spinster temporarily disguised behind the appearance of beauty. 3. Rachel had believed on the first night of her arrival in Tavistock Square that, so far as her love affair was concerned, she would be able to avoid all danger by keeping her lover and her aunt unknown to each other. She very soon found, however, that the spell Miss Dean seemed to have put upon her was not to be laid by any effect of mere distance. She and Adrian met rather shyly at their first appointment. Both of them were a little conscious of having been overbold, one for having suggested, and the other for having agreed to so significant an assignation. And for the first few minutes their talk was nothing but a quick, nervous reminiscence of their earlier meetings. They had to recover the lost ground on which they had parted before they could go on to any more intimate knowledge of each other. But for some reason she had not yet realized, Rachel found it very difficult to recover that lost ground. She knew that she was being unnecessarily distant and cold, and though she inwardly accused herself of putting on absurd airs, her manner, as she was uncomfortably aware, remained at once stilted and detached. I suppose it's because I'm self-conscious before all these people, she thought, and, indeed, Hyde Park was very full that afternoon. And it was Adrian who first, a little desperately, tried to reach across the barrier that was dividing them. You're different, rather, in town, he began shyly. Is it the effect of your aunt's grandeurs? Am I different? I feel exactly the same, Rachel replied mechanically. You didn't think it was rather impudent of me to ask you to meet me here, did you? He went on anxiously. She shook her head emphatically. Oh, no, it wasn't that, she said. But then you admit that it was something, he pleaded. The people, perhaps, she admitted. I, I feel so exposed to the public view. We might walk across the park, if you preferred it, he suggested, and have tea at that place in Kensington Gardens. It would be quieter there. She agreed to that willingly. She wanted to be alone with him. The crowd made her nervous and self-conscious this afternoon. Always before she had delighted in moving among a crowd, appreciating and enjoying the casual glances of admiration she received. Today she was afraid of being noticed. She had a queer feeling that these smart, clever people in the park might see through her if they stared too closely. Just what they would discover she did not know, 
but she suffered a disquieting qualm of uneasiness whenever she saw any one observing her with attention. They cut across the grass, and, leaving the serpentine on their left, found two chairs in a quiet spot under the trees. Here, at least, they were quite unwatched, but still Rachel found it impossible to regain the relations that had existed between her and Adrian when they had parted a month earlier. And Adrian, too, it seemed, was staring at her with a new, inquisitive scrutiny. "'Why do you look at me like that?' she broke out at last. "'Do you notice any difference in me, or, or what? You, you, you've been staring so.' "'Difference,' he repeated. "'Well, I told you just now, didn't I, that you were different this afternoon?' "'Well, yes, but in what way?' she asked. "'Do I... do I look different?' He paused a little judiciously over his answer. N no he hesitated. "'There's something, though. Don't be offended, will you, if I say that you don't seem to be quite yourself today, not quite natural. I miss a rather characteristic expression of yours. You've never once looked at me with that rather tolerating air you used to put on. It was a horrid air, she said sharply. I've made up my mind to cure myself of it. Oh, no, don't, he protested. It wasn't at all horrid. It was... Don't think I'm trying to pay you a compliment. It was, well, charming. I've missed it dreadfully. She turned and looked at him, determined to try an experiment. This sort of air, do you mean? she asked, and with a sickening sensation of presenting the very gestures and appearance of her aunt, she regarded him under lowered eyelids with an expression of faintly supercilious approval. His smile at once thanked and answered her. But it's an abominable look, she exclaimed, the look of an old, old painted woman, vain, ridiculous. He stared at her in amazement. How absurd, he protested. Why, it's you, and you're certainly not old or painted nor unduly vain, and no one could say you were ridiculous. And you want me to look like that, she asked. It's, it's so you, he said shyly. But just suppose, she cried, that I went on looking like that after I'd grown old and ugly. Think how hateful it would be to see a hideous old woman posturing and pretending and making eyes. And, you see, if one gets a habit, it's so hard to get rid of it. Think of me at seventy, all painted and powdered, trying to seem as if I hadn't altered, and really believing that I hadn't. He laughed that pleasant, kind laugh of his, which had been one of the first things in him that had so attracted her. Oh, I'll chance the future, he said. Besides, if, if it could ever happen that, that your growing old came to me gradually, that I should be seeing you every day, I mean, I shouldn't notice it. I should be old, too, and I should think you hadn't altered either. He was afraid, as yet, to be too plain-spoken, but his tone made it quite clear that he asked for no greater happiness than that of seeing her grow old beside him. She did not pretend to misunderstand him. Would you? Perhaps you would, she said. But all the same, I don't think you need insist on that particular pose. He passed that by, too eager at the moment to claim the concession she had offered him. Is there any hope that I may be allowed to... to watch you growing old? he asked. Perhaps, if you'll let me do it in my own way, Rachel said. 
Adrian shyly took her hand. You mean that you will? That you don't mind? He put the question as if he had no doubt of its intelligibility to her. She nodded. When did you begin to know? he asked, awed by the wonder of this stupendous thing that had happened to him. From the beginning, I think. Rachel murmured. So did I, from the very beginning, he agreed, and from that they dropped into sacred reminiscences and comparisons concerning the innumerable things they had adoringly seen in each other, and had had as yet no opportunity to glory in. And in the midst of all these new and bewildering, embarrassing, delightful revelations and discoveries, Rachel completely forgot the shadow that was haunting her, forgot how she looked or felt or acted, forgot that there was or had ever been a terrible old woman who lived in Tavistock Square, and whose hold on life was maintained by her horrible mimicry of youth. And then, in a moment, she was lifted out of her dream and cruelly set down on the hard, unsympathetic earth by the sound of her lover's voice. "'I suppose I'll have to meet your aunt,' he was saying. "'Shall we go back there now and tell her?' Rachel flushed, as if he had suggested some startling invasion of her secret life. "'Oh, oh no!' she ejaculated impulsively. Adrian looked his surprise. "'But why not?' he asked. "'I'm—' I'm a perfectly respectable, eligible party. Oh, I wasn't thinking of that, Rachel said. Is she a terrible dragon? he inquired with a smile. Rachel shook her head, rejecting the excuse offered in favor of a more probable modification. She's odd, rather. She might prefer my giving her some kind of notice, she said. He accepted that without hesitation. "'Will you warn her, then?' he replied. "'And I'll come and do my duty to-morrow? "'I understand she's a lady to be propitiated.' Oh, "'Not to-morrow,' Rachel said. The irk and disgust of it all had returned to her with renewed force at the first mention of her aunt's name. The thought of Miss Dean had revived the repulsive sense of acting, speaking, looking like that aged caricature of herself. Yet she wanted, strangely enough, to get back to Tavistock Square, for only there, it seemed to her, was she safe from the examination of an inquisitive stare that might at any moment penetrate her secret and reveal her as a posturing hag masquerading in the alluring freshness of a young girl. "'I ought to be going back to her now,' she said. "'But you promised that we should have tea together,' Adrian remonstrated. "'Yes, I know. But please don't pester me. I'll see you again to-morrow,' Rachel returned with a touch of elderly hauteur. And despite all his entreaties, she would not be persuaded to change her mind. Already he was looking at her with a touch of suspicion, she thought, and as she checked his remonstrances, she was aware of doing it with the air, the tone, the very look that were her inheritance from endless generations of precisely similar ancestors. 4. If she could but have lived a double life, Rachel thought, her present position might have been endurable, and then, in a few months or even weeks, the problem would be solved forever by her marriage with Adrian, and the final obliteration of Miss Dean from her memory. But she could not live a double life. Day by day, as her intimacy with her aunt increased, Rachel found it more difficult to forget her when she was away from Tavistock Square. In the deepest and most beautiful moments of her intercourse with Adrian, she was aware now of practicing upon him a subtle deception, 
of pretending that she was other than she was in reality, an awareness that was constantly pricked and stimulated by the continually growing consciousness of her likeness to Miss Dean. Miss Dean, on her part, evidently took a great pleasure in her niece's society. The fortnight of her original invitation had already been exceeded, but she would not hear of Rachel's return to Devonshire. "'Why should you go back?' she demanded scornfully. "'Your father doesn't want you. Richard is one of those slipshod people who prefer to live alone. I used to try to stir him up, and he ran away from me. He'll run away from you, my dear, in a few years' time. He hasn't the courage to stand up to women like us.' Miss Dean unquestionably wanted her niece to stay with her. She was even beginning to hint at the desirability of making the present arrangement a permanent one. Rachel, however, was not flattered by this display of pleasure in her society. She knew that it was due to no individual charm of her own, but to the fact that she had become her aunt's mirror. For Miss Dean no longer, in Rachel's presence at least, gazed at herself in the looking-glass. She gazed at her niece instead. And, as Rachel endured the posings and simperings, the alternate adoration and fond contempt with which her aunt regarded her, she was unable to resist the impulse to reflect them. Every day she fell a little lower in that weakness and, however slight the likeness had once been, she knew that now it must be patent to every observer. She copied her aunt, mimicked, duplicated her. It was easier to do that than fight the resemblance against her aunt's determination. And so, by unnoticed degrees, she had permitted herself to become a lay figure upon which was dressed the image of Miss Dean's youth. She had even come to desire the look of almost sensual gratification on her aunt's face when she saw her niece so perfectly reflecting her own well-remembered airs. And Rachel, too, had come to avoid the looking-glass, dreading to see there the poses and gesticulations of the old repulsive woman whose every feature and expression had become so sickeningly familiar. And in all that time Adrian had not once been to the house in Tavistock Square. Rachel had kept him away by what she felt had become all too transparent excuses. That terror, at least, she felt, must be kept at bay, for she could not conceive it possible that once he had seen her and her aunt together, he could retain one spark of his admiration. He would, he must, see her then as she was, see that her contemptible vanity was the essential enduring thing, all that would remain when time had stripped her of youth's allurement. Nevertheless, the day came when Rachel could no longer endure to deceive him. He had challenged her, at last, with hiding something from him. Inevitably, he had become increasingly curious about her strange reticences concerning the Miss Dean, whom he, in turn, had grown to regard as almost mythical. And all his suppressed suspicions had suddenly found expression in a question. What are you hiding? Do you really live with your aunt in Tavistock Square? He had asked that day with all the fierce intensity of a jealous lover. Rachel had been stirred to a quick response. Oh, if you don't believe me, you'd better come and see for yourself, she had said. Come this afternoon to tea. And afterwards, even when Adrian had humbly sought to make amends for his unwarrantable jealousy, she had stuck to that invitation. The moment that she had issued it, she had had a sense of relief, a sense of having gratefully confessed her weakness. Adrian's visit would consummate that confession, and thereafter she would have no further secrets from him. 
and if he found that he could no longer love her after he had seen her as she was, well, it would be better in the end than that he should marry a simulacrum and make the discovery by slow degrees. Yes, come this afternoon. We'll expect you about four, had been her last words to him, and now she had to tell her aunt, who was still unaware that such a person as Adrian Fleming existed. Rachel postponed the telling, until after lunch. Her knowledge of Miss Dean, though in some respects it equaled her knowledge of her own mind, did not tell her how her aunt would take this particular piece of news. She might possibly, Rachel thought, be annoyed, fearful lest her beloved looking-glass should be stolen from her. But she could wait no longer. In half an hour Miss Dean would go upstairs to rest, and Adrian himself would be in the house before she appeared again. "'I've uh, something to tell you, Aunt,' Rachel began abruptly. Miss Dean put up her lorgnette and surveyed her lovely portrait with an interested air. "'Aunt, I've never told you, and I know I ought to have,' Rachel blurted out. "'But I'm—' I'm engaged to a Mr. Adrian Fleming, and he's coming here to call on you, to call on us, this afternoon, at four o'clock. Miss Dean closed her eyes and gave a little sigh. You might have given me rather longer notice, dear, she said. Oh, it isn't two yet, Rachel replied. There are more than two hours to get ready for him. Miss Dean bridled slightly. I must have my rest before he comes, she said, and added, I suppose you've told him about us, dear? About you? Rachel asked. Miss Dean nodded complacently. Well, not very much, Rachel admitted. Miss Dean's look, as she playfully threatened Rachel with her long-handled lorgnette, was distinctly sly. Then he doesn't know yet that there are two of us, she simpered. Won't it be just a little bit of a shock to him, my dear? Rachel drew a long breath and leaned back in her chair. Yes, she said curtly, I expect it will. Never before had the realization of that strange likeness seemed so intolerable as at that moment. Even now her aunt was looking at her with the very air and gesture which had once charmed her in her own reflection, and that she knew still charmed and fascinated her lover. It was an air and gesture of which she could never break herself. It was natural to her, a true expression of something ineradicable in her being. Indeed, one of the worst penalties imposed upon her during the past month had been the omission of those pleasant ceremonies before the mirror. She had somehow missed herself, lost the sweetest and most adorable of companions. Miss Dean got up, and holding herself very erect, moved with a little mincing step towards the tall mirror over the console table. Rachel held her breath. She saw that her aunt suddenly aroused by this thought of the coming lover, was returning mechanically to her old habit of self-admiration. Was it possible, Rachel wondered, that the sight of the image she would see in the looking-glass contrasted now with the memories of the living reflection she had so intimately studied for the past four weeks, might shock her into a realization of the starkly hideous truth? But it seemed that the aged woman must be blind. She gave no start of surprise as she paused before the glass. She showed no sign of anxiety concerning the vision she saw there. Her left hand, in which she held her lorgnette, had fallen to her side, and with the fingertips of her right she daintily caressed the hollows of her sunken cheeks. She stayed there until Rachel, unable to endure the sight any longer, and with some vague purpose of defiance in her mind, jumped to her feet, crossed the room, and stood shoulder by shoulder with her aunt, 
staring into the glass. For a moment Miss Dean did not move. Then, with a queer hesitation, she dropped her right hand and slowly lifted her lorgnette. Rachel felt a cold chill of horror invading her. Something fearful and terrible was happening before her eyes. Her aunt was shrinking, withering, growing old in a moment. The stiffness had gone out of her pose. Her head had begun to droop. The proud contempt in her face was giving way to the moping, resentful reminiscence of the aged. She still held up her lorgnette, still stared half fearfully at the glaring contrast that was presented to her, but her hand and arm had begun to tremble under the strain, and instant by instant all life and vigor seemed to be draining away from her. Then suddenly, with a fierce effort, she turned away her head, straightened herself, and walked over to the door, passing out with a high, thin cackle of laughter that had in it the suggestion of a vehement, petulant derision, of a bitterness outmastering control. Rachel shivered, but held her ground before the mirror. She had nothing to fear from that contemplation. As for her aunt, she had had her day. It was time she knew the truth. She had to know. Rachel repeated, addressing the dear likeness that so proudly reflected her. 5. She found consolation in that thought. Her aunt had to know, and Rachel herself was only the chance instrument of the revelation. She had not meant, so she persisted, to do more than vindicate her own integrity. Nevertheless, her own passionate problem was not yet solved. Her aunt would not, so Rachel believed, give way without a struggle. Had she not made a gallant effort at recovery even as she left the room, and would she not make a still greater effort when Adrian was there, assert her rivalry, if only in revenge? She must meet that, Rachel decided, by presenting a contrast. She would be meek and humble in her aunt's presence. Adrian might recognize the admired airs and gestures in those of the old woman, but he would at least have no opportunity to compare them. And it was with this thought and intention in her mind that Rachel received him when he arrived with a lover's promptness a little before four o'clock. "'Are you so dreadfully nervous?' he asked her when they were alone together in the drawing-room. You're like you were the first day we met in town, different from your usual self. Oh, what a memory you have for my looks and behavior, she replied pettishly. Of course I'm nervous. He tried to argue with her, questioning her as to Miss Dean's probable reception of him, but she refused to answer. You'll see for yourself in a few minutes, she said, but the minutes passed, and still Miss Dean did not come. At a quarter to five, the elderly parlour-maid brought in tea. Miss Dean said you were not to wait for her, Miss Rachel, was the message she delivered. She'll be down presently, I was to say. Rachel could not suppress a scornful twist of her mouth. She had no doubt that her aunt was taking very special pains with her toilette, trying to obliterate, perhaps, her recent vision before the console glass. Rachel saw her entrance in imagination, stiff-necked and proud, defying the criticisms of youth and the suggestions of age. "'Oh, why doesn't she come and let me get it over?' she passionately demanded, and even as she spoke, she heard the sounds of someone coming down the stairs, not the accustomed sounds of her aunt's finicking, high-heeled steps, but a shuffling and creaking, accompanied by the murmurs of a weak, protesting voice. Rachel jumped to her feet. She knew everything then, before the door opened, 
and she saw, first of all, the shocked, scared face of the elderly parlor maid, who supported the crumpled, palsied figure of the old, old woman who three hours before had been so miraculously young, magically upheld and supported them by the omnipotent strength of an idea. She only stayed in the drawing-room for five minutes. A querulous, resentful old lady, malignantly jealous, so it seemed, of their vigor and impatience of their sympathy. When the parlor-maid had been sent for and Miss Dean had gone, Rachel stood up and looked down at Adrian with all her old hauteur. "'Can you realize,' she asked, "'that once my aunt was supposed to be very, very like me?' He smiled and shook his head, as if the possibility was too absurd to contemplate. Rachel turned and looked at herself in the glass, raising her chin and slightly pursing her lips, staring superciliously at her own image under half-lowered eyelids. Some day I may be as she is now, she said, with the superb contemptuous arrogance of youth. Adrian was watching her with adoration. You will never grow old, he said. So long as one does not get the idea of growing old into one's head, Rachel began speculatively. But Miss Dean had got the idea so strongly now that she died that night. Rachel was with her at the last. The old woman was trying to mouth a text from the Bible. "'What did you say, dear?' Rachel murmured, bending over her, and caught enough of the answer to guess that Miss Dean was mumbling again and again, "'Now we see through a glass darkly.' but then face to face. End of Story 2 Story 3 of The Best British Short Stories of 1922 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 3. The Olive by Algernon Blackwood. From Pearson's Magazine, London, 1922. He laughed involuntarily as the olive rolled towards his chair across the shiny parquet floor of the hotel dining-room. His table in the cavernous salle à manger was apart. He sat alone, a solitary guest. The table from which the olive fell and rolled towards him was some distance away. The angle, however, made him an unlikely objective. Yet the lopsided, juicy thing, after hesitating once or twice en route as it plopped along, came to rest finally against his feet. It settled with an inviting, almost an aggressive, air, and he stooped and picked it up, putting it rather self-consciously, because of the girl from whose table it had come, on the white tablecloth beside his plate. Then, looking up, he caught her eye and saw that she too was laughing, though not a bit self-consciously. As she helped herself to the hors d'oeuvres, a false move had sent it flying. She watched him pick the olive up and set it beside his plate. Her eyes then suddenly looked away again, at her mother, questioningly. The incident was closed, but the little oblong succulent olive lay beside his plate so that his fingers played with it. He fingered it automatically from time to time, until his lonely meal was finished. When no one was looking, he slipped it into his pocket, as though, having taken the trouble to pick it up, this was the very least he could do with it. Heaven alone knows why, 
but he then took it upstairs with him, setting it on the marble mantelpiece among his field glasses, tobacco tins, ink bottles, pipes, and candlestick. At any rate, he kept it the moist, shiny, lob-sided, juicy little oblong olive. The hotel lounge wearied him. He came to his room after dinner to smoke at his ease, his coat off and his feet on a chair, to read another chapter of Freud, to write a letter or two he didn't in the least want to write, and then go to bed at ten o'clock. But this evening the olive kept rolling between him and the thing he read. It rolled between the paragraphs, between the lines. The olive was more vital than the interest of these eternal complexes and suppressed desires. The truth was that he kept seeing the eyes of the laughing girl beyond the bouncing olive. She had smiled at him in such a natural, spontaneous, friendly way before her mother's glance had checked her. A smile, he felt that might lead to acquaintance on the morrow. He wondered. A thrill of possible adventure ran through him. She was a merry-looking sort of girl, with a happy, half-roguish face that seemed on the lookout for somebody to play with. Her mother, like most of the people in the big hotel, was an invalid, the girl a dutiful and patient daughter. They had arrived that very day, apparently. A laugh is a revealing thing, he thought as he fell asleep, to dream of lopsided olive rolling consciously towards him, and of a girl's eyes that watched its awkward movements, then looked up into his own and laughed. In his dream the olive had been deliberately and cleverly dispatched upon its uncertain journey. It was a message. He did not know, of course, that the mother, chiding her daughter's awkwardness, had muttered, "'There you are again, child. True to your name, you never see an olive without doing something queer and odd with it.'" A youngish man, whose knowledge of chemistry, including invisible inks and such-like mysteries, had proved so valuable to the censor's department that for five years he had overworked without a holiday. The Italian Riviera had attracted him, and he had come out for a two-month's rest. It was his first visit. Sun, mimosa, blue seas, and brilliant skies had tempted him. Exchange made a pound worth forty, fifty, sixty, and seventy shillings. He found the place lovely, but somewhat untenanted. Having chosen at random, he had come to a spot where the companionship he hoped to find did not exist. The place languished after the war, slow to recover. The colony of resident English was scattered still. Travellers preferred the coast of France with Mentone and Monte Carlo to enliven them. The country, moreover, was distracted by strikes. The electric light failed one week, letters the next, and as soon as the electricians and postal workers resumed, the railways stopped running. Few visitors came, and the few who came soon left. He stayed on, however, caught by the sunshine and the good exchange, also without the physical energy to discover a better, livelier place. He went for walks among the olive groves, he sat beside the sea and palms, he visited shops and bought things he did not want, because the exchange made them seem cheap. He paid immense extras in his weekly bill, then chuckled as he reduced them to shillings, and found that a few pence covered them. He lay with a book for hours among the olive groves. The olive groves. His daily life could not escape the olive groves. To olive groves, sooner or later, his walks, his expeditions, his meanderings by the sea, his shopping, all led him to these ubiquitous olive groves. If he bought a picture postcard to send home, there was sure to be an olive grove in one corner of it. The whole place was smothered with olive groves. The people owed their incomes and existence to these irrepressible trees. The villages among the hills swam roof-deep in them. 
They swarmed even in the hotel gardens. The guide-books praised them as persistently as the residents brought them, sooner or later, into every conversation. They grew lyrical over them. And how do you like our olive trees? Ah, you think them pretty. At first most people are disappointed. They grow on one. They do, he agreed. I am glad you appreciate them. I find them the embodiment of grace. And when the wind lifts the under-leaves across a whole mountain slope, why, it's wonderful, isn't it? One realizes the meaning of olive green. One does, he sighed. But all the same, I should like to get one to eat. An olive, I mean. Ah, to eat, e yes, that's not so easy. You see, the crop is... Exactly, he interrupted impatiently, weary of the habitual and evasive explanations. But I should like to taste the fruit. I should like to enjoy one. For, after a stay of six weeks, he had never once seen an olive on the table, in the shops, nor even on the street barrows at the marketplace. He had never tasted one. No one sold olives, though olive trees were a drug in the place. No one bought them, no one asked for them. It seemed that no one wanted them. The trees, when he looked closely, were thick with a dark little berry that seemed more like a sour sloe than the succulent, delicious, spicy fruit associated with its name. Men climbed the trunks everywhere, shaking the laden branches and hitting them with long bamboo poles to knock the fruit off while women and children, squatting on their haunches, spent laborious hours filling baskets underneath, then loading mules and donkeys with their daily catch. But an olive to eat was unobtainable. He had never cared for olives, but now he craved with all his soul to feel his teeth in one. Ach! But it is the Spanish olive that you eat, explained the head waiter, a German from Basel. These are for oil only. After which he disliked the olive more than ever, until that night when he saw the first eatable specimen rolling across the shiny parquet floor, propelled towards him by the careless hand of a pretty girl, who then looked up into his eyes and smiled. He was convinced that Eve, similarly, had rolled the apple towards Adam across the emerald sward of the first garden in the world. He slept, usually, like the dead. It must have been something very real that made him open his eyes and sit up in bed alertly. There was a noise against his door. He listened. The room was still quite dark. It was early morning. The noise was not repeated. "'Who's there?' he asked in a sleepy whisper. "'What is it?' The noise came again. Someone was scratching on the door. "'No, it, it was someone tapping.' "'What do you want?' he demanded in a louder voice. "'Come in,' he added, wondering sleepily whether he was presentable. Either the hotel was on fire or the porter was waking the wrong person for some sunrise expedition. Nothing happened. Wide awake now, he turned the switch on, but no light flooded the room. The electricians, he remembered with a curse, were out on strike. He fumbled for the matches, and as he did so, a voice in the corridor became distinctly audible. It was just outside his door. "'Aren't you ready?' he heard. "'You sleep forever.' And the voice, although never having heard it before, he could not have recognized it, belonged, he knew suddenly, to the girl who had let the olive fall. In an instant he was out of bed. He lit a candle. "'I'm coming,' he called softly, as he slipped rapidly into some clothes. "'I'm sorry I've kept you. I shan't be a minute.' "'Be quick, then.' he heard, while the candle flame slowly grew, and he found his garments. Less than three minutes later he opened the door and, candle in hand, peered into the dark passage. "'Blow it out!' came a peremptory whisper. He obeyed, but not quick enough. 
a pair of red lips emerged from the shadows. There was a puff, and the candle was extinguished. I've got my reputation to consider. We mustn't be seen, of course. The face vanished in the darkness, but he had recognized it, the shining skin, the bright glancing eyes. The sweet breath touched his cheek. The candlestick was taken from him by a swift, deft movement. He heard it knock the wainscoting as it was set down. He went out into a pitch-black corridor, where a soft hand seized his own and led him, by a back door it seemed, out into the open air of the hillside immediately behind the hotel. He saw the stars. The morning was cool and fragrant. The sharp air waked him, and the last vestiges of sleep went flying. He had been drowsy and confused, had obeyed the summons without thinking. He now realized suddenly that he was engaged in an act of madness. The girl, dressed in some flimsy material thrown loosely about her head and body, stood a few feet away, looking, he thought, like some figure called out of dreams and slumber of a forgotten world, out of legend almost. He saw her evening shoes peep out, he divined an evening dress beneath the gauzy covering. The light wind blew it close against her figure. He thought of a nymph. "'I say, but haven't you been to bed?' he asked stupidly. He had meant to expostulate, to apologize for his foolish rashness, to scold and say they must go back at once. Instead, this sentence came. He guessed she had been sitting up all night. He stood still a second, staring in mute admiration, his eyes full of bewildered question. Watching the stars, she met his thought with a happy laugh. Orion has touched the horizon. I came for you at once. We've got just four hours. The voice, the smile, the eyes, the reference to Orion swept him off his feet. Something in him broke loose and flew wildly, recklessly, to the stars. "'Let us be off!' he cried, before the bear tilts down. Already Alcyon begins to fade. I'm ready. Come!" She laughed. The wind blew the gauze aside to show two ivory-white limbs. She caught his hand again, and they scampered together up the steep hillside towards the woods. Soon the big hotel, the villas, the white houses of the little town where natives and visitors still lay soundly sleeping, were out of sight. The farther sky came down to meet them. The stars were paling, but no sign of actual dawn was yet visible. The freshness stung their cheeks. Slowly the heavens grew lighter, the east turned rose, the outline of the trees defined themselves, there was a stirring of the silvery green leaves. They were among olive groves, but the spirits of the trees were dancing. Far below them, a pool of deep color, they saw the ancient sea. They saw the tiny specks of distant fishing boats. The sailors were singing to the dawn, and birds among the mimosa of the hanging gardens answered them. Pausing a moment at length beneath a gaunt old tree, whose struggle to leave the clinging earth had tortured its great writhing arms and trunk, they took their breath, gazing at one another with eyes full of happy dreams. "'You understood so quickly,' said the girl, "'my little message. I knew by your eyes and ears you would.' And she first tweaked his ears with two slender fingers mischievously, then laid her soft palm with a momentary light pressure on both eyes. "'You're half and half, at any rate,' she added, looking him up and down for a swift instant of appraisement. "'If you're not altogether.' The laughter showed her white, even little teeth. "'You know how to play, and that's something,' she added. Then, as if to herself, "'You'll be altogether before I've done with you.' "'Shall I?' he stammered, afraid to look at her. Puzzled, some spirit of compromise still lingering in him, he knew not what she meant. 
He knew only that the current of life flowed increasingly through his veins, but that her eyes confused him. "'I'm longing for it,' he added. "'How wonderfully you did it! They roll so awkwardly!' "'Oh, that!' she peered at him through a wisp of hair. "'You've kept it, I hope.' "'Rather! It's on my mantelpiece.' "'You're sure you haven't eaten it?' And she made a delicious mimicry with her red lips, so that he saw the tip of a small pointed tongue. "'I shall keep it,' he swore, "'as long as these arms have life in them.' And he seized her just as she was crouching to escape, and covered her with kisses. "'I knew you longed to play,' she panted, when he released her. "'Still, it was sweet of you to pick it up before another got it.' another he exclaimed the gods decide it's a lopsided thing remember it can't roll straight she looked oddly mischievous elusive he stared at her if it had rolled elsewhere and another had picked it up he began i should be with that other now and this time she was off and away before he could prevent her and the sound of her silvery laughter mocked him among the olive trees beyond he was up and after her in a second following her slim whiteness in and out of the old world grove as she flitted lightly her hair flying in the wind her figure flashing like a ray of sunlight or the race of foaming water till at last he caught her and drew her down upon his knees and kissed her wildly forgetting who and where and what he was. Hark! she whispered breathlessly, one arm close about his neck. I hear their footsteps. Listen, it is the pipe. The pipe? he repeated, conscious of a tiny but delicious shudder. For a sudden chill ran through him as she said it. He gazed at her. The hair fell loose about her cheeks, flushed and rosy with his hot kisses. Her eyes were bright and wild for all their softness. Her face, turned sideways to him as she listened, wore an extraordinary look that for an instant made his blood run cold. He saw the parted lips, the small white teeth, the slim neck of ivory, the young bosom panting from his tempestuous embrace. Of an unearthly loveliness and brightness she seemed to him, yet with this strange, remote expression that touched his soul with sudden terror. Her face turned slowly. "'Who are you?' he whispered. He sprang to his feet without waiting for her answer. He was young and agile, strong, too, with that quick response of muscle they have who keep their bodies well that he was no match for her. Her speed and agility outclassed his own with ease. She leapt. Before he had moved one leg forward towards escape, she was clinging with soft, supple arms and limbs about him, so that he could not free himself. And as her weight bore him downwards to the ground, her lips found his own and kissed them into silence. She lay buried again in his embrace, her hair across his eyes, her heart against his heart, and he forgot his question, forgot his little fear, forgot the very world he knew. They come, they come, she cried gaily. The dawn is here. Are you ready? I've been ready for five thousand years, he answered, leaping to his feet beside her. All together! came upon a sparkling laugh that was like wind among the olive leaves. Shaking her last gauzy covering from her, she snatched his hand, and they ran forward together to join the dancing throng, now crowding up the slope beneath the trees. Their happy singing filled the sky. Decked with vine and ivy and trailing silvery-green branches, they poured in a flood of radiant life along the mountainside. Slowly they melted away into the blue distance of the breaking dawn, and as the last figure disappeared, the sun came up slowly out of a purple sea. They came to the place he knew, the deserted earthquake village, 
and a faint memory stirred in him. He did not actually recall that he had visited it already, had eaten his sandwiches with hotel friends beneath its crumbling walls, but there was a dim, troubling sense of familiarity, nothing more. The houses still stood, but pigeons lived in them, and weasels, stoats, and snakes had their uncertain homes in ancient bedrooms. Not twenty years ago the peasants thronged its narrow streets, through which the dawn now peered and cool wind breathed among dew-laden brambles. "'I know the house,' she cried, "'the house where we would live,' and raced, a flying form of air and sunlight, into a tumbled cottage that had no roof, no floor, or windows. Wild bees had hung a nest against the broken wall. He followed her. There was sunlight in the room, and there were flowers. Upon a rude, simple table lay a bowl of cream, with eggs and honey and butter close against a homemade loaf. They sank into each other's arms upon a couch of fragrant grass and boughs against the window, where wild roses bloomed, and the bees flew in and out. It was Busana, the so-called earthquake village, because a sudden earthquake had fallen on it one summer morning when all the inhabitants were at church. The crashing roof killed sixty, the tumbling walls another hundred, and the rest had left it where it stood. The church, he said vaguely, remembering the story, they were at prayer. The girl laughed carelessly in his ear, setting his blood in a rush and quiver of delicious joy. He felt himself untamed, wild as the wind and animals. The true God claimed his own, she whispered. He came back. Ah, they were not ready. The old priests had seen to that. But he came. They heard his music. Then his tread shook the olive groves, the old ground danced, the hills leapt for joy, and the houses crumbled, he laughed, as he pressed her closer to his heart. And now we've come back, she cried merrily, we've come back to worship and be glad. She nestled into him while the sun rose higher. I hear them, hark, she cried, and again leapt dancing from his side. Again he followed her like wind. Through the broken window they saw the naked fawns and nymphs and satyrs rolling, dancing, shaking their soft hoofs amid the ferns and brambles. Towards the appalling, ruptured church they sped with feet of light and air. A roar of happy song and laughter rose. Come, he cried, we must go too. Hand in hand they raced to join the tumbling, dancing throng. She was in his arms and on his back, and flung across his shoulders as he ran. They reached the broken building, its whole roof gone sliding years ago, its walls a-tremble still, its shattered shrines alive with nesting birds. Hush! she whispered in a tone of awe, yet pleasure. He is there! She pointed, her bare arm outstretched above the bending heads. There, in the empty space, where once stood sacred host and cup, he sat, filling the niche sublimely and with awful power. His shaggy form, benign yet terrible, rose through the broken stone. The great eyes shone and smiled. The feet were lost in brambles. God! cried a wild, frightened voice, yet with deep worship in it, and the old familiar panic came with portentous swiftness. The great figure rose. The birds flew screaming, the animals sought holes, the worshippers, laughing and glad a moment ago, rushed tumbling over one another for the doors. He goes again! Who called? Who called like that? His feet shake the ground. It is the earthquake, 
screamed a woman's shrill accents in ghastly terror. "'Kiss me, one kiss, before we forget again,' sighed a laughing, passionate voice against his ear. "'Once more your arms, your heart beating, on my lips. You recognized his power. You are now all together. We shall remember.' But he woke, with the heavy bedclothes stuffed against his mouth, and the wind of early morning sighing mournfully about the hotel walls. "'Have they left again, those ladies?' he inquired casually of the head-waiter, pointing to the table. They, uh, "'They were here last night at dinner.' "'Who do you mean?' replied the man, stupidly, gazing at the spot indicated with a face quite blank. Last night? At dinner? He tried to think. An English lady, elderly, with her daughter. At which moment precisely the girl came in alone. Lunch was over, the room empty. There was a second's difficult pause. It seemed ridiculous not to speak. Their eyes met the girl blushed furiously. He was very quick for an Englishman. I was allowing myself to ask after your mother, he began. I was afraid, he glanced at the table laid for one, she was not well, perhaps? Oh, but that's very kind of you, I'm sure. She smiled. He saw the small, white, even teeth and before three days had passed he was so deeply in love that he simply couldn't help himself. "'I believe,' he said lamely, "'this is yours. You dropped it, you know. Er, uh, may I keep it? it? It's only an olive.' They were, of course, in an olive grove when he asked it, and the sun was setting. She looked at him, looked him up and down, looked at his ears, his eyes. He felt that in another second her little fingers would slip up and tweak the first or close the second with a soft pressure. Tell me, he begged, did you dream anything that first night I saw you? She took a quick step backwards. No, she said, as he followed her more quickly still, I don't think I did. But, she went on breathlessly as he caught her up. I knew from the way you picked it up. Knew what? he demanded, holding her tightly so that she could not get away again. That you were already half and half, but would soon be all together. And as he kissed her, he felt her soft little fingers tweak his ears. End of Story 3 Story four of the best British short stories of nineteen twenty two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The best British short stories of nineteen twenty two by various. Story four Once a Hero by Harold Brighouse from Pan. 1922. Standing in a sheltered doorway, a tramp, with a slouch hat crammed low over a notably unwashed face, watched the outside of the new works canteen of the Sir William Rumbold Limited Engineering Company. Perhaps because they were workers while he was a tramp, he had an air of compassionate cynicism as the audience assembled and thronged into the building which, as prodigally advertised throughout Calderside, was to be opened that night by Sir William in person. There being no one to observe him, the tramp could be frank with his cynicism. But inside the building, in the platform anteroom, Mr. Edward Fosdyke, who was Sir William's locally resident secretary, had to discipline his private feelings to a suave concurrence in his employer's florid enthusiasm. 
Fosdike served Sir William well, but no man is a hero to his male secretary. "I hope you will find the arrangements satisfactory," Fosdike was saying, tugging nervously at his maltreated moustache. "You speak at seven and declare the canteen open. Then there's a meal." He hesitated. "Perhaps I should have warned you to dine before you came." Sir William was aware of being a very gallant gentleman. "'Not at all,' he said heroically, "'not at all. I have not spared my purse over this war memorial. Why should I spare my feelings? Well, now, you've seen about the press? Oh, yes, the reporters are coming. There'll be flashlight photographs. Everything quite as usual when you make a public appearance, sir.' Sir William wondered if this resident secretary of his were quite adequate. Busy in London, he had left all arrangements in his local factotum's hands, and he was doubting whether those hands had grasped the situation competently. "'Only as usual?' he said sharply. "'This war memorial has cost me ten thousand pounds.' "'The amount,' Fosdyke hastened to assure him, has been circulated with appropriate tribute to your generosity. Generosity, criticized Rumbold. I hope you didn't use that word. Mr. Fosdyke referred to his notebook. We said, he read, the cost, though amounting to ten thousand pounds, is entirely beside the point. Sir William felt that no expense was excessive that would result in a fitting and permanent expression of our gratitude to the glorious dead. Uh, "'Thank you, Fosdyke. That is exactly my feeling,' said the gratified Sir William, paying Fosdyke the unspoken compliment of thinking him less of a fool than he looked. "'It is,' he went on, "'from no egotistic motive that I wish the press to be strongly represented to-night. I believe that in deciding that Calderside's war memorial should take the form of a works canteen, I am setting an example of enlightenment which other employers would do well to follow. I have erected a monument, not in stone, but in good will, a clubhouse for both sexes to serve as a centre of social activities for the firm's employees, wherein the great spirit of the noble work carried out at the front by the y m c a will be recaptured and adapted to peace conditions in our local organization in the martlow works canteen what are you taking notes for i thought began fosdyke oh well perhaps you are right reporters have been known to miss one's point and a little first aid eh by the way i sent you some notes from town of what I intended to say in my speech. I just sent them ahead, in case there was any local point I'd got wrong." He put it as a question, but actually it was an assertion and a challenge. It asserted that by no possible chance could there be anything injudicious in the proposed speech, and it challenged Fosdyke to deny that assertion if he dared. And Fosdyke had to dare. He had to accuse himself of assuming too easily that Rumbold's memory of local Calderside detail was as fresh as the memory of the man on the spot. "'I um, did want to suggest a modification, sir,' he hazarded timidly. "'Really?' quite below zero. "'Really. I felt very contented with the speech. "'Yes, sir, it's masterly.' But on the spot here oh agreed quite right fosdyke i am speaking to-night to the world no let me guard against exaggeration the world includes the polynesians and esquimaux i am speaking to the english-speaking races of the world but first and foremost to calderside my own people yes you have a little something to suggest some happy local allusion it's about martlow said fosdyke shortly sir william took him up ah now you're talking he approved yes indeed anything you can add to my notes about martlow will be most welcome i have noted much but too much is not enough for such an illustrious example of conspicuous gallantry 
so noble a life, so great a deed, and so self sacrificing an end. Any details you can add about Timothy Martlow will indeed. Falstyke coughed. Excuse me, sir, that's just the point. If you talk like that about Martlow down here, they'll laugh at you. Laugh? gasped Rumbold, his sense of propriety outraged. My dear Fosdyke, what's come to you? I celebrate a hero, our hero. Why, I'm calling the canteen after Martlow when I might have given it my own name. That speaks volumes. It did. But Fosdyke knew too well what would be the attitude of a Calderside audience if he allowed his chief to sing in top notes an unreserved eulogy of Tim Martlow. Calderside knew Tim, the civilian, if it had also heard of Tim, the soldier. Don't you remember Martlow, sir? Before the war, I mean? No. Ought I to? Not on the bench? Martlow? Yes, now I think of the name in connection with the old days. There was a drunken fellow. To be sure, an awful blackguard, continually before the bench. Dear me! Well, well, but a man is not responsible for his undesirable relations, I hope. No, sir, but that was Martlow, the same man. You really can't speak to Calderside of his as an ennobling life and a great example. The war changed him, but well in peace tim was absolutely the local bad man and they all know it i thought you did or sir william turned a face expressive of awestruck wonder fosdyke he said with deep sincerity this is the most amazing thing i've heard of the war i never connected martlow the hero with well well de mortuis he quoted, Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one that had been studied in his death to throw away the dearest thing he owed as there a careless trifle. Appropriate, I think. I shall use that. It was, at least, a magnificent recovery from an unexpected blow, administered by the very man whose duty it was to guard Sir William against just that sort of blow. If Fosdyke was not the local watchdog, he was nothing, and here was an occasion when the dog had omitted to bark until the last minute of the eleventh hour. Very apt quotation, sir, though there have never been any exact details of Martlow's death. Sir William meditated. Do you recall the name of the saint who was a regular rip before he got religion, he asked. I think that applies to most of them, said Fosdyke. Uh, yes, but the one in particular. Francis, that's it. He filled his chest. Timothy Martlow, he pronounced impressively, is the St. Francis of the Great War, and this canteen is his shrine. Now I think I will go into the hall. It is early, but I shall chat with the people. Oh, one last thought. When you mentioned Martlow, I thought you were going to tell me of some undesirable connections. There are none? Well, there is his mother, a widow. You remember the board voted her an addition to her pension. Oh, yes. And she? Oh, most grateful. She will be with you on the platform. I have seen myself that she is uh, fittingly attired. I think I can congratulate you, Fosdyke, said Sir William magnanimously. You've managed very well. I look forward to a pleasant evening, a widely reported speech, and— Then Dolly Wainwright came into the anteroom. If you please, sir, she said, what's going to be done about me? Two gentlemen who had all but reached the smug bathos of a mutual admiration society turned astonished eyes at the intruder. She wore a tam and a check blanket coat, which she unbuttoned as they watched her. Beneath it, suitable to the occasion, was a white dress, 
and Sir William, looking at it, felt a glow of tenderness for this artless child who had blundered into the privacy of the anteroom. Something daintily virginal in Dolly's face appealed to him. He caught himself thinking that her frock was more than a miracle in bleached cotton. It was moonshine shot with alabaster, and the improbability of that combination had hardly struck him when Fosdyke's voice forced itself harshly on his ears. "'How did you get in here?' Sir William moved to defend the girl from the anger of his secretary, but when she said with a certain challenge, "'Through the door!' he doubted if she were so defenceless as she seemed. "'But there's a doorkeeper at the bottom,' said Fosdyke. "'I gave him my orders.' "'I gave him my smile.' said Dolly. I won. Upon my word, Fosdyke began. Well, well, interrupted Sir William, what can I do for you? The reply was indirect, but caused Sir William still further to readjust his estimate of her. I've got friends in the meeting tonight, she concluded. They'll speak up for me, too, if I'm not righted. So I'm telling you. "'Don't threaten me, my girl,' said Sir William, without severity. "'I am always ready to pay attention to any legitimate grievance, but—' "'Legitimate?' she interrupted. "'Well, mine's not legitimate, so there.' "'I beg your pardon?' She puzzled Sir William. "'Come now,' he went on, in his most patriarchal manner. "'Don't assume I'm not going to listen to you. I am.' To-night there is no thought in my mind except the welfare of Calderside. Oh, well, she said apologetically, I'm sorry if I riled you, but it's a bit awkward to speak it out to a man. Only the unconscious cruelty of youth, or was it conscious? You're both old, so perhaps I can get through. It's about Tim Martlow. Ah, said Sir William encouragingly, our glorious hero. Yes, said Dolly, I'm the mother of his child. We are all balloons dancing our lives amongst pins. Therefore be compassionate towards Sir William. He collapsed speechlessly on a hard chair. Fosdyke reacted more alertly. This is the first I've heard of Martlow's being married, he said aggressively. Dolly looked up at him indignantly. "'You ain't heard it now, have you?' she protested. "'I said it wasn't legitimate. I don't say we'd not have got married if there'd been time, but you can't do everything on short leave.' There seemed an obvious retort. Rumbold and Fosdyke looked at each other, and neither made the retort. Instead, Fosdyke asked, "'Are you employed in the works here?' I was here, on munitions, she said, and then on doles. And now you're on the make, he sneered. Oh, I don't know, she said, all this fuss about Tim Martlow. I ought to have my bit out of it. Deplorable, grieved Sir William, the crass materialism of it all. This is so sad. How old are you? Twenty, said Dolly. Twenty, with a child to keep, and his father's name up in gold lettering in that hall there. I say somebody ought to do something. I suppose now, Miss Fosdyke balked, Wainwright, Dolly Wainwright, though it ought to be Martlow. I suppose you loved Tim very dearly? Well, I liked him well enough. He was good-looking in his khaki liked him? I, I'm sure it was more than that. Oh, I don't know. Why? asked the girl, who said she was the mother of Martlow's child. I am sure, said Fosdyke gravely, you would never do anything to bring a stain upon his memory. Dolly proposed a bargain. If I'm rightly done by, she said, I'll do right by him. Anything that marred the harmony of tonight's ceremony, Miss Wainwright, would be unthinkable, said Sir William, coming to his lieutenant's support. Right, said Dolly cheerfully. 
If you'll take steps according, I'm sure I've no desire to make a scene." "A scene?" gasped Sir William. "Though," she pointed out, "it's a lot to ask of any one, you know, giving up the certain chance of getting my photograph in the papers. I make a good picture, too. Some do and some don't, but I take well, and when you know you've got the looks to carry off a scene, it's asking something of me to give up the idea." "'But you said you'd no desire to make a scene.' "'Poor girls have often got to do what they don't wish to. I wouldn't make a scene in the usual way. Hysterics and all that. Hysterics means cold water in your face, and your dress must up, and no sympathy. But with scenes, the greater the occasion, the greater the reward. And there's no denying this is an occasion, is there?' You're making a big to-do about Tim Martlow, and the reward would be according. I don't know if you've noticed that if a girl makes a scene and she's got the looks for it, she gets offers of marriage, like they do in the police court, when they've been wronged and the magistrate passes all the men's letters on to the court missionary, and the girl and the missionary go through them and choose the likeliest fellow out of the bunch. But, 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 my dear young lady, Fosdyke began. She silenced him. Oh, it's all right. I don't know that I want to get married. Then you ought to, said Sir William virtuously. There's better things in life than getting married, Dolly said. I've weighed up marriage, and I don't see what there is in it for a girl nowadays. In your case, I should have thought there was everything. Dolly sniffed. There isn't liberty, she said, and we won the fight for liberty, didn't we? No. If I made that scene, it'd be to get my photograph in the papers where the film people could see it. I've the right face for the pictures, and my romantic history will do the rest. Good heavens, girl, cried the scandalized Sir William. Have you no reverence at all? The pictures? You'd turn all my disinterested efforts to ridicule? You'd—oh, but there, you're not going to make a scene. Well, that's a matter of arrangement, of course, said the cool lady. I'm only showing you what a big chance I shall miss if I oblige you. Suppose I pipe up my tale of woe just when you're on the platform with the Union Jack behind you and the reporters in front of you and that tablet in there that says Tim is the greatest glory of Calderside. Sir William nearly screamed. Be quiet, girl! Fosdyke! he snarled, turning viciously on his secretary. What the deuce do you mean by pretending to keep an eye on local affairs when you miss a thing like this? Tisn't his fault, said Dolly. I've been saving this up for you. Oh, he groaned, and I'd felt so happy about tonight. He took out a fountain pen. Well, I suppose there's no help for it. Fosdyke, what's the amount of the pension we allow Martlow's mother? Double it, add a pound a week, and what's the answer, Mr. Fosdyke? asked Dolly quickly. Sir William gasped ludicrously. I mean to say, said Dolly, conferring on his gasp the honour of an explanation. She's old, and didn't go on munitions, and didn't get used to wangling income tax on her wages, and never had no ambitions to go on the pictures, neither. What's compensation to her isn't compensation to me. I've got a higher standard. The less you say about your standards, the better, my girl, retorted Sir William. Do you know that this is blackmail? No, it isn't. Not when I ain't ask you for nothing. And if I pass the remark how that three pounds a week is my idea of a minimum wage, it isn't blackmail to state the fact. Sir William paused in the act of tearing a page out of Fosdyke's notebook. Three pounds a week? Well, said Dolly reasonably, I didn't depreciate the currency. Three pounds a week is little enough these times for the girl who fell from grace through the chief glory of Calderside. 
"But suppose you marry?" suggested Mr. Fosdike. "Then I marry well," she said, "having means of my own. And I ought to, seeing I'm kind of widow to the chief glory of " Sir William looked up sharply from the table. "If you use that phrase again," he said, "I'll tear this paper up." "Widow to Tim Martlow," she amended it, defiantly. He handed her the document he had drawn up. It was an undertaking in brief, unambiguous terms to pay her three pounds a week for life. As she read it, exulting, the door was kicked open. The tramp, whose name was Timothy Martlow, came in and, turning, spoke through the doorway to the janitor below. "'Call out,' he said, "'and I'll come back and knock you down again.' Then he locked the door. Fosdyke went courageously towards him. "'What do you mean by this intrusion? Who are you?' The tramp assured himself that his hat was well pulled down over his face. He put his hands in his pockets and looked quizzically at the advancing Mr. Fosdyke. "'So far,' he said, "'I'm the man that locked the door.' Fosdyke started for the second door, which led directly to the platform. The tramp reached it first and locked it, shouldering Fosdyke from him. Now, he said, Sir William was searching the wall, are there no bells? he asked desperately. No. No, jeered the tramp. No bell, no telephone, no nothing. You're scotched without your rifle this time. Fosdyke consulted Sir William. I might shout for the police, he suggested. It's risky, commented the tramp. They sometimes come when they're called. Then, began the secretary. It's your risk, emphasized the tramp, and I don't advise it. I've gone to a lot of trouble this last week to keep out of sight of the Calderside police. They'd identify me easy and Sir William wouldn't like that. "'I wouldn't like?' said Rumbold. "'I? Who are you?' "'Wounded and missing, believed dead,' quoted the tramp. "'Only there's been a lot of beliefs upset in this war, and I'm one of them.' "'One of what?' "'I'm telling you, one of the strayed sheep that got mislaid and come home at the awkwardest times.' He snatched his hat off. Have a good look at that face, your worship. Timothy Martlow, cried Sir William. Fosdyke staggered to a chair, while Dolly, who had shown nothing but amusement at the tramp, now gave a quick cry and shrank back against the wall, exhibiting every symptom of the liveliest terror. Of the trio, Sir William, for whom surely this inopportune return had the most serious implications, alone stood his ground, and Martlow grimly appreciated his pluck. "'It's very near made a stretcher case of him,' he said, indicating the prostrated Fosdyke. "'You're cooler. Walking wounded.' "'I, uh, really, uh—' "'Shake hands, old cock,' said Martlow. I know you've got it writ up in there, he jerked his head towards the hall, that I'm the chief glory of Calderside, but damn if you're not the second best yourself. And I'll condescend to shake your hand if it's only to show you I'm not a ghost. Sir William decided that it was politic to humor this visitor. He shook hands. Then, if you know, he said, if you know what this building is, it isn't accident that brings you here tonight. The sort of accident you set with a time fuse, said Martlow grimly. I told you I'd been dodging the police for a week, lest any of my old pals should recognize me. I was waiting to get you tonight, and sitting tight and listening. The things I heard nearly made me take my hat off to myself. But not quite, not quite. I kept my hat on, and I kept my hair on. It's a mistake to act premature on information received. If I'd sprung this too soon, the wrong thing might have happened to me. 
"'What wrong thing, Martlow?' asked Sir William, with some indignation. If the fellow meant anything, it was that he would have been spirited away by Sir William. "'Oh, anything,' replied Martlow. "'Anything would be wrong that made me miss this pleasure. You and me conversing affable here? Not a bit like it was in the old days before I rose to being the chief glory of Calderside. Conversation was one-sided then, and all on your side instead of mine. Here again, Martlow, you'd say, and then they'd gabble the evidence, and you'd say, fourteen days, or twenty-one days, if you'd got up peevish, and that's all there was to our friendly intercourse. This time I make no doubt you'll be asking me to stay at the Towers to-night. And, he went on blandly, enjoying every wince that twisted Sir William's face in spite of his efforts to appear unmoved, I don't know that I'll refuse. It's a leveling thing, war. I've read that war makes us all conscious we're members of one brotherhood, and I know it's true now. Consequently, the chief glory of the place ain't got no right to be too high and mighty to accept your humble invitation. The best guest room for Sergeant Martlow, you'll say. See, there's a hot water bottle in his bed, you'll say, and in case he's thirsty in the night, you'll tell him to put the whiskey by his side. After all, a man does not rise to become Sir William Rumbold by being flabby. Sir William struck the table heavily. Somehow he had to put a period to this mocking harangue. Martlow, he said, how many people know you're here? Tim gave a good imitation of Sir William's gesture. He, too, could strike a table. Rumbold, he retorted, what's the value of a secret when it's not a secret? You three in this room know, and not another soul in Calderside. Not even your mother? queried Rumbold. No. I've been a bad son to her in the past. I'm a good one now I'm dead. She's got a bit of pension, and I'll not disturb that. I'll stay dead. To her, he added forcibly, dashing the hope which leapt in Rumbold. Why have you come here? Here? Tonight? The easy mockery renewed itself in Martlow's voice. People's ideas of fun vary, he stated. The fly's idea ain't the same as the spider's. This ear is my idea, shaking your hand and sitting cozy with the bloke that sent me down more times than I can think. And the fun'll grow furious when you and I walk arm in arm on to that platform, and you tell them all I'm resurrected. Like this? the proper Mr. Fosdyke interjected. Huh? said Tim. Like, like what? You can't go on to the platform in those clothes, Martlow. Have you looked in a mirror lately? Do you know what you look like? This is a respectable occasion, man. Yes, said Tim dryly. It's an occasion for showing respect to me. I'll do as I am, not having had time to go to the tailor's for my dress suit yet. Martlow, said Sir William briskly, time short. I'm due on that platform. Right, I'm with you. Tim moved towards the platform door. Sir William, with a serene air of triumph, played his trump card. He took out his checkbook. No, he said, you're not coming. Instead, he shrank back hastily as a huge fist was projected vehemently towards his face. But the fist swerved and opened. The checkbook, not Sir William's person, was its objective. Instead be damned, said Tim Martlow, pitching the checkbook to the floor, to hell with your money. Thought I was after money, did you? Sir William met his eye. Yes, I did, he said heartily. That's the sort of mean idea you would have, Sir William Rumbold. They say scum rises. You grew a handle to your name during the war, but you ain't grown manners to go with it. War changes them that's changeable. 
t'others are too set to change. Sir William felt a strange glow of appreciation for this man, who, with so easy an opportunity to grow rich, refused money. It's changed you, he said, with ungrudging admiration that had no tincture of diplomacy in it. Has it, mused Tim, from what? Well, Sir William was embarrassed, from what you were. What was I? demanded Tim. Go on, spit it out. What sort of character would you have given me then? I'd have called you, said Sir William boldly, a disreputable drunken loafer who never did an honest day's work in his life. Which had the merit of truth, and, he thought, the demerit of rashness. To his surprise, he found that Tim was looking at him with undisguised admiration. Lummy, he said, you've got guts. Yes, that's right, disreputable drunken loafer. And if I came back now, he asked. You were magnificent in the war, Martlow. First thing I did when I got civvies on was to get blind and skinned. Drink and civvies go together, in my mind. You'll get over that, said Sir William encouragingly, but he was puzzled by the curiously wistful note which had replaced Tim's hectoring. There's a chance, admitted Tim, a bare chance. Not a chance I'd gamble on. Not when I've a bigger chance than that. You wouldn't say, weighing me up now, that I've got a reformed look, would you? Sir William couldn't. But you'll pull yourself together. You'll remember. I'll remember the taste of beer, said Tim, with a fierce conviction. No, I never had a chance before but I've got one now, and by heaven I'm taking it." Sir William's apprehension grew acute. If the money was not the question, what outrageous demand was about to be made of him? Tim went on. I'm nothing but a dirty, drunken tramp today. Yes, drunk when I can get it, and craving when I can't. That's Tim Martlow when he's living. Tim Martlow dead's a different thing. He's a man with his name wrote up in letters of gold in a dry canteen. Dry! By God, that's funny! He's somebody, honored in Calderside for ever and ever. Amen. And we won't spoil a good thing by taking chances on my reformation. I'm dead. I'll stay dead. He paused in enjoying the effect he made. Sir William stooped to pick his checkbook from the floor. "'Don't do that,' said Tim sharply. "'It isn't out of your mind yet that money's what I came for. Fun's one thing that brought me. Just for the treat of showing you myself and watching your quick-change faces while I did it. And I've had my fun.' His voice grew menacing. "'The other thing I came for isn't fun.' It's this. Dolly screamed as he took her arm and jerked her to her feet from the corner where she had sought obscurity. He shook her urgently. You've been telling tales about me. I've heard of it. You hear all the news when you lie quiet yourself and let other people do the talking. You came in here tonight to spin a yarn. I watched you in. Well, is it true? No, said Dolly, gasping for breath. I, I mean, he insisted, what you said about you and me. That isn't true? She repeated her denial. No, he said, releasing her. It'd have a job to be seeing this is the first time I've had the pleasure of meeting you. That'll do. He opened the platform door politely. I hope I haven't made you late on the platform, sir, he said. Both Sir William and the secretary stared fascinated at Dolly, the enterprising young person who had so successfully bluffed them. I repeat, don't let me make you late, said Tim from the now wide-open door. Rumbold checked Fosdyke, who was apparently bent on doing Dolly a personal violence. 
That can wait, he said. What can't wait is this. He held out his hand to Martlow. In all sincerity, I beg the honor. Tim shook his hand, and Rumbold turned to the door. Fosdyke ran after him with the notes of his speech. Your speech, sir? Sir William turned on him angrily. Man, he said, haven't you heard? That muck won't do now. I have to try to do Martlow justice. He went out to the platform, Fosdyke after him. Tim Martlow sat at the table and took a bottle from his pocket. He drew the cork with his teeth, then felt a light touch on his arm. I was forgetting you, he said, replacing the bottle. I ain't likely to forget you, said Dolly ruefully. He gripped her hard. But you are going to forget me, my girl, he said. Tim Martlow's dead, and his letters of gold ain't going to be blotted by the likes of you. You that's been putting it about Calderside, I'm the father of your child, and I ain't never seen you in my life till tonight. Yes, but you're getting this all wrong, she blubbered. I didn't have a baby. I was going to borrow one if they claimed to see it. What? No baby? And you put it across old Rumbold? Laughter and sheer admiration of her audacity were mingled in his voice. With a baby it was a good bluff. Without one, the girl's ingenuity seemed to him to touch genius. He gave me that paper, she said, pride subduing tears as she handed him her splendid trophy. Three pounds a week for life, he read, with profound reverence, if you ain't a blinkin' marvel. He complimented her, giving her the paper back. Then he realized that through him her gains were lost. God, I done wrong. I got no right to mess up a thing like that. I didn't know. See, I'll tell him I made you lie. I'll own the baby's mine. But there ain't no baby, she persisted. There's plenty of babies looking for a mother with three pounds a week, he said. She tore the paper up. Then they'll not find me, she said. Three pounds a week's gone, and your letters of gold, Mr. Martlow, remain. The practiced voice of Sir William Rumbold, speaking on the platform, filled the anteroom, not with the rhetorician's counterfeit of sincerity, but unmistakably with sincerity itself. I had prepared a speech, he was saying. A prepared speech is useless in face of the emotion I feel at the life of Timothy Martlow. I say advisedly to you that when I think of Martlow I know myself for a worm. He was despised and rejected. What had England done for him that he should give his life for her? We wronged him. We made an outcast of him. I personally wronged him from the magistrate's bench, and he pays us back like this, rising from an undeserved obscurity to a height where he rests secure forever, a reproach to us, and a great example of the man who won. And against what odds he played it out to a supreme end, and— You're right said Tim Martlow, motioning the girl to close the door. He wasn't used to hearing panegyrics on himself, nor was he aware that, mechanically, he had raised the bottle to his lips. Dolly meant to close the door discreetly. Instead, she threw it from her and jumped at the bottle. Tim was conscious of a double crash, putting an emphatic stop to the sound of Sir William's eulogy, the crash of the door, and the bottle, which Dolly snatched from him and pitched against the wall. "'Letters of gold,' she panted, "'and you shan't tarnish them. I'll see to that.' He gaped for a moment at the liquor flowing from the bottle, then raised his eyes to hers. "'You?' he said. "'I haven't got a baby to look after,' said Dolly. "'But I've got you.' Where were you thinking of going now?" His eyes went to the door behind which Sir William was, presumably, still praising him, and his head jerked resolutely. "'Playing it out,' he said. 
I've got to vanish good and sure after that. I'll play it out, by God. I was a hero once. I'll be a hero still. His foot crunched broken glass as he moved. I'm going to America, my girl. It's dry. Perhaps she distrusted the absolute dryness of America, and perhaps that had nothing to do with Dolly. She examined her hand minutely. Going to the Isle of Man on a rough day, I wasn't a bit ill, she said casually. I'm a good sailor. You put it across, Sir William, he said. You're a blinkin' marvel. No, she said, but a thing that's worth doin' is worth doin' well. I'm not a marvel, but I might be the metal polish in those gold letters of yours, if you think it worth while. His trampish squalor seemed to him suddenly appalling. There, don't do that, he protested. Her arm had found its way into his. My sleeve's dirty. Idiot, said Dolly Wainwright, drawing him to the door. End of Story 4Story 5 of The Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 5 The Pensioner by William Kane from The Graphic. 1922. Miss Crewe was born in the year 1821. She received a sort of education, and at the age of twenty became the governess of a little girl, eight years old, called Martha Bond. She was Martha's governess for the next ten years. Then Martha came out, and Miss Crewe went to be the governess of somebody else. Martha married Mr. William Harper. A year later she gave birth to a son, who was named Edward. This brings us to the year 1853. When Edward was six, Miss Crewe came back to be his governess. Four years later he went to school, and Miss Crewe went away to be the governess of somebody else. She was now forty-two years old. Twelve years passed, and Mrs. Harper died, recommending Miss Crewe to her husband's care for Miss Crewe had recently been smitten by an incurable disease which made it impossible for her to be a governess any longer. Mr. Harper, who had passionately loved his wife, gave instructions to his solicitor to pay Miss Crewe the sum of one hundred and fifty pounds annually. He had some thoughts of buying her an annuity, but she seemed so ill that he didn't. Edward was now twenty-two. In the year 1888, Mr. Harper died after a very short illness. He had expected Miss Crewe to die any day during the past thirteen years, but since she hadn't, he thought it proper now to recommend her to Edward's care. This is how he did it. That confounded old Crewe, Eddie, you'll have to see to her. Let her have her money as before, but for the Lord's sake don't go and buy her an annuity now. If you do, she'll die on your hands in a week." Shortly afterwards the old gentleman passed away. Edward was now thirty-five. Miss Crewe was sixty-seven, and reported to be in an almost desperate state. Edward followed his father's advice. He bought no annuity for Miss Crewe. Her one hundred and fifty pounds continued to be paid each year into her bank, but by Edward, not by his late father's solicitors. Edward had his own ideas of managing the considerable fortune which he had inherited. These ideas were unsound. The first of them was that he should assume the entire direction of his own affairs. Accordingly, he instructed his solicitors to realize all the mortgages and railway stock and other admirable securities in which his money was invested, and hand over the cash to him. 
he then went in for the highest rate of interest which any one would promise him. The consequence was that, within twelve years, he was almost a poor man, his annual income having dwindled from about three thousand to about four hundred pounds. Though he was a fool, he was an honourable man, and so he continued to pay Miss Crewe her one hundred and fifty pounds each year. This left him about two hundred and fifty for himself. The capital which his so reduced income represented was invested in a Mexican brewery in which he had implicit faith. Nevertheless, he began to think that he might do well were he to try to earn a little extra money. The only thing he could do was to paint, not at all well, in watercolors. He became the pupil, quite seriously, of a young artist whom he knew. He was now forty-seven years old, while Miss Crewe was seventy-nine. The year was nineteen hundred. To everybody's amazement, Edward soon began to make quite good progress in his painting. Yes, his pictures were not at all unpleasant little things. He sent one of them to the Academy. It was accepted. It was, as I live, sold for ten pounds. Edward was an artist. Soon he was making between thirty and forty pounds a year. Then he was making over a hundred, then two hundred. Then the Mexican brewery failed, General Malefico having burned it to the ground for a lark. This happened in the spring of 1914, when Edward was sixty-one and Miss Crewe was ninety-three. Edward, after paying her money to Miss Crewe, might flatter himself on the possibility of having some fifty pounds a year for himself, that is to say, if his picture sales did not decline. A single man can, however, get along, more or less, on fifty pounds, more or less. Then the Great War broke out. It has been said that in the autumn of 1914 the old men came into their kingdom. As the fields of Britain were gradually stripped bare of their valid toilers, the fathers of each village assumed, at good wages, the burden of agriculture. From their offices the juniors departed or were torn. The senior clerks carried on desperately until the girls were introduced. No man was any longer too old at forty. Octogenarians could command a salary. The very cinemas were glad to dress up ancient fellows in uniform and post them on their doorsteps. Edward could do nothing but paint rather agreeable watercolors, and that was all. The market for his kind of work was shut. A patriotic nation was economizing in order to get five per cent on the war loans. People were not giving inexpensive little watercolors away to one another as wedding gifts any longer. Only the painters of high reputation, whose work was regarded as a real investment, could dispose of their wares. Starvation stared Edward in the face, not only his own starvation, you understand, but Miss Crewe's, and Edward was a man of honor. He hated Miss Crewe intensely, but he had undertaken to provide for her, and provide for her he must, even if he failed to provide for himself. He wrapped some samples of his paintings in brown paper, and began to seek for a job among the wholesale stationers. He offered himself as one who was prepared to design Christmas cards and calendars and things of the kind. Adversity had sharpened his wits. Even the wholesale stationers were not turning white-headed men from their portals. To Edward was accorded the privilege of displaying the rather agreeable contents of his parcel. After he had unpacked it and packed it up again some thirty times, he was offered work. His pictures were really rather agreeable. It was piecework, and he was to do it off the premises, no matter where. By toiling day and night he might be able to earn as much as four pounds a week. He went away and toiled. 
His employers were pleased with what, each Monday, he brought them. They did not offer to increase his remuneration, but they encouraged him to produce, and took practically everything he offered. Edward was very fortunate. During the first year of the war, he lived like a beast, worked like a slave, and earned exactly enough to keep his soul in his body and pay Miss Crewe her one hundred and fifty pounds. During the second year of the war, he did it again. The fourth year of the war found him still alive and still punctual to his obligations towards Miss Crewe. Miss Crewe, however, found one hundred and fifty pounds no longer what it had been. Prices were rising in every direction. She wrote to Edward pointing this out and asking him if he couldn't see his way to increasing her allowance. She invoked the memory of his dear mother and father, added something about the happy hours that he and she had spent together in the dear old schoolroom, and signed herself his affectionately. Edward petitioned for an increase of pay. He pointed out to his firm of wholesale stationers that prices were rising in every direction. The firm, who knew when they had a marketable thing cheap, granted his petition. Henceforth Edward was able to earn five pounds a week. He increased Miss Crewe's allowance by fifty pounds, and continued to live more like a beast than ever, for the price of paper and paints was soaring. He worked practically without ceasing, save to sleep, which he could not do, and to eat, which he could not afford. He was now sixty-four, while Miss Crewe was rising ninety-seven. Edward had been ailing for a long time. On Armistice Day he struck work for an hour in order to walk about in the streets and share in the general rejoicing. He caught a severe cold, and the next day, instead of staying between his blankets he had no sheets, he went up to the city with some designs which he had just completed. That night he was feverish, the next night he was delirious, the third night he was dead, and there was an end of him. He had, however, managed before he died, two days before, to send to Miss Crewe a money order for her quarter's allowance of fifty pounds. This had left him with precisely four shillings and tuppence in the post office savings bank. He was, consequently, buried by the parish. Miss Crewe received her money. She was delighted to have it, and at once wrote to Edward her customary letter of grateful and affectionate thanks. She added in a postscript that if he could find it in his generous heart to let her have a still little more next quarter, it would be most acceptable, because every day seemed to make it harder and harder for her to get along. Edward was dead when this letter was delivered. Miss Crewe sent her money order to her bank, asking that it might be placed to her deposit account. This, she reminded the bank, would bring up the amount of her deposit to exactly two thousand pounds. End of Story 5story six of the best british short stories of nineteen twenty two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the best british short stories of nineteen twenty two by various story six broadsheet ballad by a e coppard from the Dial, 1922. At noon the Tyler and the Masons stepped down from the roof of the village church, which they were repairing, and crossed over the road to the tavern to eat their dinner. It had been a nice little morning, but there were clouds massing in the south. Sam, the Tyler, remarked that it looked like thunder. The two men sat in the dim little tap-room eating. Bob the Mason, at the same time, reading from a newspaper, an account of a trial for murder. "'I dunno what thunder looks like,' Bob said. 
but I reckon this chap is going to be hung, though I can't rightly say for why. To my thinking, he didn't do it at all, but murder's a bloody thing, and someone ought to suffer for it. I don't think, spluttered Sam, as he impaled a flat piece of beetroot on the point of a pocket-knife, and prepared to contemplate it with patience until his stuffed mouth was ready to receive it, he ought to be hung. There can be no other end for him, though, with a mob of lawyers like that, and a judge like that, and a jury, too, why, the rope's half round his neck this minute. He'll be in glory within a month. They only have three Sundays, you know, between the sentence and the execution. Well, hark at that rain, then. A shower that began as a playful sprinkle grew to a powerful steady summer downpour. It splashed in the open window, and the dim room grew more dim and cool. Hanging's a dreadful thing, continued Sam. And tis often unjust, I've no doubt, I've no doubt at all. Unjust? I tell you, at majority of trials those who give their evidence mostly knows nothing at all about the matter. Them as knows a lot, they stays at home and don't budge, not likely. No, but why? Why? They has their reasons. I know that. I knows it for truth. Hark at that rain! It's made the room feel cold. They watched the downfall in complete silence for some moments. Hanging's a dreadful thing, Sam at length repeated, with almost a sigh. I can tell you a tale about that, Sam, in a minute, said the other. He began to fill his pipe from Sam's brass box, which was labeled cough lozenges, and smelled of paragoric. Just about ten years ago I was working over in Cotswold country. I remember I'd been into Gloucester one Saturday afternoon, and it rained. I was jogging along home in a carrier's van. I never seen it rain like that afore. No, nor never afterwards, not like that. Brr! It came down! Bashing! And we came to a crossroads where there's a public house called the Wheel of Fortune. Very lonely and unsheltered it is just there. I seed a young woman standing in the porch awaiting us, but the carrier was wet and tired and angry or something and wouldn't stop. No room, he bawled out to her. Full up, can't take you. And he drove on. For the love of God, mate, I says, pull up and take that young creature. She's, she's, can't you see? But I'm all behind as it is, he shouts to me. You knows your gospel, don't you? Time and tide wait for no man. Ah, but damn it all, they always call for a feller, I says. With that, he turned round and we drove back for the girl. She clumb in and sat on my knees. I squat on a tub of vinegar. There was nowhere else, and I was right and all she was going on for a berth. Well, the old van rattled away for six or seven miles. Whenever it stopped, you could hear the rain clattering on the tarpaulin, or sounding outside on the grass, as if it was breathing hard, and the old horse steamed and shivered with it. I had knowed the girl once in a friendly way, a pretty young creature, but now she was white and sorrowful and wouldn't say much. By and by we came to another crossroads near a village, and she got out there. "'Good day, my gal,' I says affable-like, and "'Thank you, sir,' says she, and off she popped in the rain with her umbrella up. A rare pretty girl, quite young. I'd met her before, a girl you could get uncommon fond of, you know, but I didn't meet her afterwards. She was mixed up in a bad business.' It all happened in the next six months while I was working round those parts. Everybody knew of it. This girl's name was Edith, and she had a younger sister, Agnes. Their father was old Harry Mallerton, kept the British Oak at North Caney. He stuttered. Well, this Edith had a love affair with a young chap, William, 
and having a very loving nature she behaved foolish. Then she couldn't bring the chap up to the scratch know-how by herself, and of course she was afraid to tell her mother or father. You know how girls are after being so pesky natural. They fear, oh, they do fear. But soon it couldn't be hidden any longer, as she was living at home with them all, so she wrote a letter to her mother. Dear mother, she wrote, and told her all about her trouble. By all accounts the mother was angry as an old lion, but Harry took it calm-like and sent for young William, who'd not come at first. He lived close by in the village, so they went down at last and fetched him. All right, yes, he said, I'll do what's lawful to be done. There you are, I can't say no fairer, that I can't. No, they said, you can't. So he kissed the girl, and off he went, promising to call in and settle affairs in a day or two. The next day Agnes, which was the younger girl, she also wrote a note to her mother, telling her some more strange news. God above, the mother cried out, can it be true, both of you girls, my own daughters, and by the same man? Oh, what Whatever were you thinking on, both of ye? Whatever can be done now? What? ejaculated Sam. Both on em? Both on em? As true as God's my mercy, both on em. Same chap. Ah, Mrs. Mallerton was afraid to tell her husband at first, for old Harry was the devil born again when he were roused up. So she sent for young William herself who'd not come again, of course, not likely. But they made him come. Oh, yes, when they told the girl's father. Well, may I go to my d -d -d damnation at once, roared old Harry. He stuttered, you know. At once, if that ain't a good one. So he took off his coat, he took up a stick, he walked down street to William and cut him off his legs. Then he beat him till he howled for his mercy, but you couldn't stop old Harry once he were roused up. He was the devil born again. They do say as he beat him for a solid hour. I can't say as to that, but then old Harry picked him up and carried him off to the British Oak on his own back, and threw him down in his own kitchen between his own two girls like a dead dog. They do say that the little one, Agnes, flew at her father like a raging cat until he knocked her senseless with a clout overhead. Rough man he was. Well, a called for it sure, commented Sam. Her did, agreed Bob. But she was the quietest known girl for miles round these parts, very shy and quiet. A shady lane breeds mud, said Sam. What do you say? Oh, ah, mud, yes, but pretty girls both, girls you could get very fond of, skin like apple-bloom, and as like as two pinks they were. They had to decide which of them William was to marry. Of course, ah. I'll marry Agnes, says he. You'll not, says the old man. You'll marry Edie. No, I won't, William says. It's Agnes I love and I'll be married to her, or I won't be married to either of em. All the time Edith sat quiet, dumb as a shovel, never a word, crying a bit, but they do say the young one went on like a young Jew. The Jezebel, commented Sam. You may say it, but wait, my man, just wait. Another cup of beer? We can't go back to church until this humbug and rain have stopped. No, that we can't. It's my belief the bug and rain won't stop this side of four, and if the roof don't hold it off, it'll all spoil the Lord's commandments that's just done up on the chancel front. Oh, but they be dry by now, spoke Bob reassuringly, and then continued his tale. I'll marry Agnes, or I won't marry nobody, William says, and they couldn't budge him. No, old Harry cracked on, but he wouldn't have it, and at last Harry says, It's like this. He pulls a half-crown out of his pocket, and 
'Heads, it's Agnes,' he says, 'or tails, it's Edith,' he says. "'Never! Ah! Ah!' cried Sam. "'Heads, it's Agnes. Tails, it's Edie. So help me God. And it come down Agnes. Yes, heads it was. Agnes. And so there they were. And they lived happily ever after? Happy? You don't know your human nature, Sam. Wherever was you brought up? Heads it's Agnes, said old Harry, and at that Agnes flung her arms around William's neck and was for going off with him then and there. Ha! But this is how it happened about that. William hadn't any kindred. He was a lodger in the village, and his landlady wouldn't have him in her house one mortal hour when she heard all of it. Give him the right about, there and then. He couldn't get lodgings anywhere else. Nobody would have anything to do with him. So, of course, for safety's sake, old Harry had to take him, and they all lived together at the British Oak, all in one happy family. But they girls couldn't abide the sight of each other, so their father cleaned up an old outhouse in his yard that was used for carts and hens and put William and his Agnes out in it, and there they had to bide. They had a couple of chairs, a sofa, and a bed, and that kind of thing, and the young one made it quite snug. Twas a hard thing for that other, that Edie, Bob. It was hard, Sam, in a way, and all this was happening just afore I met her in the carrier's van. She was very sad and solemn then, a pretty girl, one you could like. Ah, uh, you may choke me, but there they lived together. Edie never opened her lips to either of them again, and her father sided with her, too. What was worse, it came out after the marriage that Agnes was quite free of trouble. It was only a trumped-up game between her and this William, because he fancied her better than the other one. And they never had no child, them two, though when poor Edie's mischance come along, I be damned if Agnes weren't fonder of it than his own mother, a jolly sight more fonder, and William, he fair worshipped it. You don't say. I do. Twas a rum go, that, and Agnes worshipped it, a fact. Can prove it by scores of people to this day, scores in them parts. William and Agnes worshipped it, and Edie, she just looked on, long of it all, in the same house with them, though she never opened her lips again to her young sister to the day of her death. Ah, she died. Well, it's the only way out of such a tangle, poor woman. You're sympathizing with the wrong party, Bob filled his pipe again from the brass box. He ignited it with deliberation. Going to the open window, he spat into a puddle in the road. The wrong party, Sam. "'Twas Agnes that died. She was found on the sofa one morning, stone dead. Dead as a adder. "'God bless me,' murmured Sam. "'Poisoned,' added Bob, puffing serenely. "'Poisoned!' Bob repeated the word, poisoned. This was the way of it, he continued. One morning the mother went out in the yard to collect her eggs, and she began calling out, "'Edie! Edie!' Here a minute, come and look where that hen have laid her egg. I would never have believed it, she says. And when Edie went out, her mother led her round the back of the outhouse, and there on the top of a wall this hen had laid an egg. I would never have believed it, Edie, she says. Scooped out a nest there, beautiful, ain't she? I wondered where her was laying. T'other morning the dog brought an egg round in his mouth and laid it on the doormat. There now, Aggie, Aggie, here a minute. Come and look where the hen have laid that egg. And as Aggie didn't answer, the mother went in and found her on the sofa in the outhouse, stone dead. How'd they count for it? asked Sam after a brief interval. That's what brings me to the point about this young feller that's going to be hung said Bob, tapping the newspaper that lay upon the bench. 
I don't know what would lie between two young women in a wrangle of that sort. Some would get over it quick, but some would never sleep soundly any more, not for a minute of their mortal lives. Edie must have been one of that sort. There's people living there now as could tell a lot if they'd a mind to it. Some knowed all about it, could tell you the very shop where Edith managed to get hold of the poison, and could describe to me or to you just how she administered it in a glass of barley water. Old Harry knew all about it. He knew all about everything, but he favored Edith, and he never budged a word. Clever old chap was Harry, and nothing came out against Edie at the inquest, nor the trial, either. Was there a trial, then? There was a kind of a trial, naturally, a beautiful trial. The police came and fetched poor William. They took him away, and in due course he was hanged. William? But what had he got to do with it? Nothing. It was rough on him, but he hadn't played straight, and so nobody struck up for him. They made out a case against him. There was some unlucky bit of evidence which I'll take my oath old Harry knew something about, and William was done for. Ah, when things take a turn against you, it's as certain as twelve o'clock when they take a turn. You get no more chance than a rabbit from a weasel. It's like dropping your matches into a stream. You needn't waste the bending of your back to pick them out. They're no good on. They'll never strike again. And Edith, she sat in court through it all, very white and trembling and sorrowful. But when the judge put his black cap on, they do say she blushed and looked across at William and gave a bit of a smile. Well, she had to suffer for his doings, so why shouldn't he suffer for hers? That's how I look at it. But God Almighty! Yes, God Almighty knows. Pretty girls they were, both, and as like as two pinks. There was quiet for some moments, while the tiler and the mason emptied their cups of beer. I think, said Sam then, the rains give over now. Ah, that it has, cried Bob. Let's go and do a bit more on this buggin' church, or she won't be done afore Christmas. End of Story 6 Story 7 of The Best British Short Stories of 1922 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 7. The Christmas Present by Rick Mall Crompton from Truth, 1922. Mary Clay looked out of the window of the old farmhouse. The view was dreary enough, hill and field and woodland, bare, colorless, mist-covered, with no other house in sight. She had never been a woman to crave for company. She liked sewing, she was passionately fond of reading, she was not fond of talking. Probably she could have been very happy at Crumb Farm, alone. Before her marriage she had looked forward to the long evenings with her sewing and reading. She knew that she would be busy enough in the day, for the farmhouse was old and rambling, and she was to have no help in the housework. But she looked forward to quiet, peaceful, lamp-lit evenings, and only lately, after ten years of married life, had she reluctantly given up the hope of them. For peace was far enough from the old farm kitchen in the evening. It was driven away by John Clay's loud voice, raised always in orders or complaints or in the stumbling incoherent reading aloud of his newspaper mary was a silent woman herself and a lover of silence but john liked to hear the sound of his voice he liked to shout at her to call for her from one room to another above all he liked to hear his voice reading the paper out loud to her in the evening she dreaded that most of all. 
It had lately seemed to jar on her nerves till she felt she must scream aloud. His voice going on and on, raucous and sing-song, became unspeakably irritating. His Mary, summoning her from her household work to wherever he happened to be, his Get my slippers, or Bring me my pipe, exasperated her almost to the point of rebellion. Get your own slippers, had trembled on her lips, but had never passed them, for she was a woman who could not bear anger. Noise of any kind appalled her. She had borne it for ten years, so surely she could go on with it. Yet today, as she gazed hopelessly at the wintry countryside, she became acutely conscious that she could not go on with it. Something must happen. Yet what was there that could happen? It was Christmas next week. She smiled ironically at the thought. Then she noticed the figure of her husband coming up the road. He came in at the gate and round to the side door. Mary! She went slowly in answer to the summons. He held a letter in his hand. Met the postman, he said, from your aunt. She opened the letter and read it in silence. Both of them knew quite well what it contained. She wants us to go over for Christmas again, said Mary. He began to grumble. She's as deaf as a post. She's most as deaf as her mother was. She ought to know better than to ask folks over when she can't hear a word anyone says. Mary said nothing. He always grumbled about the invitation at first, but really he wanted to go. He liked to talk with her uncle. He liked the change of going down to the village for a few days and hearing all its gossip. He could quite well leave the farm to the hands for that time. The crude deafness was proverbial. Mary's great-grandmother had gone stone deaf at the age of thirty-five. Her daughter had inherited the affliction, and her granddaughter, the aunt with whom Mary had spent her childhood, had inherited it also at exactly the same age. All right, he said at last, grudgingly, as though in answer to her silence, we'd better go. Write and say we'll go. It was Christmas Eve. They were in the kitchen of her uncle's farmhouse. The deaf old woman sat in her chair by the fire knitting. Upon her sunken face there was a curious sardonic smile that was her habitual expression. The two men stood in the doorway. Mary sat at the table looking aimlessly out of the window. Outside the snow fell in blinding showers. Inside the fire gleamed on to the copper pots and pans, the crockery on the old oak dresser, the hams hanging from the ceiling. Suddenly James turned. Jane! he said. The deaf woman never stirred. Jane! Still there was no response upon the enigmatic old face by the fireside. Jane! she turned slightly towards the voice. Get them photos from upstairs to show John, he bawled. What about boats? she said. Photos! roared her husband. Coats! she quavered. Mary looked from one to the other. The man made a gesture of irritation and went from the room. He came back with the pile of picture postcards in his hand. It's quicker to do a thing oneself, he grumbled. They're what my brother sent from Switzerland, where he's working now. It's a fine land, to judge from the views of it. John took them from his hand. She gets worse, he said, nodding toward the old woman. She was sitting gazing at the fire, her lips curved into the curious smile. Her husband shrugged his shoulders. Aye, she's nigh as bad as her mother was. And her grandmother. Aye, it takes longer to tell her to do something than to do it myself. And deaf folks get a bit stupid, too. Can't see what you mean. They're best let alone." The other man nodded and lit his pipe. Then James opened the door. "'The snow stopped,' he said. Shall we go to the end of the village and back?' The other nodded and took his cap from behind the door. 
A gust of cold air filled the room as they went out. Mary took a paper backed book from the table and came over to the fireplace. "Mary!" She started. It was not the sharp, querulous voice of the deaf old woman. It was more like the voice of the young aunt whom Mary remembered in childhood. The old woman was leaning forward, looking at her intently. "'Mary! A happy Christmas to 'ee!' And, as if in spite of herself, Mary answered in her ordinary low tones, "'The same to you, Auntie.' "'Thank ye, thank ye.' Mary gasped. "'Aunt! Can you hear me speaking like this?' The old woman laughed silently, rocked to and fro in her chair, as if with pent-up merriment of years. "'Oh, yes, I can hear ye, child. I've always heard ye.' Mary clasped her hand eagerly. "'Then you're cured, aunt.' "'Ay, I'm cured as far as there was ever anything to be cured. You—' "'I was never deaf, child, nor never will be, please God. I've took you all in fine.' Mary stood up in bewilderment. "'You never deaf?' The old woman chuckled again. "'No, nor my mother, nor her mother neither.' Mary shrank back from her. I, I, "'I don't know what you mean,' she said unsteadily. "'Have you been pretending?' "'I'll make you a Christmas present of it, dearie,' said the old woman. My mother made me a Christmas present of it when I was your age, and her mother made her one. I haven't a lass of my own to give it to, so I give it to you. It can come on quite sudden-like, if you want it, and then you can hear what you choose, and not hear what you choose. Do you see?" She leant nearer, and whispered, "'You're shut out of it all, of having to fetch and carry for em, answer their daft questions, and run their errands like a dog? I've watched you, my lass. You don't get much peace, do you?" Mary was trembling. "'Oh, I don't know what to think,' she said. "'I couldn't do it.' "'Do what you like,' said the old woman. "'Take it as a present, anyways. The crew deafness for a Christmas present,' she chuckled. "'Use it or not, as you like. You'll find it main amusin' anyways.' And into the old face there came again that curious smile, as if she carried in her heart some jest fit for the gods on Olympus. The door opened suddenly with another gust of cold air, and the two men came in again, covered with fine snow. "'I'll... I'll not do it,' whispered Mary, trembling. "'We didn't get far. It's coming on again,' remarked John, hanging up his cap. The old woman rose and began to lay the supper, silently and deftly, moving from cupboard to table without looking up. Mary sat by the fire, motionless and speechless, her eyes fixed on the glowing coals. "'Any signs of the deafness in her?' whispered James, looking towards Mary. "'It come on my wife just when she was that age.' "'Aye, so I've heard.' Then he said loudly, "'Mary!' A faint pink color came into her cheeks, but she did not show by look or movement that she had heard. James looked significantly at her husband. The old woman stood still for a minute with a cup in each hand and smiled her slow, subtle smile. End of Story 7 Story 8 of The Best British Short Stories of 1922 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 8 Seaton's Aunt by Walter de la Mare from The London Mercury, 1922. Part 1. I had heard rumors of Seaton's aunt long before I actually encountered her. Seaton, in the hush of confidence, or at any little show of toleration on our part, would remark 
my aunt, or my old aunt, you know, as if his relative might be a kind of cement to an entente cordiale. He had an unusual quantity of pocket money, or at any rate it was bestowed on him in unusually large amounts, and he spent it freely, though none of us would have described him as an awfully generous chap. "'Hello, Seaton,' he would say, "'the old Begum." At the beginning of term, too, he used to bring back surprising and exotic dainties in a box with a trick padlock that accompanied him from his first appearance at Gummidge's in a billycock hat to the rather abrupt conclusion of his school days. From a boy's point of view, he looked distastefully foreign, with his yellow skin and slow chocolate-colored eyes and lean, weak figure. Merely for his looks, he was treated by most of us true blue Englishmen with condescension, hostility, or contempt. We used to call him Pongo, but without any better excuse for the nickname than his skin. He was, that is, in one sense of the term what he assuredly was not in the other sense, a sport. Seaton and I were never in any sense intimate at school. Our orbits only intersected in class. I kept instinctively aloof from him. I felt vaguely he was a sneak, and remained quite unmollified by advances on his side, which in a boy's barbarous fashion, unless it suited me to be magnanimous, I haughtily ignored. We were, both of us, quick-footed, and at prisoner's base used occasionally to hide together. And so I best remember Seaton, his narrow watchful face in the dusk of summer evening, his peculiar crouch, and his inarticulate whisperings and mumblings. Otherwise he played all games slackly and limply, used to stand and feed at his locker with a crony or two until his tuck gave out, or waste his money on some outlandish fancy or other. He bought, for instance, a silver bangle which he wore above his left elbow, until some of the fellows showed their masterly contempt of the practice by dropping it, nearly red-hot, down his neck. It needed, therefore, a rather peculiar taste, a rather rare kind of schoolboy courage and indifference to criticism, to be much associated with him. And I had neither the taste nor the courage. Nonetheless, he did make advances, and on one memorable occasion went to the length of bestowing on me a whole pot of some outlandish mulberry-colored jelly that had been duplicated in his term supplies. In the exuberance of my gratitude, I promised to spend the next half-term holiday with him at his aunt's house. I had clean forgotten my promise when, two or three days before the holidays, he came up and triumphantly reminded me of it. "'Well, to tell you the honest truth, Seaton, old chap,' I began graciously, but he cut me short. "'My aunt expects you,' he said. "'She is very glad you are coming. She's sure to be quite decent to you, Withers.' I looked at him in some astonishment. The emphasis was unexpected. It seemed to suggest an aunt not hitherto hinted at, and a friendly feeling on Seaton's side that was more disconcerting than welcome. We reached his home partly by train, partly by a lift in an empty farm cart, and partly by walking. It was a whole day holiday, and we were to sleep the night. He lent me extraordinary night gear, I remember. The village street was unusually wide, and was fed from a green by two converging roads, with an inn and a high green sign at the corner. About a hundred yards down the street was a chemist's shop. Mr. Tanner's. We descended the two steps into his dusky and odorous interior to buy, I remember, some rat poison. A little beyond the chemist's was the forge. You then walked along a very narrow path under a fairly high wall, nodding here and there with weeds and tufts of grass, and so came to the iron garden gates and saw the high flat house behind its huge sycamore. A coach-house stood on the left of the house, and on the right a gate led into a kind of rambling orchard. The lawn lay away over to the left again, and at the bottom, 
for the whole garden sloped gently to a sluggish and rushy, pond-like stream, was a meadow. We arrived at noon, and entered the gates out of the hot dust beneath the glitter of the dark-curtained windows. Seaton led me at once through the little garden gate to show me his tadpole pond, swarming with what, being myself not the least bit of a naturalist, I considered the most horrible creatures, of all shapes, consistencies, and sizes, but with whom Seaton seemed to be on the most intimate of terms. I can see his absorbed face now as he sat on his heels and fished the slimy things out in his sallow palms. Wearying at last of his pets, we loitered about a while in an aimless fashion. Seaton seemed to be listening, or at any rate waiting, for something to happen, or for some one to come. But nothing did happen, and no one came. That was just like Seaton. Anyhow, the first view I got of his aunt was when, at the summons of a distant gong, we turned from the garden, very hungry and thirsty, to go into luncheon. We were approaching the house when Seaton suddenly came to a standstill. Indeed, I have always had the impression that he plucked at my sleeve. Something, at least, seemed to catch me back, as it were, as he cried, Look out! There she is! She was standing in an upper window, which opened wide on a hinge, and at first sight she looked an excessively tall and overwhelming figure. This, however, was mainly because the window reached all but to the floor of her bedroom. She was, in reality, rather an undersized woman, in spite of her long face and big head. She must have stood, I think, unusually still, with eyes fixed on us, though this impression may be due to Seaton's sudden warning and to my consciousness of the cautious and subdued air that had fallen on him at sight of her. I know that without the least reason in the world I felt a kind of guiltiness, as if I had been caught. There was a silvery star pattern sprinkled on her black silk dress, and even from the ground I could see the immense coils of her hair and the rings on her left hand, which was held fingering the small jet buttons of her bodice. She watched our united advance without stirring, until, imperceptibly, her eyes raised and lost themselves in the distance, so that it was out of an assumed reverie that she appeared suddenly to awaken to our presence beneath her, when we drew close to the house. "'So this is your friend, Mr. Smithers, I suppose,' she said, bobbing to me. "'Withers, aunt,' said Seaton. "'It's much the same,' she said, with her eyes fixed on me. "'Come in, Mr. Withers, and bring him along with you.' She continued to gaze at me, at least I think she did so. I know that the fixity of her scrutiny and her ironical mister made me feel peculiarly uncomfortable. But she was extremely kind and attentive to me, though perhaps her kindness and attention showed up more vividly against her complete neglect of Seaton. Only one remark that I have any recollection of she made to him. When I look at my nephew, Mr. Smithers, I realize that dust we are, and dust shall become. You are hot, dirty, and incorrigible, Arthur. She sat at the head of the table, Seaton at the foot, and I, before a wide waste of damask tablecloth, between them. It was an old and rather close dining room with windows thrown wide to the green garden and a wonderful cascade of fading roses. Miss Seaton's great chair faced this window, so that its rose-reflected light shone full on her yellowish face, and on just such chocolate eyes as my schoolfellows, except that hers were more than half covered by unusually long and heavy lids. There she sat, eating, with those sluggish eyes fixed for the most part on my face. Above them stood the deep-lined fork between her eyebrows, and above that the wide expanse of a remarkable brow beneath its strange steep bank of hair. The lunch was copious, and consisted, I remember, 
of all such dishes as are generally considered mischievous and too good for the schoolboy digestion, lobster mayonnaise, cold game sausages, an immense veal and ham pie, farced with eggs and numerous delicious flavors, besides sauces, kickshaws, creams, and sweetmeats. We even had wine, a half glass of old darkish sherry each. Miss Seaton enjoyed and indulged an enormous appetite. Her example, and a natural schoolboy veracity, soon overcame my nervousness of her, even to the extent of allowing me to enjoy to the best of my bent so rare a spread. Seaton was singularly modest. The greater part of his meal consisted of almonds and raisins, which he nibbled surreptitiously, and as if he found difficulty in swallowing them. I don't mean that Miss Seaton conversed with me. She merely scattered trenchant remarks, and now and then twinkled a baited question over my head. But her face was like a dense and involved accompaniment to her talk. She presently dropped the Mr. to my intense relief, and called me now Withers, or Wither, now Smithers, and even once towards the close of the meal distinctly Johnson, though how on earth my name suggested it, or whose face mine had reanimated in memory, I cannot conceive. And is Arthur a good boy at school, Mr. Wither? was one of her many questions. Does he please his masters? Is he first in his class? What does the Reverend Dr. Gummidge think of him, eh? Huh? I knew she was jeering at him, but her face was adamant against the least flicker of sarcasm or facetiousness. I gazed fixedly at a blushing crescent of lobster. I think you're eighth, aren't you, Seaton? Seaton moved his small pupils towards his aunt but she continued to gaze with a kind of concentrated detachment at me. "'Arthur will never make a brilliant scholar, I fear,' she said, lifting a dexterously burdened fork to her wide mouth. After luncheon she preceded me up to my bedroom. It was a jolly little bedroom, with a brass fender and rugs and a polished floor, on which it was possible, I afterwards found, to play snowshoes. Over the washstand was a little black-framed water-colour drawing, depicting a large eye with an extremely fish-like intensity in the spark of light on the dark pupil, and in illuminated lettering beneath was printed very minutely, Thou God seest me, followed by a long-looped monogram, S. S. in the corner. The other pictures were all of the sea, brigs on blue water, a schooner overtopping chalk cliffs, a rocky island of prodigious steepness, with two tiny sailors dragging a monstrous boat up a shelf of beach. This is the room, Withers, my brother William died in when a boy. Admire the view. I looked out of the window across the treetops. It was a day hot with sunshine over the green fields and the cattle were standing swishing their tails in the shallow water. But the view at the moment was only exaggeratedly vivid, because I was horribly dreading that she would presently inquire after my luggage, and I had not brought even a toothbrush. I need have had no fear. Hers was not that highly civilized type of mind that is stuffed with sharp material details nor could her ample presence be described as in the least motherly. "'I would never consent to question a schoolfellow behind my nephew's back,' she said, standing in the middle of the room. "'But tell me, Smithers, why is Arthur so unpopular? You, I understand, are his only close friend.' She stood in a dazzle of sun, and out of it her eyes regarded me, with such leaden penetration beneath their thick lids, that I doubt if my face concealed the least thought from her. But there, there, she added very suavely, stooping her head a little, don't trouble to answer me. I never extort an answer. Boys are queer fish. 
Brains might perhaps have suggested his washing his hands before luncheon, but not my choice, Smithers. God forbid. And now perhaps you would like to go into the garden again. I cannot actually see from here, but I should not be surprised if Arthur is now skulking behind that hedge. He was. I saw his head come out and take a rapid glance at the windows. Join him, Mr. Smithers. We shall meet again, I hope, at the tea-table. The afternoon I spend in retirement. Whether or not Seaton and I had not been long engaged with the aid of two green switches in riding round and round a lumbering old grey horse we found in the meadow, before a rather bunched-up figure appeared, walking along the field-path on the other side of the water, with a magenta parasol studiously lowered in our direction throughout her slow progress, as if that were the magnetic needle and we the fixed pole. Seaton at once lost all nerve in his riding. At the next lurch of the old mare's heels he toppled over into the grass, and I slid off the sleek broad back to join him, where he stood, rubbing his shoulder, and sourly watching the rather pompous figure till it was out of sight. "'Was that your aunt, Seaton?' I inquired. But not till then. He nodded. "'Why didn't she take any notice of us, then?' she never does why not oh she knows all right without that's the damn awful part of it seaton was about the only fellow in gummidge's who ever had the ostentation to use bad language he had suffered for it too but it wasn't i think bravado i believe he really felt certain things more intensely than most of the other fellows and they were generally things that fortunate and average people do not feel at all the peculiar quality for instance of the british schoolboy's imagination i tell you withers he went on moodily slinking across the meadow with his hands covered up in his pockets she sees everything and what she doesn't see she knows without but how i said not because i was much interested but because the afternoon was so hot and tiresome and purposeless and it seemed more of a bore to remain silent. Seaton turned gloomily, and spoke in a very low voice. "'Don't appear to be talking of her, if you wouldn't mind. It's because she's in league with the devil.' He nodded his head, and stooped to pick up a round flat pebble. "'I tell you,' he said, still stooping, "'you fellows don't realize what it is. I know I'm a bit close and all that.' but so would you be if you had that old hag listening to every thought you think. I looked at him, then turned and surveyed one by one the windows of the house. "'Where's your pater?' I said awkwardly. "'Dead, ages and ages ago, and my mother, too. She's not my aunt by rights.' "'What is she, then?' "'I mean, she's not my mother's sister, because my grandmother married twice, and she's one of the first lot. I don't know what you call her, but anyhow she's not my real aunt. She gives you plenty of pocket money." Seaton looked steadfastly at me out of his flat eyes. She can't give me what's mine. When I come of age, half of the whole lot will be mine. And what's more, he turned his back on the house, I'll make her hand over every blessed shilling of it." I put my hands in my pockets and stared at Seaton. "'Is it much?' He nodded. "'Who told you?' He got suddenly very angry. A darkish red came into his cheeks, his eyes glistened, but he made no answer, and we loitered listlessly about the garden until it was time for tea. Seaton's aunt was wearing an extraordinary kind of lace jacket when we sidled sheepishly into the drawing-room together. She greeted me with a heavy and protracted smile, and bade me bring a chair close to the little table. "'I hope Arthur has made you feel at home,' she said, as she handed me my cup in her crooked hand. "'He don't talk much to me, but then I'm an old woman. 
You must come again, Wither, and draw him out of his shell. You old snail!" She wagged her head at Seaton, who sat munching cake and watching her intently. "And we must correspond, perhaps." She nearly shut her eyes at me. "You must write and tell me everything behind the creature's back." I confess I found her rather disquieting company. The evening drew on. Lamps were brought by a man with a nondescript face and very quiet footsteps. Seaton was told to bring out the chessmen, and we played a game, she and I, with her big chin thrust over the board at every move as she gloated over the pieces and occasionally croaked, Check! after which she would sit back inscrutably staring at me. But the game was never finished. She simply hemmed me defencelessly in with a cloud of men that held me impotent, and yet one and all refused to administer to my poor flustered old king a merciful coup de grace. There, she said as the clock struck ten, a drawn game, Withers. We are very evenly matched. A very credible defense, Withers. You know your room. There's supper on a tray in the dining-room. Don't let the creature overeat himself. The gong will sound three-quarters of an hour before a punctual breakfast. She held out her cheek to Seaton, and he kissed it with obvious perfunctoriness. With me she shook hands. An excellent game, she said cordially. But my memory is poor, and— She swept the pieces helter-skelter into the box. The result will never be known. She raised her great head far back. Huh? It was a kind of challenge, and I could only murmur, Oh, I was absolutely in a hole, you know, when she burst out laughing and waved us both out of the room. Seaton and I stood and ate our supper, with one candlestick to light us, in a corner of the dining-room. Well, and how would you like it? he said very softly, after cautiously poking his head round the doorway. Like what? being spied on, every blessed thing you do and think. Well, I shouldn't like it at all, I said, if she does. And yet you let her smash you up at chess. I didn't let her, I said indignantly. Well, you funked it then. And I didn't funk it either, I said. She's so jolly clever with her knights. Seaton stared fixedly at the candle. You wait, that's all, he said slowly, and we went upstairs to bed. I had not been long in bed, I think, when I was cautiously awakened by a touch on my shoulder, and there was Seaton's face in the candlelight and his eyes looking into mine. What's up? I said, rising quickly to my elbow. Don't scurry, he whispered, or she'll hear. I'm sorry for waking you but I didn't think you'd be asleep so soon. Why? What's the time, then? Seaton wore what was then rather unusual a night suit, and he hauled his big silver watch out of the pocket in his jacket. It's a quarter to twelve. I never get to sleep before twelve, not here. What do you do, then? Oh, I read. And listen. Listen? Seaton stared into his candle-flame, as if he were listening even then. You can't guess what it is. All you read in ghost stories, that's all rot. You can't see much, Withers, but you know all the same. Know what? Why, that they're there. Who's there? I asked, fretfully glancing at the door. Why, in the house. It swarms with them. Just you stand still and listen outside my bedroom door in the middle of the night. I have, dozens of times. They're all over the place. Look here, Seaton, I said. You asked me to come here, and I didn't mind chucking up a leave just to oblige you, and because I promised. But don't get talking a lot of rot, that's all, or you'll know the difference when we get back. Don't fret he said coldly, turning away. I shan't be at school long, and what's more, you're here now, and there isn't anybody else to talk to. 
I'll chance the other." "Look here, Seaton," I said, "you may think you're going to scare me with a lot of stuff about voices and all that, but I'll just thank you to clear out, and you may please yourself about pottering about all night." He made no answer. He was standing by the dressing table, looking across his candle into the looking glass. He turned and stared slowly round the walls. Even this room's nothing more than a coffin. I suppose she told you. It's all exactly the same as when my brother William died. Trust her for that. And good luck to him, say I. Look at that. He raised his candle close to the little watercolor I have mentioned. There's hundreds of eyes like that in the house. And even if God does see you, he takes precious good care you don't see him and it's just the same with them. I tell you what, Withers, I'm getting sick of all this. I shan't stand it much longer." The house was silent within and without, and even in the yellowish radiance of the candle a faint silver showed through the open window on my blind. I slipped off the bedclothes, wide awake, and sat irresolute on the bedside. I know you're only guying me, I said angrily, but why is the house full of what you say? Why do you hear what, what do you hear? Tell me that, you silly foal. Seaton sat down on a chair and rested his candlestick on his knee. He blinked at me calmly. She brings them, he said with lifted eyebrows. Who? Your aunt? He nodded. How? I told you, he answered pettishly. She's in league. You don't know. She's as good as killed my mother. I know that. But it's not only her by a long chalk. She just sucks you dry. I know. And that's what she'll do for me. Because I'm like her. Like my mother, I mean. She simply hates to see me alive. I wouldn't be like that old she-wolf for a million pounds. And so, he broke off with a comprehensive wave of his candlestick, they're always here. Ah, my boy, wait till she's dead. She'll hear something then, I can tell you. It's all very well now, but wait till then. I wouldn't be in her shoes when she has to clear out for something. Don't you go and believe I care for ghosts, or whatever you like to call them. We're all in the same box. We're all under her thumb." He was looking almost nonchalantly at the ceiling at the moment when I saw his face change, saw his eyes suddenly drop like shot birds, and fix themselves on the cranny of the door he had just left ajar. Even from where I sat I could see his color change. He went greenish. He crouched without stirring, simply fixed, and I, scarcely daring to breathe, sat with creeping skin, simply watching him. His hands relaxed, and he gave a kind of sigh. "'Was that one?' I whispered, with a timid show of jauntiness. He looked round, opened his mouth, and nodded. "'What?' I said. He jerked his thumb with meaningful eyes, and I knew that he meant that his aunt had been there listening at our door cranny. "'Look here, Seaton,' I said once more, wiggling to my feet. "'You may think I'm a jolly noodle, just as you please, but your aunt has been civil to me and all that, and I don't believe a word you say about her, that's all, and never did. Every fellow's a bit off his pluck at night and you may think it a fine sport to try your rubbish on me. I heard your aunt come upstairs before I fell asleep, and I'll bet you a level tanner she's in bed now. What's more, you can keep your blessed ghosts to yourself. It's a guilty conscience, I should think." Seaton looked at me curiously, without answering for a moment. I'm not a liar, Withers, but I'm not going to quarrel, either. You're the only chap I care a button for, or, at any rate, you're the only chap that's ever come here, and it's something to tell a fellow what you feel. I don't care a fig for fifty thousand ghosts, 
although I swear on my solemn oath that I know they're here. But she," he turned deliberately, "you laid a tanner she's in bed, Withers. Well, I know different. She's never in bed much of the night, and I'll prove it, too, just to show you I'm not such a nolly as you think I am. Come on. Come on where? Why, to see. I hesitated. He opened a large cupboard and took out a small dark dressing gown and a kind of shawl jacket. He threw the jacket on the bed and put on the gown. His dusky face was colorless, and I could see by the way he fumbled at the sleeves he was shivering. But it was no good showing the white feather now. So I threw the tasseled shawl over my shoulders, and leaving our candle brightly burning on the chair, we went out together and stood in the corridor. Now then, listen, Seaton whispered. We stood leaning over the staircase. It was like leaning over a well, so still and chill the air was all around us. But presently, as I suppose happens in most old houses, began to echo and answer in my ears a medley of infinite small stirrings and whisperings. Now, out of the distance, an old timber would relax its fibres, or a scurry die away behind the perishing wainscot. But amid and behind such sounds as these, I seemed to begin to be conscious, as it were, of the lightest of footfalls, sounds as faint as the vanishing remembrance of voices in a dream. Seaton was all in obscurity except his face. Out of that his eyes gleamed darkly, watching me. "'You'd hear, too, in time, my fine soldier,' he muttered. "'Come on!' He descended the stairs, slipping his lean fingers lightly along the balusters. He turned to the right at the loop, and I followed him barefooted along a thickly carpeted corridor. At the end stood a door ajar and from here we very stealthily and in complete blackness ascended five narrow stairs. Seaton, with immense caution, slowly pushed open a door, and we stood together looking into a great pool of duskiness, out of which, lit by the feeble clearness of a night-light, rose a vast bed. A heap of clothes lay on the floor. Beside them two slippers dozed, with noses each to each, two yards apart. Somewhere a little clock ticked huskily. There was a rather close smell of lavender and eau de cologne, mingled with the fragrance of ancient sachets, soap, and drugs. Yet it was a scent even more peculiarly commingled than that. And the bed! I stared warily in. It was mounded gigantically and it was empty. Seaton turned a vague pale face, all shadows. "'What did I say?' he muttered. "'Who's who's the fool now?' I say. "'How are we going to get back without meeting her?' I say. "'Answer me that. Oh, I wish to goodness you hadn't come here, Withers.' He stood visibly shivering in his skimpy gown, and could hardly speak for his teeth chattering and very distinctly, in the hush that followed his whisper, I heard approaching a faint, unhurried, voluminous rustle. Seaton clutched my arm, dragged me to the right across the room to a large cupboard, and drew the door close to on us. And presently, as with bursting lungs, I peeped out into the long, low, curtained bedroom, waddled in that wonderful great head and body. I can see her now, all patched and lined with shadow, her tied-up hair she must have had enormous quantities of it for so old a woman, her heavy lids above those flat, slow, vigilant eyes. She just passed across my kin in the vague dusk, but the bed was out of sight. We waited on and on, listening to the clock's muffled ticking not the ghost of a sound rose up from the great bed. Either she lay archly listening, or slept a sleep serener than an infant's. 
and when, it seemed, we had been hours in hiding and were cramped, chilled, and half suffocated, we crept out on all fours, with terror knocking at our ribs, and so down the five narrow stairs and back to the little candlelit blue and gold bedroom. Once there, Seaton gave in. He sat livid on a chair with closed eyes. Here, I said, shaking his arm, I'm going to bed. I've had enough of this foolery. I'm going to bed. His lids quivered, but he made no answer. I poured out some water into my basin, and, with that cold, pictured azure eye fixed on us, bespattered Seaton's sallow face and forehead, and dabbled his hair. He presently sighed and opened fish-like eyes. "'Come on,' I said. "'Don't get shamming. There's a good chap. Get on my back, if you like, and I'll carry you into your bedroom.' He waved me away and stood up. So, with my candle in one hand, I took him under the arm and walked him along according to his direction down the corridor. His was a much dingier room than mine, and littered with boxes, paper, cages, and clothes. I huddled him into bed and turned to go. And suddenly, I can hardly explain it now, a kind of cold and deadly terror swept over me. I almost ran out of the room, with eyes fixed rigidly in front of me, blew out my candle, and buried my head under the bedclothes. When I awoke, roused by a long-continued tapping at my door, sunlight was raying in on cornice and bedpost, and birds were singing in the garden. I got up, ashamed of the night's folly, dressed quickly, and went downstairs. The breakfast-room was sweet with flowers and fruit and honey. Seaton's aunt was standing in the garden beside the open French window, feeding a great flutter of birds. I watched her for a moment, unseen. Her face was set in a deep reverie beneath the shadow of a big loose sun-hat. It was deeply lined, crooked, and in a way I can't describe fixedly vacant and strange. I coughed, and she turned at once with a prodigious smile to inquire how I had slept. And in that mysterious way by which we learn each other's secret thoughts without a sentence spoken, I knew that she had followed every word and movement of the night before, and was triumphing over my affected innocence and ridiculing my friendly and too easy advances. We returned to school, Seaton and I, lavishly laden, and by rail all the way. I made no reference to the obscure talk we had had, and resolutely refused to meet his eyes, or to take up the hints he let fall. I was relieved, and yet I was sorry, to be going back and strode on as fast as I could from the station, with Seaton almost trotting at my heels. But he insisted on buying more fruit and sweets, my share of which I accepted with a very bad grace. It was uncomfortably like a bribe, and, after all, I had no quarrel with his rum old aunt, and hadn't really believed half the stuff he had told me. I saw as little of him as I could after that. He never referred to our visit or resumed his confidences, though in class I would sometimes catch his eye fixed on mine, full of a mute understanding, which I easily affected not to understand. He left Gummidge's, as I have said, rather abruptly, though I never heard of anything to his discredit and I did not see him or have any news of him again till by chance we met one summer's afternoon in the Strand. He was dressed rather oddly in a coat too large for him and a bright silky tie, but we instantly recognized one another under the awning of a cheap jeweler's shop. He immediately attached himself to me and dragged me off, not too cheerfully, to lunch with him at an Italian restaurant nearby. 
He chattered about our old school, which he remembered only with dislike and disgust; told me cold bloodedly of the disastrous fate of one or two of the old fellows who had been among his chief tormentors; insisted on an expensive wine, and the whole gamut of the "rich" menu; and finally informed me, with a good deal of niggling, that he had come up to town to buy an engagement ring. And, of course, "How is your aunt?" I inquired at last. He seemed to have been awaiting the question. It fell like a stone into a deep pool, so many expressions flitted across his long, un-English face. She's aged a good deal, he said softly, and broke off. She's been very decent, he continued presently after, and paused again in a way. He eyed me fleetingly. I dare say you heard that she, that is, that we, had lost a good deal of money. No, I said. Oh, yes, said Seaton, and paused again. And somehow, poor fellow, I knew in the clink and clatter of glass and voices that he had lied to me, that he did not possess, and never had possessed, a penny beyond what his aunt had squandered on his too ample allowance of pocket-money. "'And uh, the ghosts?' I inquired quizzically. He grew instantly solemn, and, though it may have been my fancy, slightly yellowed. "'But you are making game of me, Withers,' was all he said. He asked for my address, and I rather reluctantly gave him my card. Look here, Withers, he said, as we stood in the sunlight on the thronging curb, saying good-bye. Here I am, and it's all very well. I'm not perhaps as fanciful as I was. But you are practically the only friend I have on earth, except Alice. And there, to make a clean breast of it, I'm not sure that my aunt cares much about my getting married. She doesn't say so, of course. You know her well enough for that. He looked sidelong at the rattling, gaudy traffic. "'What I was going to say is this. Would you mind coming down? You needn't stay the night unless you please, though, of course, you know you would be awfully welcome. But I should like you to meet my—to meet Alice. And then perhaps you might tell me your honest opinion of—of of the other, too.' I vaguely demurred. He pressed me and we parted with a half-promise that I would come. He waved his ball-topped cane at me, and ran off in his long jacket after a bus. A letter arrived soon after, in his small, weak handwriting, giving me full particulars regarding route and trains. And without the least curiosity, even, perhaps, with some little annoyance that chance should have thrown us together again, I accepted his invitation and arrived one hazy midday at his out-of-the-way station to find him sitting on a low seat under a clump of double hollyhocks awaiting me. His face looked absent and singularly listless, but he seemed, none the less, pleased to see me. We walked up the village street, past the little dingy apothecaries and the empty forge, and, as on my first visit, skirted the house altogether, and, instead of entering by the front door, made our way down the green path into the garden at the back. A pale haze of cloud muffled the sun. The garden lay in a grey shimmer, its old trees, its snapdragoned, faintly glistering walls. But there seemed now an air of neglect, where before, all had been neat and methodical. There was a patch of shallowly dug soil, and a worn-down spade leaning against a tree. There was an old broken wheelbarrow. The goddess of neglect was there. "'You ain't much of a gardener, Seaton,' I said, with a sigh of ease. "'I think, do you know, I like it best like this,' said Seaton. "'We haven't any gardener now, of course can't afford it. He stood staring at his little dark square of freshly turned earth, 
and it always seems to me, he went on ruminatingly, that after all we are nothing better than interlopers on the earth, disfiguring and staining wherever we go. I know it's shocking blasphemy to say so, but then it's different here, you see. We are farther away. To tell you the truth, Seaton, I don't quite see, I said, but it isn't a new philosophy, is it? Anyhow, it's a precious beastly one. It's only what I think, he replied, with all his odd, old, stubborn meekness. We wandered on together, talking little, and still with that expression of uneasy vigilance on Seaton's face. He pulled out his watch as we stood gazing idly over the green meadow and the dark, motionless bulrushes. I think, perhaps, it's nearly time for lunch, he said. Would you like to come in? We turned and walked slowly towards the house, across whose windows I confess my own eyes, too, went restlessly wandering in search of its rather disconcerting inmate. There was a pathetic look of draggledness, of want of means and care, rust and overgrowth and faded paint. Seaton's aunt, a little to my relief, did not share our meal. Seaton carved the cold meat and dispatched a heaped-up plate by the elderly servant for his aunt's private consumption. We talked little and in half-suppressed tones, and sipped a bottle of Madeira which Seaton had rather heedfully fetched out of the great mahogany sideboard. I played him a dull and effortless game of chess, yawning between the moves he generally made almost at haphazard, and with attention elsewhere engaged. About five o'clock came the sound of a distant ring, and Seaton jumped up, overturning the board, and so ending a game that else might have fatuously continued to this day. He effusively excused himself, and after some little while returned with a slim, dark, rather sallow girl of about nineteen, in a white gown and hat, to whom I was presented with some little nervousness as his dear old friend and schoolfellow. We talked on in the pale afternoon light, still, as it seemed to me, and even in spite of real effort to be clear and gay, in a half-suppressed, lacklustre fashion. We all seemed, if it were not my fancy, to be expectant, to be rather anxiously awaiting an arrival, the appearance of some one who all but filled our collective consciousness. Seaton talked least of all and in a restless, interjectory way, as he continually fidgeted from chair to chair. At last he proposed a stroll in the garden before the sun should have quite gone down. Alice walked between us. Her hair and eyes were conspicuously dark against the whiteness of her gown. She carried herself not ungracefully, and yet without the least movement of her arms or body and answered us both without turning her head. There was a curious, provocative reserve in that impassive and rather long face, a half-unconscious strength of character. And yet somehow I knew, I believe we all knew, that this walk, this discussion of their future plans, was a futility. I had nothing to base such a cynicism on except only a vague sense of oppression, the foreboding remembrance of the inert, invincible power in the background, to whom optimistic plans and love-making and youth are as chaff and thistle-down. We came back silent in the last light. Seaton's aunt was there, under an old brass lamp. Her hair was as barbarously massed and curled as ever. Her eyelids, I think, hung even a little heavier in age over their slow-moving, inscrutable pupils. We filed in slowly out of the evening, and I made my bow. "'In this short interval, Mr. Withers,' she remarked amiably, "'you have put off youth, put on the man. Dear me, how sad it is to see the young days vanishing!' 
Sit down. My nephew tells me you met by chance, or act of providence, shall we call it, and in my beloved strand. You, I understand, are to be best man. Yes, best man, or am I divulging secrets? She surveyed Arthur and Alice with overwhelming graciousness. They sat apart on two low chairs and smiled in return. And Arthur, how do you think Arthur is looking? I think he looks very much in need of a change, I said deliberately. A change? Indeed! She all but shut her eyes at me, and with an exaggerated sentimentality shook her head. My dear Mr. Withers, are we not all in need of a change in this fleeting, fleeting world? She mused over the remark like a connoisseur. And you, she continued, turning abruptly to Alice, I hope you pointed out to Mr. Withers all my pretty bits. We walked around the garden, said Alice, looking out of the window. It's a very beautiful evening. "'Is it?' said the old lady, starting up violently. "'Then, on this very beautiful evening, we will go in to supper. Mr. Withers, your arm. Arthur, bring your bride.'" End of Story 8, Part 1「8. Of the Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 8. Seaton's Aunt by Walter de la Mer from the London Mercury, 1922. Part Two. I can scarcely describe with what curious ruminations I led the way into the faded, heavy-aired dining-room, with this indefinable old creature leaning weightily on my arm, the large flat bracelet on the yellow-laced wrist. She fumed a little, breathed rather heavily, as if with an effort of mind rather than of body, for she had grown much stouter and yet little more proportionate. And to talk into that great white face so close to mine was a queer experience in the dim light of the corridor and even in the twinkling crystal of the candles. She was naive, appallingly naive. She was sudden and superficial. She was even arch, and all these in the brief, rather puffy passage from one room to the other, with these two tongue-tied children bringing up the rear. The meal was tremendous. I have never seen such a monstrous salad. But the dishes were greasy and overspiced, and were indifferently cooked. One thing only was quite unchanged. My hostess's appetite was as gargantuan as ever. The old solid candelabra that lighted us stood before her high-backed chair. Seaton sat a little removed with his plate almost in darkness. And throughout this prodigious meal his aunt talked, mainly to me, mainly at Seaton, with an occasional satirical courtesy to Alice, and muttered explosions of directions to the servant. She had aged, and yet, if it be not nonsense to say so, seemed no older. I suppose to the pyramids a decade is but as the rustling down of a handful of dust, and she reminded me of some such unshakable prehistoricism. She certainly was an amazing talker, racy, extravagant, with a delivery that was perfectly overwhelming. As for Seaton, her flashes of silence were for him. On her enormous volubility would suddenly fall a hush. Acid sarcasm would be left implied, and she would sit softly moving her great head with eyes fixed full in a dreamy smile. But with her whole attention one could see slowly, joyously absorbing his mute discomfiture. 
She confided in us her views on a theme vaguely occupying at the moment, I suppose, all our minds. We have barbarous institutions, and so must put up, I suppose, with a never-ending procession of fools, of fools ad infinitum. Marriage, Mr. Withers, was instituted in the privacy of a garden, sub rosa, as it were. Civilization flaunts it in the glare of day. The dull marry the poor, the rich the effete, and so our new Jerusalem is peopled with naturals, plain and colored, at either end. I detest folly. I detest still more, if I must be frank, dear Arthur, mere cleverness. Mankind has simply become a tailless host of uninstinctive animals. We should never have taken to evolution, Mr. Withers. Natural selection. Little gods and fishes. The deaf for the dumb. We should have used our brains. Intellectual pride, the ecclesiastics call it. And by brains I mean... What do I mean, Alice? I mean, my dear child, and she laid two gross fingers on Alice's narrow sleeve, I mean courage. Consider it, Arthur. I read that the scientific world is once more beginning to be afraid of spiritual agencies, spiritual agencies that tap and actually float. Bless their hearts. I think just one more of these mulberries. Thank you. They talk about blind love, she ran inconsequently on, as she helped herself with eyes fixed on the dish. But why blind? I think, do you know, from weeping over its rickets. After all, it is we plain women that triumph, Mr. Withers, beyond the mockery of time. Alice, now, fleeting, fleeting is youth, my child. What's that you were confiding to your plate, Arthur? satirical boy he laughs at his old aunt nay but thou didst laugh he detests all sentiment he whispers the most acid asides come my love we will leave these cynics we will go and commiserate with each other on our sex the choice of two evils mr smithers i opened the door and she swept out as if borne on a torrent of unintelligible indignation and Arthur and I were left in the clear, four-flamed light alone. For a while we sat in silence. He shook his head at my cigarette case, and I lit a cigarette. Presently he fidgeted in his chair and poked his head forward into the light. He paused to rise and shut again the shut door. "'How long will you be?' he said, standing by the table. I laughed. Oh, it's not that, he said in some confusion. Of course, I like to be with her. But it's not that only. The truth is, Withers, I don't care about leaving her too long with my aunt. I hesitated. He looked at me questioningly. Look here, Seaton, I said. You know well enough that I don't want to interfere in your affairs, or to offer advice where it is not wanted. But don't you think perhaps you may not treat your aunt quite in the right way? As one gets old, you know, a little give and take. I have an old godmother, or something. She talks, too, a, a little allowance. It, it does no harm, but ha hang it all, I'm no talker. He sat down with his hands in his pockets, and still with his eyes fixed almost incredulously on mine. How? he said. Well, my dear fellow, if I'm any judge, mind, I don't say that I am, but I can't help thinking she thinks you don't care for her, and perhaps take your silence for, for bad temper. She has been very decent to you, hasn't she? Decent? My God! said Seaton. I smoked on in silence but he still continued to look at me with that peculiar concentration I remembered of old. "'I don't think, perhaps, Withers,' he began presently, "'I don't think you quite understand. Perhaps you are not quite our kind. 
You always did, just like the other fellows, guy me at school. You laughed at me that night you came to stay here, about the voices and all that. But I don't mind being laughed at, because I know. Know what? It was the same old system of dull question and evasive answer. I mean, I know that what we see and hear is only the smallest fraction of what is. I know she lives quite out of this. She talks to you, but it's all make-believe. It's all a parlor game. She's not really with you, only pitting her outside wits against yours and enjoying the fooling. She's living on inside, on what you're rotten without. That's what it is a cannibal feast. She's a spider. It doesn't much matter what you call it. It means the same kind of thing. I tell you, Withers, she hates me, and you can scarcely dream what that hatred means. I used to think I had an inkling of the reason. It's oceans deeper than that. It just lies behind, herself against myself. Why, after all, how much do we really understand of anything? We don't even know our own histories, and not a tenth, not a tenth of the reasons. What has life been to me? Nothing but a trap. And when one is set free, it only begins again. I thought you might understand, but you are on a different level, that's all. What on earth are you talking about, I said, half contemptuously, in spite of myself. I mean what I say, he said gutturally. All this outside's only make-believe. But there, what's the good of talking? So far as this is concerned, I'm as good as done. You wait. Seaton blew out three of the candles, and, leaving the vacant room in semi-darkness, we groped our way along the corridor to the drawing-room. There a full moon stood shining in at the long garden windows. Alice sat stooping at the door with her hands clasped, looking out alone. "'Where is she?' Seaton asked in a low tone. Alice looked up. Their eyes met in a kind of instantaneous understanding, and the door immediately afterwards opened behind us. "'Such a moon!' said a voice that, once heard, remained unforgettably on the ear. A night for lovers, Mr. Withers, if ever there was one. Get a shawl, my dear Arthur, and take Alice for a little promenade. I dare say we old cronies will manage to keep awake. Hasten, hasten, Romeo, my poor, poor Alice, how laggard a lover. Seaton returned with a shawl. They drifted out into the moonlight. My companion gazed after them till they were out of hearing, turned to me gravely, and suddenly twisted her white face into such a convulsion of contemptuous amusement that I could only stare blankly in reply. "'Dear innocent children,' she said, with inimitable unctuousness. "'Well, well, Mr. Withers, we poor seasoned old creatures must move with the times. Do you sing?' I scouted the idea. Then you must listen to my playing. Chess, she clasped her forehead with both cramped hands, chess is now completely beyond my poor wits. She sat down at the piano and ran her fingers in a flourish over the keys. What shall it be? How shall we capture them, those passionate hearts, that first fine careless rapture, poetry itself? She gazed softly into the garden a moment, and presently, with a shake of her body, began to play the opening bars of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. The piano was old and woolly. She played without music. The lamplight was rather dim. The moonbeams from the window lay across the keys. Her head was in shadow, and whether it was simply due to her personality or to some really occult skill in her playing, I cannot say. I only know that she gravely and deliberately set herself to satirize the beautiful music. It brooded on the air, disillusioned, charged with mockery and bitterness. 
I stood at the window. Far down the path I could see the white figure glimmering in that pool of colorless light. A few faint stars shone, and still that amazing woman behind me dragged out of the unwilling keys her wonderful grotesquerie of youth and love and beauty. It came to an end. I knew the player was watching me. Please, please go on, I murmured without turning. Please go on playing, Miss Seaton. No answer was returned to my rather fluttering sarcasm, but I knew in some indefinite way that I was being acutely scrutinized, when suddenly there followed a procession of quiet, plaintive chords which broke at last softly into the hymn, A Few More Years Shall Roll. I confess it held me spellbound. There is a wistful, strained, plangent pathos in the tune, but beneath those masterly old hands it cried softly and bitterly the solitude and desperate estrangement of the world. Arthur and his lady-love vanished from my thoughts. No one could put into a rather hackneyed old hymn-tune such an appeal who had never known the meaning of the words. Their meaning, anyhow, isn't commonplace. I turned very cautiously and glanced at the musician. She was leaning forward a little over the keys, so that at the approach of my cautious glance she had but to turn her face into the thin flood of moonlight for every feature to become distinctly visible. And so, with the tune abruptly terminated, we steadfastly regarded one another and she broke into a chuckle of laughter. Not quite so seasoned as I supposed, Mr. Withers. I see you are a real lover of music. To me it is too painful. It evokes too much thought. I could scarcely see her little glittering eyes under their penthouse lids. And now, she broke off crisply, tell me, as a man of the world, what do you think of my new niece? I was not a man of the world, nor was I much flattered in my stiff and dullish way of looking at things by being called one, and I could answer her without the least hesitation. I don't think, Miss Seaton, I'm much of a judge of character. She's very charming. A brunette? I think I prefer dark women. And why? Consider, Mr. Withers, dark hair, dark eyes, dark cloud, dark night, dark vision, dark death, dark grave, dark, dark! Perhaps the climax would have rather thrilled Seaton, but I was too thick-skinned. I don't know much about all that, I answered rather pompously. Broad daylight's difficult enough for most of us. Ah, she said, with a sly inward burst of satirical laughter. And I suppose, I went on, perhaps a little nettled, it isn't the actual darkness one admires. It's the contrast of the skin and the color of the eyes and, and their shining. Just as, I went blundering on, too late to turn back, just as you only see the stars in the dark. It would be a long day without any evening. As for death and the grave, I don't suppose we shall much notice that. Arthur and his sweetheart were slowly returning along the dewy path. I believe in making the best of things. How very interesting, came the smooth answer. I see you are a philosopher, Mr. Withers. Hmm. As for death and the grave, I don't suppose we shall much notice that. Very interesting. And, I'm sure, she added in a particularly suave voice, I profoundly hope so. She rose slowly from her stool. You will take pity on me again, I hope. You and I would get on famously, kindred spirits, elective affinities. And, of course, now that my nephew's going to leave me, now that his affections are centered on another, I shall be a very lonely old woman. Shall I not, Arthur? Seaton blinked stupidly. I didn't hear what you said, aunt. I was telling your old friend, Arthur, that when you are gone I shall be a very lonely old woman. 
"Oh, I don't think so," he said in a strange voice. "He means, Mr. Withers, he means, my dear child," she said, sweeping her eyes over Alice, "he means that I shall have memory for company, heavenly memory, the ghosts of other days. Sentimental boy! And did you enjoy our music, Alice? Did I really stir that youthful heart? Oh, oh, oh!" continued the horrible old creature, you billers and cooers, I have been listening to such flatteries, such confessions. Beware, beware, Arthur, there's many a slip. She rolled her little eyes at me. She shrugged her shoulders at Alice, and gazed an instant stonily into her nephew's face. I held out my hand. Good night, good night, she cried. He that fights and runs away. Ah, good night, Mr. Withers. Come again soon. She thrust out her cheek at Alice, and we all three filed slowly out of the room. Black shadow darkened the porch and half the spreading sycamore. We walked, without speaking, up the dusty village street. Here and there a crimson window glowed. At the fork of the high road I said good-bye, but I had taken hardly more than a dozen steps when a sudden impulse seized me. Seaton, I called. He turned in the moonlight. You have my address. If by any chance you know you should care to spend a week or two in town between this and the, the day, we should be delighted to see you. Thank you, Withers, thank you, he said in a low voice. I dare say, I waved my stick gallantly to Alice, I dare say you will be doing some shopping. We could all meet, I added, laughing. Thank you, thank you, Withers, immensely, he repeated. And so we parted. But they were out of the jog-trot of my prosaic life, and being of a stolid and incurious nature, I left Seaton and his marriage, and even his aunt, to themselves in my memory, and scarcely gave a thought to them until one day I was walking up the Strand again, and past the flashing gloaming of the covered-in jeweler's shop where I had accidentally encountered my old schoolfellow in the summer. It was one of those still close autumnal days after a rainy night. I cannot say why but a vivid recollection returned to my mind of our meeting, and of how suppressed Seaton had seemed, and of how vainly he had endeavoured to appear assured and eager. He must be married by now, and had doubtless returned from his honeymoon. And I had clean forgotten my manners, had sent not a word of congratulation, nor as I might very well have done, and as I knew he would have been immensely pleased at my doing, the ghost of a wedding present. On the other hand, I pleaded with myself, I had had no invitation. I paused at the corner of Trafalgar Square, and at the bidding of one of those caprices that seized occasionally on even an unimaginative mind, I suddenly ran after a green bus that was passing, and found myself bound on a visit I had not in the least foreseen. All the colors of autumn were over the village when I arrived. A beautiful late afternoon sunlight bathed thatch and meadow, but it was close and hot. A child, two dogs, a very old woman with a heavy basket I encountered. One or two incurious tradesmen looked idly up as I passed by. It was all so rural and so still, my whimsical impulse had so much flagged, that for a while I hesitated to venture under the shadow of the sycamore tree to inquire after the happy pair. I deliberately passed by the faint blue gates, and continued my walk under the high green and tufted wall. Hollyhocks had attained their topmost bud, and seeded in the little cottaged gardens beyond. The Michaelmas daisies were in flower, a sweet warm aromatic smell of fading leaves was in the air. Beyond the cottages lay a field where cattle were grazing, and beyond that I came to a little churchyard. 
Then the road wound on, pathless and houseless, among gorse and bracken. I turned impatiently and walked quickly back to the house and rang the bell. The rather colorless elderly woman who answered my inquiry informed me that Miss Seaton was at home, as if only taciturnity forbade her adding, but she doesn't want to see you. Might I, do you think, have Mr. Arthur's address, I said. She looked at me with quiet astonishment, as if waiting for an explanation. Not the faintest of smiles came into her thin face. I will tell Miss Seaton, she said after a pause. Please walk in. She showed me into the dingy, undusted drawing-room, filled with evening sunshine and the green-dyed light that penetrated the leaves overhanging the long French windows. I sat down and waited on and on, occasionally aware of a creaking footfall overhead. At last the door opened a little, and the great face I had once known peered round at me, for it was enormously changed, mainly, I think, because the old eyes had rather suddenly failed, and so a kind of stillness and darkness lay over its calm and wrinkled pallor. "'Who is it?' she asked. I explained myself and told her the occasion of my visit. She came in and shut the door carefully after her, and, though the fumbling was scarcely perceptible, groped her way to a chair. She had on an old dressing-gown, like a cassock, of a pattern cinnamon color. "'What is it you want?' she said, seating herself and lifting her blank face to mine. "'Might I just have Arthur's address?' I said deferentially. "'I am so sorry to have disturbed you.' Ah, uh, you have come to see my nephew? Not necessarily to see him, only to hear how he is, and, of course, Mrs. Seaton, too. I am afraid my silence must have appeared. He hasn't noticed your silence, croaked the old voice out of the great mask. Besides, there isn't any Mrs. Seaton. Ah, then, I answered after a momentary pause. I have not seemed so black as I painted myself. And how is Miss Othram? She's gone into Yorkshire, answered Seaton's aunt. And Arthur, too? She did not reply, but simply sat blinking at me with lifted chin, as if listening, but certainly not for what I might have to say. I began to feel rather at a loss. You were no close friend of my nephew's, Mr. Smithers she said presently. No, I answered, welcoming the cue. And yet, do you know, Miss Seaton, he is one of the very few of my old schoolfellows I have come across in the last few years, and I suppose, as one gets older, one begins to value old associations. My voice seemed to trail off into a vacuum. I thought Miss Ottram, I hastily began again, a particularly charming girl, I hope they are both quite well." Still the old face solemnly blinked at me in silence. "'You must find it very lonely, Miss Seaton, with Arthur away.' "'I was never lonely in my life,' she said sourly. "'I don't look to flesh and blood for my company. When you've got to be my age, Mr. Smithers, which God forbid, you'll find life a very different affair from what you seem to think it is now. You won't seek company then, I'll be bound. It's thrust on you. Her face edged round into the clear green light, and her eyes, as it were, groped over my vacant, disconcerted face. I dare say now, she said, composing her mouth, I dare say my nephew told you a good many teradiddles in his time. Oh, yes, a good many, eh? Huh? He was always a liar. What now did he say of me? tell me now. She leant forward as far as she could, trembling, with an ingratiating smile. I think he is rather superstitious, I said coldly, but honestly I have a very poor memory, Miss Seaton. Why, she said, I haven't. 
The engagement hasn't been broken off, I hope. Well, between you and me, she said, shrinking up and with an immensely confidential grimace, it has. I'm sure I'm very sorry to hear it. And where is Arthur? Eh? Where is Arthur? We faced each other mutely among the dead old bygone furniture. Past all my scrutiny was that large, flat, gray, cryptic countenance. And then suddenly our eyes for the first time really met, in some indescribable way out of that thick-lidded obscurity, a far small something stooped and looked out at me for a mere instant of time that seemed of almost intolerable protraction. Involuntarily I blinked and shook my head. She muttered something with great rapidity, but quite inarticulately, rose and hobbled to the door. I thought I heard, mingled in broken mutterings, something about tea. Please, please don't trouble, I began, but could say no more, for the door was already shut between us. I stood and looked out on the long-neglected garden. I could just see the bright greenness of Seaton's old tadpole pond. I wandered about the room. Dusk began to gather. The last birds in that dense shadowiness of trees had ceased to sing and not a sound was to be heard in the house. I waited on and on, vainly speculating. I even attempted to ring the bell, but the wire was broken and only jangled loosely at my efforts. I hesitated, unwilling to call or to venture out, and yet more unwilling to linger on, waiting for a tea that promised to be an exceedingly comfortless supper and as darkness drew down a feeling of the utmost unease and disquietude came over me all my talks with seaton returned on me with a suddenly enriched meaning i recalled again his face as we had stood hanging over the staircase listening in the small hours to the inexplicable stirrings of the night there were no candles in the room every minute the autumnal darkness deepened I cautiously opened the door and listened, and with some little dismay withdrew, for I was uncertain of my way out. I even tried the garden, but was confronted under a veritable thicket of foliage by a padlocked gate. It would be a little too ignominious to be caught scaling a friend's garden fence. Cautiously returning into the still and musty drawing-room, I took out my watch and gave the incredible old woman ten minutes in which to reappear. And when that tedious ten minutes had ticked by, I could scarcely distinguish its hands. I determined to wait no longer, drew open the door, and, trusting to my sense of direction, groped my way through the corridor that I vaguely remembered led to the front of the house. I mounted three or four stairs, and, lifting a heavy curtain, found myself facing the starry fanlight of the porch. Hence I glanced into the gloom of the dining-room. My fingers were on the latch of the outer door, when I heard a faint stirring in the darkness above the hall. I looked up and became conscious of, rather than saw, the huddled old figure looking down on me. There was an immense hushed pause. Then, Arthur! Arthur, whispered an inexpressively peevish, rasping voice, is that you? Is that you, Arthur? I can scarcely say why, but the question horribly startled me. No conceivable answer occurred to me. With head craned back, hand clenched on my umbrella, I continued to stare up into the gloom in this fatuous confrontation. Oh, oh, the voice croaked. It is you, is it? That disgusting man! Go away out! Go away out! Hesitating no longer, I caught open the door, and, slamming it behind me, ran out into the garden under the gigantic old sycamore, and so out at the open gate. I found myself half up the village street before I stopped running. 
The local butcher was sitting in his shop reading a piece of newspaper by the light of a small oil lamp. I crossed the road and inquired the way to the station, and after he had with minute and needless care directed me, I asked casually if Mr. Arthur Seaton still lived with his aunt at the big house just beyond the village. He poked his head in at the little parlor door. "'Here's a gentleman inquiring after young Mr. Seaton, Millie,' he said. "'He's dead, ain't he?' "'Why, yes, bless you,' replied a cheerful voice from within. "'Dead and buried these three months or more, young Mr. Seaton. And just before he was to be married, don't you remember, Bob?' I saw a fair young woman's face peer over the muslin of the little door at me. Uh, "'Thank you,' I replied. "'Then I go straight on.' "'That's it, sir, past the pond, bear up the hill a bit, to the left, and then there's the station lights before your eyes.' We looked intelligently into each other's faces in the beam of the smoky lamp, but not one of the many questions in my mind could I put into words. And again I paused irresolutely a few paces further on. It was not, I fancy, merely a foolish apprehension of what the raw-boned butcher might think that prevented my going back to see if I could find Seaton's grave in the benighted churchyard. There was precious little use in pottering about in the muddy dark merely to find where he was buried. And yet I felt a little uneasy. My rather horrible thought was that, so far as I was concerned, one of his esteemed few friends, he had never been much better than buried in my mind. End of Story 8, Part 2「9 of the best British short stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The best British short stories of 1922 by Various. Story 9 The Reaper by Dorothy Easton from The English Review, 1922. Milgett is a rich farmer, owning his own machines, not like those poorer, smaller men who hire an engine from a neighbor. He has his reaping machine, a red and yellow Walter Wood, Cleveland brand. Every morning now, as soon as it's dry enough, about nine o'clock, the engine starts, and from the farmer's manor house its heavy, drowsy sounds are heard. For those on the machine, the noise is harder. The only human sound that penetrates it is the old conductor's ahoy to the driver if the canvas sticks or if weeds are making a block. Then the young man in front slows his engine down and wipes his forehead with his hand. Reaping goes on until nine at night. No strange workman sits on the reaper but one of Milgut's best men, the most trustworthy, most faithful, the wagoner. A man well over sixty, with side whiskers, gray eyes, a long nose, and forehead and chin carved out of granite. On his head a flat, wide-awake hat, on his bent back a white jacket. When he speaks, his mouth moves sideways first. There's always a spot of dried blood on his lips. When he smiles, a tooth stump appears like an ancient fossil. He talks slowly stopping to spit now and then. Every day of his life he gets up at half-past three. Now, mounted on the high iron seat, a crumpled sack for saddle, he rides like some old charioteer, a Hercules with great bowed back, head jutting out, chin straight, a hard weathered look about his face, and in his heart disgust. This year, for the first time, they are using a motor engine to pull the reaper round instead of horses. He lives for his horses. He's the wagoner. They are his job. If one falls ill, he sleeps with it. He believes in horses. But speaking of the motor, he says, She's all right when she's all right, with a look which ends the sentence for him. 
in his youth, he had reaped with a scythe. This Walter Wood is a neat arrangement, you can't deny that. One bit of mechanism works as a divider, while a big, light kind of wooden woodmill arrangement, continually revolving, beats the corn down into a flat pan from which it's carried on a canvas slide up an incline, then shot over and down the other side in one continual, long, flat stream like yellow matting. And then the needle, the threadle, as he calls it, nips in somewhere, binding the flat mass into separate, neat, round sheaves, pitched out every few moments with perfect precision by a three-pronged iron fork. Above the one big heavy central wheel, the charioteer is shaken and jolted from nine till nine. In front, on another iron seat by the box-like engine, the driver works. Behind runs a red-faced laborer, clearing corners. The motor has to run out the full length of its cogged iron wheel bands before it can turn, and sheaves dropped on the last round get in the way. So at each corner they have to be lifted and set back. The laborer clears, then runs after the machine, now halfway up the field, stops at the next corner, stoops once more to lift and shift three sheaves, then runs again. This laborer was a man of forty, with a face as naive as a boy of fifteen. Though getting bald, his eyes were young, his mouth loose, untrained as a child's. He's touched, as we say, and had never really grown up. He slept in an attic, ate in a kitchen, and worked, but was not responsible. He was always given light jobs walking with the clappers, weeding, cleaning styes, clearing. His greatest friend was a boy of twelve. On Sundays they'd laugh for an hour at nothing. Going to the coast for the first time last year, he was so taken by a Punch and Judy show that he never saw the sea. His smile was the most ridiculous thing in the world. He blushed continually, panted, grinned like some boy caught kissing, and was always apologetic. Lightning made him hide his head, and he was afraid of engines. Their regularity upset him. Running behind the reaper, this quick-moving, noisy thing, smelling of oil, made up of sliding chains, appalled him. There were five wheels at an angle, and all the time an oil-wet, black, flat, chain band ran round over them. Underneath, the heavy central wheel ran round and round. To the imbecile, the wagoner's courage appeared supernatural. There should have been another man to take two corners, but all hands were wanted, so the laborer had to run all day. It was hot, no wind, no shade. If he looked up for a moment, the hills and distant elms appeared bright blue. The big field itself was ablaze with color, wheat like brown burnt amber, poppies, small white daisies, thistles. When the engine stopped, the only sounds were plaintive, anxious bird calls from the center of the field. Sometimes a rabbit or a hare looked out, then bolted back. Once five graceful, sleek brown pheasants ran out towards the hedge, then lost their nerve, turned, and went running back. The sun shone steadily. Sheaves picked up by the laborer made his hands smell oily. Their string band raised a blister on his forefinger. Very often he grabbed hold of nettles and sharp thistles, and the backs of his hands were swollen and covered with stings. Blue butterflies twirled in front of his face. Pale moths flew out. When his hat fell off, he had no time to get it. The sweat ran down his egg-shaped forehead to his long, square, hairy chin. Though he could shave himself on Sundays, he looked a little like a donkey. When the engine stuck, the wagoner asked in his slow, flat voice, "'Won't she speak?' "'She's not coming out.' was the youth's reply. 
Once the driver was thrown up a foot when the motor went over a hole. He yelled, "Men are often killed by the reaper." The imbecile got the startled look of a child seeing snakes at the Zoo. Each time the engine snorted, or the waggoner called out "Ahoy!" a spurt of sweat ran down his spine. The blood was beating in his head. The sun shone mercilessly on his pale, bald patch. The field began to bounce before his eyes, bloodshot from stooping. When yards of bindweed shackled the machinery, the waggoner just turned his head, a sign for the labourer, who had to run, had to catch and tear away the long green chains full of small pink flowers. By four o'clock they were overtaking him before he got round. The driver had to turn more sharply, the canvas stuck. "'Don't you do that again,' the old waggoner scolded with stern eye. "'You'll turn us over.' The engine stuck when they tried to start again. For half an hour the young driver tinkered with tools from the box, unscrewing small oily nuts, testing wires, feeling levers, and in desperation wiping his black dripping hands on his hair. Twenty times he turned the starting handle, but she wouldn't speak. Then suddenly, with a sound like a pistol shot, the engine fired, the machine ran backwards, upsetting the laborer, and before he could move, the central wheel ran over his ankles. When the imbecile came to himself, they were still at the corner. His feet were tied up in a jacket. He was suffering horribly, yet seemed unable to focus it. But seeing the red and yellow reaper standing close beside his head, some memory soaked his face with sweat he fainted. Brandy was fetched. They had lifted him on to a hurdle when he recovered again. The whole group were still at the corner. His employer stood there, stout, well-dressed, and anxious in his grey felt hat, dark coat, and trousers. The driver stood there, too, and the old wagoner. Corn was still up in the middle of the field. The laborer looked surprised at seeing sky before him. As a rule, when he stared, he saw fields. He turned his face. The men watching saw his round boyish eyes project at sight of something red and wet and sticky, like the mess they made out sheep-killing, splashed on the stubble, while two broken boots lay oozing the same stuff in a large pool of it. Following this look, the old waggoner said slowly, "'Eh, me boy, them's yours.' Tears were running down his stiff, dried cheeks. "'How'd you feel?' asked the farmer. His laborer blushed, then whispered to the waggoner, "'What's happened, Mr. Colliard?' "'Why, you've a your feet.' For yet another minute the imbecile lay panting, shy, self-conscious under his master's eye, until an idea struck him. Once more whispering to the wagoner, he said, "'Elp me oop. I'll go home, Willie.' "'You can't walk,' said the old man simply. "'You can't walk no more.' Black hairs stiffened suddenly on the idiot's chin. He had understood that in those bleeding, mangled boots his feet were lying he began to cry. But then, catching sight of his master, smiled as though to apologize. End of Story 9 Story 10 of the Best British Short Stories of 1922 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 10, The Song, by May Edgington, from Lloyd's Story Magazine, 1922. Charlie had no true vice in him. 
All the same, a man may be overtaxed, over harassed, over routined, over driven, over pricked, over preached, and over starved, right up to the edge, and then the fascination of the big space below may easily pull him over. But his wife's uncle's assertion that he must always inwardly have been naturally wild and bad was as wrong as such assertions usually are for he was no more truly vicious than his youngest baby was on the warm evening when he came home on that fateful autumn day charlie had been pushed in the course of years right up to the edge and was looking into the abyss though he was hardly aware of it so well had he been disciplined he emerged from a third-class carriage of the usual train without an evening paper because his wife had shown him the decency of cutting down small personal expenses and the next morning's papers would have the same news in anyway he walked home up the suburban road for the four thousandth five hundred and fiftieth time entered quietly not to disturb the baby rubbed his boots on the mat answered his wife brightly and manfully washed his hands in cold water the hot water being saved for the baby's bath and the washing up in the evenings and sat down to about the four thousandth five hundred and fiftieth cold supper his wife said she was tired and seemed proud of it but never mind she said one must expect to be tired he went on eating without verbally questioning her it was an assertion to which she always held firmly but in his soul something stirred vaguely as if mutinous currents fretted there i have been thinking she said that you really ought not to buy that new suit you were considering if maud is to go to a better school next term i have been looking over your pepper and salt and there are those people who turn suits like new you can have that done but he murmured we ought not to think of ourselves she added i never have said charlie in rather a low voice we ought to give a little subscription to the parish magazine she continued the vicar is calling round for extra subscriptions charlie nodded he was wishing he knew the football results in the evening paper his wife served a rice shape. She doled out jam with a careful hand and a measuring eye. We ought to see about the garden gate, she said. I'll mend it on Saturday, Charlie replied. I was thinking, she said presently, that we ought to ask Uncle Henry and Aunt round soon. They will be expecting it. Charlie put his spoon and fork together, hesitated, and then replied slowly, life is nothing but ought ought to do this ought to do that his wife looked at him astonished he could see that she was grieved or rather aggrieved at his glimmer of anarchy of course she explained at last people can't have what they like there's one's duty to do life isn't for enjoyment charlie it's given to us it, it, it is given to us as she paused to crystallize an idea, Charlie cut in. Yes, he said, it is given to us. What for? He leaned his head on his hand. He was not looking at her. He was looking at the cloth, weaving patterns upon it. And with this question, something of boyhood came upon him again, and he weaved visions upon the cloth. To do one's duty in, she replied gently but rebukingly charlie did not know the classic phrase qui bono he merely repeated what for after supper he helped her to wash up for the daily help left early in the afternoon and then he asked her idle as he knew the question to be if she would like to come for a walk just a short walk up the road she shook her head i ought not to leave the children they're in bed he argued and maud's big enough to look after the others for half an hour maud's twelve she shook her head i ought not to leave the house but he began slowly 
"'I am not the kind of woman who leaves her house and children in the evenings,' she said gently, but finally. Charlie took his hat. He turned it round and round in his hands, pinching the crown in and punching it out. He had a curious, almost uncontrollable wish to cry. For a moment it was terrible. Before it was over, she was speaking again. "'You ought not to mess your hats about like that. They don't last half as long.' Charlie went out. He knew other men who were as puzzled about life as himself, but mostly they were of cruder stuff, and if things at home went beyond their bearing, they flung out of their houses swearing and went to play a hundred up at the local club. Then they were philosophers again. But for Charlie this evening there was no philosophy big enough, for he was looking, though he did not know it, over the edge of that awful but enchanting abyss. Its depths were obscured by rolling clouds of mist, and it was only this mist which he now saw, terrifying and confusing him. He was a little man, and knew it. He was a poor man, and knew it. He was a weary man, and knew it. He hated his wife, and knew it. He hated his children, whom she had made like herself, prim, peaking, and childishly censorious, and he knew it. He had not meant it to be like this at all. When he got married, she was the starched daughter of starched parents from a starched small house, like the one he came from but she was young, and her figure was pliant, and her hair curled rather sweetly. He had dreamed of happy days, cozy days with laughter, little treats together, Soho restaurants, Richmond Park, something colorful, something for which he had vaguely and secretly longed all the dingy, narrow, church-parading, humbugging days of his good little boyhood but he soon woke up to find he had married another hard, holy woman like his mother. He walked along, thinking mistily and hotly, supposing he had a baby who roared with joy and stole the sugar, but she wouldn't have babies like that. The first coherent thing her babies learned to say was a text. Babies! He hadn't wanted three because they couldn't afford them. He tried to talk to her about it. She made him ashamed of himself, though he didn't know why, and showed him how wicked he was, though he didn't know why, and how good she was, though he didn't know why, then. But he knew now that there are still many women who are gluttons for martyrdom, who long to exalt themselves by a parrot righteousness and who are only happy when destroying natural joy in others. And he knew there were many men like himself, married and done for, tied up to these pettifogging saints, goaded under their stupid yoke, belittled through their narrow eyes. He thought all this mistily and hotly. He had come to the end of the road, and the end of another road more populous, and the end of another road more populous. At a corner of this road stood Kitty. She was soft and colorful, painted to a perfect peachiness, young, twenty-four, and looking less, old as the world, and wise. She was gay. She did not much care if it snowed, she knew enough to wriggle in somewhere, somehow, out of it. The years had not yet scared her. She was joy. Charlie paused before he knew why. She looked at him. Then the mists rolled away from the abyss below the tottering edge on which he had been balanced for longer time than he guessed, and he saw the garden far below, lotus flowers dreaming in the sun. He launched himself simply into space towards them. Kitty helped him. She knew how. Charlie had, as it happened, his next week's personal allowance of 
seven and sixpence in his pocket, for today had been pay day, and his season ticket. The rest he had handed over to his wife at supper time. He had also, however, the moral support of knowing that he had in the savings bank the exact amount of his sickness and life insurance premiums due that very week. So it did not embarrass him to take Kitty straight away up to town. She, making a shrewd summary of him, did not object to third-class traveling, and to stand her coffee and a sandwich at the Monaco. I don't happen to have much change on me, and my bank's closed, was the explanation he offered, and she tactfully accepted of this modest entertainment. It was ten-thirty when she took him to see her tiny flat, a stone's throw away. She was looking for another supporter for that flat, and explained her reason for being in Charlie's suburb that evening. She'd been trying to find the house of a man-friend, a rich friend, who lived there, and might have helped her over a temporary difficulty, but when she found the house the servants told her he was away. She confided these things, leaning in Charlie's arms on a little striped divan, by a gas fire. She made him a drink, and showed him the cunning and luxurious little contrivances for comfort about the flat. He loved it. She didn't try to conceal from him her real vocation, for that would have been too silly. Even Charlie might not have been such a fool as to believe her. But she invested it with glamour. She made of it romance. Once more, as in boyhood, he saw the world full of allurement. So he went home, having promised her that to-morrow he would come again. And going in quietly, so as not to disturb the baby, he undressed quietly, so as not to disturb his wife, and he crept cautiously into the double bed that she decreed they must share for ever and ever, whatever their feelings towards one another, because they were married and he hoped to fall asleep with enchantment unbroken. But she was awake, and waiting patiently to speak. "'Where have you been, Charlie?' "'At the club,' he whispered back, watching two fellows play a billiard match. She sighed. "'Charlie,' she said, "'you ought to have more consideration for me.' Maudie said to me, when I went in to look at them before I came to bed, "'Is Daddy still out?' she said. "'I do think he ought not to go out and leave you alone, Mamma. "'She's such a sweet child, Charlie, and I do think you ought to think more of her. "'Children often say little things in the innocence of their hearts "'that do even us grown-up people good sometimes.' So the next morning Charlie left home with a suitcase, alleged to contain the one suit for turning, but really crammed to bursting. His wife being busy with the baby, Maud saw him off with her usual air of smug reproof. And that evening he did not come back. He had written a letter to his wife on the journey to town, telling her his decision, which she would receive by the afternoon post but he gave her no address. He drew out the whole amount in the savings bank, surrendered his life insurance, realizing a hundred and sixty pounds, and he went home after the day's work to Kitty. Little Kitty was looking for any kind of mug, pending better developments, and she certainly had found one. But what a happy mug he was! Life was warm and light, gay and uncritical. He spent even less on his own lunches. He retained his seven and sixpence weekly personal allowance, though of course he posted the rest of his salary home, so that he might have an extra half-crown or so to buy chocolates for Kitty. It was nice to buy chocolates instead of subscribing to the vicar's fund, and little Kitty, who was wise, guessed he hadn't much and couldn't afford her long, so, pending better things, like a sensible person, she eked him out. She made him so happy. They laughed, she sang, 
I'm forever blowing bubbles, pretty bubbles in the air. They fly so high, nearly reach the sky. She had a gramophone, and she taught him to dance, and then he had to take her to the best dancing place he could afford, and they danced a long evening through. He bought her a wonderful little woolen frock at one of the small French shops in Shaftesbury Avenue, and she looked exactly what she was in it. And he knew she was the most wonderful thing in the world. When he propounded the frock question to her one morning when they woke up, saying, I would like to see you in a dress I'd bought, Kitty, she did not tell him it was wrong to consider themselves, and she would have her old black turned. She put a dear fat little arm round his neck, laid a soft, selfish cheek to his, and muttered cosily, It shall buy her a frock, then, it shall. She was sporting enough not to protest when she knew where his weekly pay went. Three kids must be fed, she said. In fact, according to her own codes, she was not ungenerous towards the other woman. All the while he knew, a hundred and sixty pounds can't last. What will happen then? Charlie's wife thought she was sure of what must happen pretty soon. So did her Uncle Henry and Aunt, for whom she had sent a day or two after the blow had fallen. They found her cutting down Maud's oldest dress for the second child in her tidy house. Charlie has left me for an immoral woman, she said, after preparing them with preliminaries. What? said Uncle Henry. He was a churchwarden at the church to which Charlie, in a bowler hat, had had to take the critical Maud on Sundays. Fancy leaving that, said Aunt when they had digested and credited the news. She pointed at her niece, sewing diligently even through this painful conversation. Look at her, scraping and economizing and contriving, and he leaves her. He must be naturally wild and bad, said Uncle Henry. Shall I speak to the vicar for you? Have you written to his firm? asked Aunt. Charlie's wife spoke wisely, gently, and with perfection, as ever. No, she said, I have thought it over, and I think the best thing for the children's sake is to say nothing. We ought not to consider ourselves. Besides, I dare say it's my duty to forgive him. Always thinking of your duty, murmured Aunt admiringly. If I wrote to his firm about it, said Charlie's wife, they would dismiss him. Ah, and he sends you his pay, you say, said Uncle Henry, seizing the point like a business man. What a position for a conscientious woman like you, mourned Aunt. You are quite right, my dear, said Uncle Henry. You have three children and no other means of sustenance and you cannot afford to do as I should otherwise advise you. Besides, he will come back, said Charlie's wife gently. Men are soon sickened of these women. Of course, agreed Aunt. Well, well, said Uncle Henry, you are very magnanimous, my dear, and one day Charles will fully appreciate it, and I hope he will be duly thankful to you for your great goodness, Yes, you will soon have Master Charles creeping back, very ashamed of himself, and when he comes, I, for one, intend to give him the biggest talking to he has ever had in his life. But I really think the vicar, too, should be told, in confidence, so that he may decide upon the right course of action for himself. Because he could not allow your husband to communicate, my love, said aunt, without being sure of his genuine repentance. I have been thinking of that, too, said Charlie's wife. It would not be right. I wonder what he feels about himself when he remembers his dear little children, said aunt. Maud, nearly old enough to understand and all. So they lay for Charlie, while he basked and thrived in the abyss of the lotus-flower, 
and the hundred and sixty pounds dwindled. It was towards the end of the second month that Charlie sensed a new element in his precarious dream. All day when he was out thinking of Kitty through the routine of his work, he had no idea of what she was doing. Sometimes he was afraid to think of what she might be doing, and for fear of shattering the dream he never dared to ask. Always she was sweet and joyful towards him, save for petulant quarrels she raised, as if to make the ensuing sweetness and joyfulness the dearer, until towards the close of the second month. Then one evening she was distraught, one evening critical, one night cold. Then she had a dinner and dance engagement at the Savoy. Then he knew that his time had come. He waited up for her. He had the gas-fire lighted in the tiny sitting-room, and little sugary cakes and wine on the table. And the gas-fire lighted in the bedroom to warm it for her, and the bed turned down, and her nightgown and slippers, so frail, warming before the fire. But he knew. In the early dawn her key clicked in the lock, and she came in, followed by a man. He was pale, sensual, moneyed, fashionable. Charlie got up stoutly, but he was already beaten. The Jew looked at him and turned to Kitty. "'I told you,' she said, stammering a little, "'I, I told you how it was, but by tomorrow, I, I told you—' "'I'll come again tomorrow, then,' said the man, very meaningly. "'Fetch you out. At eight she nodded firmly. He kissed her on the mouth, while Charlie stood looking at them, with eyes that seemed to stare themselves out of his head, turned, and went out. Nighty-night, Kitty called after him. After the front door clicked again, there was a moment's silence. Kitty advanced, shook off her cloak, took up one of the sugary cakes, and began to munch it. She looked beautiful and careless and sorry and hard all at once. "'What are you sitting up for, Charlie?' she asked. "'I didn't expect to see you. I brought that fellow in to talk.' "'What about?' said Charlie in a hoarse, desolate voice. "'Charlie,' said Kitty hurriedly, "'you know this arrangement of ours can't last now, can it, dear? You haven't the cash for one thing, dear.' Now, have you? And I've got to think of myself a little. A girl's got to provide. You've been awfully good to me. Let's part friends. Part, he repeated. His eyes seemed to start from his head. Let's part friends, wheedled Kitty. Shall us? The night passed in a kind of evil vision of desolation, and Kitty was asleep long before he had stopped his futile whisperings into her ear. Before he went to the office in the morning, he asked her from a breaking heart, "'You mean it?' "'I've got to,' she explained. She cried easily. "'Dearie, you'll leave peaceably? You, you won't make a row, now, for my sake, to oblige me? While you're out today, I'll pack your suitcase and give it to the hall porter for you to call for.' Shall I, Charlie? Kiss me, dear. Don't take your latch-key. Good-bye. You've been awfully decent to me. We'll part friends, shall us? He kissed her and went out to work, speaking no more. He had said all the things in his heart during the hours of that sleepless dawn. She knew how he loved her, though possibly she didn't quite believe. He realized her position acutely, perhaps more acutely than his own. She had to live, and yet— He had taken his latch-key, the same as usual, and he found himself at the end of the day going the same as usual to the tiny flat that was home if ever there was any place called home. He let himself in noiselessly. The little hall was dark. He stood in a corner against the coat cupboard. The flat was silent. He stood there a long while without moving, 
and a clock chimed seven. He heard her singing, I'm forever blowing bubbles, la 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 la, la 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 la. She would be in her bedroom, sitting before the mirror in her diaphanous underwear, touching up her face. The pauses in the song made him see her. Now she was using the eyebrow pencil. The song went on and broke again. Now she would be half turning from the mirror, curved on the gilt chair as he had so often seen her, hand glass in hand, looking at the back of her head and her eyelashes, and her profile, finding away all hard edges of rouge and lipstick. He felt quite peaceful as he imaged her. Peace was shattered at a blast by the ringing of the front doorbell. Then light streamed from the opened bedroom door, was switched off, and Kitty ran into the darkish hall. She clicked on the light by the front door, opened the door, and the big man came in. He kissed her on the mouth. Then Charlie stepped from beside the coat cupboard, suddenly as though some strong spring which had held him there had been released, and the strong spring was in his tense body alone. For the first time in his life he felt all steel and wire and whipcord and many fires. He threw himself on the intruder and fought for his woman. Kitty did not scream. She knew better. Oh, Charlie, she panted, for blank sake, go. Go, I can't have a row here. Oh, Charlie, be a good boy, do. He shall go, said the other man. He was a big man and still young and lithe. Kitty opened the front door, whispering, Oh, Charlie, oh, Charlie, and the man pushed Charlie out. The lift was not working at the moment. The landing was quiet. There was not a soul in the stairway beside the lift shaft when the man flung Charlie headlong down the first flight and broke him on the unyielding stone. Charlie heard his own spine crack, but as the other, scared and pale, reached him, he heard something else also. The voice of Kitty, who stood above them, looking down, sobbing, I c c can't have a row here. It'd break me. Oh, Charlie, oh, Charlie, if you love me, go away. Charlie loved Kitty very much. My back's broken, he whispered to the enemy, bending over him. But if you get me under the armpits, lift me down the stairs, and put me into the street, and if the hall porter sees us go out, tell him I'm dead drunk. The man lifted him as instructed, an arm around him, just under the shoulder blades and armpits. Below he could feel the crumpled weight sway and sag. He tried to be merciful in his handling. D -d 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 do you no g -g good he faltered as he lifted charlie downstairs to get me into a mess I i'm sorry d -d 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 didn't mean but i've got a wife and don't want hell raised you asked for it I i'm sorry I i'm sorry when they reached the ground floor the single-handed porter was just carrying a passenger in the lift to the floor above so they got unobserved into the street, a quietish street, a cul-de-sac. Take me a f f f few d d d doors off and put me down, said Charlie, and the sweat of pain ran down his face. But when the man had put him down against some area railings and laid him straight, he was comfortable. The other man simply vanished. A taxi driver found Charlie by and by, and the police fetched an ambulance and took him to the hospital, and in a white bed he lay sleepily, revealing nothing, all that night. But they found, searching for an address in his pockets, the address of his family, and they sent a message to his wife. His wife received it early the next morning, and first she sent Maud for Uncle Henry and Aunt, 
who found that all was turning out as they prophesied, save for the slight deviation of Charlie's accident. They don't say exactly how bad he is, said Uncle Henry. Ah, but he was well enough to send for you. He knows which side his bread's buttered on. Yes, we shall have Master Charles creeping back again, very thankful to be in his home with every comfort nursed by you. And I will give him the worst talking to he has ever had in his life. And if he's ill, he can't prevent the vicar visiting him, too, said Aunt. So Charlie's wife set out to do her duty. But still earlier that morning, instructed by the tremendous peace which was stealing over him that time was short, Charlie was making his first request. Would they please ring up Shaftesbury 8-4 to ask for Kitty and tell her Charlie just wanted to see her very urgently for a few minutes at once, but not to be frightened, for everything would be perfectly all right. Pending her arrival, which in a faltering voice over the phone she promised as soon as possible, Charlie asked the kindly sister who was hovering near to help him die. Sister, when a friend of mine comes in, a young lady who isn't used to, to seeing things, if I go off suddenly, as it were, what I'm afraid of is she may be afraid if there's any kind of struggle. I saw a fellow die once, and he gave a sort of rattle. Well, will you just pull the bedclothes up over me so that she doesn't see me? Kitty came in, wearing, perhaps incidentally, perhaps by some grace of kindness, the woolen frock, and she crept, shaking, round the screen, and stood beside Charlie, and said, Oh, Charlie, oh, Charlie! opening his closing eyes. Kitty, he smiled, sing Bubbles. The look sister, who had taken her right in, gave her, pried Kitty's trembling mouth open like a crowbar, and leaning against Charlie's cot, she sang, When shadows creep, when I'm asleep, to lands of hope I stray, then at daybreak when I awake, the sister drew the bedclothes shadily around Charlie's face. My bluebird flutters away, I'm forever blowing bubbles, pretty bubbles, in the air. Just then the good woman was brought into the ward, bearing with her messages from Maud, worthy of little Eva herself, and full of holy forgiveness, and at the edge of the screen sister met her. His wife, said sister? A moment too late. I am sorry. The good woman was looking at the bad woman by the bed, so sister made a vague explanation. He just wanted a song, she said. End of Story 10 Story 11 of The Best British Short Stories of 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Best British Short Stories of 1922 by Various. Story 11, A Hedonist by John Galsworthy. From Pears Annual and The Century Magazine. 1921. Rupert K. Van Ness remains freshly in my mind because he was so fine and large, and because he summed up in his person and behavior a philosophy which, budding before the war, hibernated during that distressing epoch and is now again in bloom. He was a New Yorker addicted to Italy, one often puzzled over the composition of his blood. From his appearance it was rich, and his name fortified the conclusion. What the K stood for, however, I never learned. The three possibilities were equally intriguing. Had he a strain of Highlander with Kenneth or Keith? A drop of German or Scandinavian with Kurt or Knut? 
a blend of Syrian or Armenian with Khalil or Kassim. The blue in his fine eyes seemed to preclude the last, but there was an encouraging curve in his nostrils and a raven gleam in his auburn hair, which, by the way, was beginning to grizzle and recede when I knew him. The flesh of his face, too, had sometimes a tired and pouchy appearance, and his tall body looked a trifle rebellious within his extremely well-cut clothes. But, after all, he was fifty-five. You felt that Vaness was a philosopher. Yet he never bored you with his views, and was content to let you grasp his moving principle gradually through watching what he ate, drank, smoked, wore, and how he encircled himself with the beautiful things and people of this life. One presumed him rich, for one was never aware of money in his presence. Life moved round him with a certain noiseless ease, or stood still at a perfect temperature, like the air in a conservatory round a choice blossom which a draught might shrivel. This image of a flower in relation to Rupert K. Van S. pleases me, because of that little incident in Magnolia Gardens near Charleston, South Carolina. Van S. was the sort of a man of whom one could never say with safety whether he was revolving round a beautiful young woman, or whether the beautiful young woman was revolving around him. His looks, his wealth, his taste, his reputation, invested him with a certain sun-like quality. But his age, the recession of his locks, and the advancement of his waist were beginning to dim his lustre, so that whether he was moth or candle was becoming a moot point. It was moot to me, watching him and Miss Sabine Munroy at Charleston throughout the month of March. The casual observer would have said that she was playing him up, as a young poet of my acquaintance puts it, but I was not casual. For me, Van Ness had the attraction of a theorem, and I was looking rather deeply into him and Miss Munroy. That girl had charm. She came, I think, from Baltimore, with a strain in her, they said, of old southern French blood. Tall and what is known as willowy, with dark chestnut hair, very broad dark eyebrows, very soft quick eyes, and a pretty mouth. When she did not accentuate it with lip salve, she had more sheer quiet vitality than any girl I ever saw. It was delightful to watch her dance, ride, play tennis. She laughed with her eyes. She talked with a savoring vivacity. She never seemed tired or bored. She was, in one hackneyed word, attractive. And Van S., the connoisseur, was quite obviously attracted. Of men who professionally admire beauty, one can never tell offhand whether they definitely design to add a pretty woman to their collection, or whether their dalliance is just a matter of habit. But he stood and sat about her, he drove and rode, listened to music, and played cards with her. He did all but dance with her, and even at times trembled on the brink of that. And his eyes, those fine, lustrous eyes of his, followed her about. How she had remained unmarried to the age of twenty-six was a mystery, till one reflected that with her power of enjoying life she could not yet have had the time. Her perfect physique was at full stretch for eighteen hours out of the twenty-four every day. Her sleep must have been like that of a baby. One figured her sinking into dreamless rest the moment her head touched the pillow, and never stirring till she sprang up into her bath. As I say, for me, Van S., or rather his philosophy, erat demonstrandum. I was philosophically in some distress just then. The microbe of fatalism, already present in the brains of artists before the war, had been considerably enlarged by that depressing occurrence. Could a civilization, basing itself on the production of material advantages, 
do anything but ensure the desire for more and more material advantages could it promote progress even of a material character except in countries whose resources were still much in excess of their population the war had seemed to me to show that mankind was too combative an animal ever to recognize that the good of all was the good of one the coarse fibred pugnacious and self-seeking would i had become sure always carry too many guns for the refined and kindly the march of science appeared on the whole to be carrying us backward i deeply suspected that there had been ages when the populations of this earth though less numerous and comfortable had been proportionately healthier than they were at present as for religion i had never had the least faith in providence rewarding the pitiable by giving them a future life of bliss the theory seemed to me illogical for the more pitiable in this life appeared to me the thick-skinned and successful and these as we know in the saying about the camel and the needle's eye our religion consigns wholesale to hell success power wealth those aims of profiteers and premiers pedagogues and pandemoniacs of all in fact who could not see god in a dewdrop hear him in distant goat bells and scent him in a pepper tree had always appeared to me akin to dry rot and yet every day one saw more distinctly that they were the pea in the thumble rig of life the hub of a universe which to the approbation of the majority they represented they were fast making uninhabitable it did not even seem of any use to help one's neighbors all efforts at relief just gilded the pill and encouraged our stubbornly contentious leaders to plunge us all into fresh miseries so i was searching right and left for something to believe in willing to accept even rupert k van s and his basking philosophy but could a man bask his life right out could just looking at fine pictures tasting rare fruits and wines the mere listening to good music the scent of azaleas and the best tobacco above all the society of pretty women keep salt in my bread an ideal in my brain could they that's what i wanted to know every one who goes to charleston in the spring soon or late visits magnolia gardens a painter of flowers and trees i specialize in gardens and freely assert that none in the world is so beautiful as this even before the magnolias come out it consigns the boboli at florence the cinnamon gardens of colombo concepcion at malaga versailles hampton court the henrelief at granada and la mortola to the category of also ran nothing so free and gracious so lovely and wistful nothing so richly colored yet so ghost-like exists planted by the sons of men it is a kind of paradise which has wandered down a miraculously enchanted wilderness brilliant with azaleas or magnolias it centers round a pool of dreamy water overhung by tall trunks wanly festooned with the grey florida moss beyond anything i have ever seen it is otherworldly and i went there day after day drawn as one is drawn in youth by visions of the ionian sea of the east or the pacific isles i used to sit paralyzed by the absurdity of putting brush to canvas in front of that dream pool i wanted to paint of it a picture like that of the fountain by hellier which hangs in the luxembourg but i knew i never should i was sitting there one sunny afternoon with my back to a clump of azaleas watching an old colored gardener so old that he had started life as an owned negro they said and certainly still retained the familiar suavity of the old-time darky 
I was watching him prune the shrubs when I heard the voice of Rupert K. Vaness say, quite close, 'There's nothing for me but beauty, Miss Monroy.' The two were evidently just behind my azalea clump, perhaps four yards away, yet as invisible as if in China. "'Beauty is a wide, wide word. Define it, Mr. Vaness.' "'An ounce of fact is worth a ton of theory. It stands before me. Come now, that's just a get-out. Is beauty of the flesh or of the spirit?' "'What is the spirit, as you call it? I'm a pagan.' "'Oh, so am I. But the Greeks were pagans.' Well. Spirit is only the refined side of sensuous appreciations. I wonder. I have spent my life in finding that out. Then the feeling this garden rouses in me is purely sensuous? Of course. If you were standing there blind and deaf, without the power of scent and touch, where would your feeling be? You are very discouraging, Mr. Vaness. No, madam, I face facts. When I was a youngster I had plenty of fluffy aspiration towards I didn't know what. I even used to write poetry. Oh, Mr. Vaness, was it good? It was not. I very soon learned that a genuine sensation was worth all the uplift in the world. What is going to happen when your senses strike work? I shall sit in the sun and fade out. I certainly do like your frankness. You think me a cynic, of course. I am nothing so futile, Miss Sabine. A cynic is just a posing ass, proud of his attitude. I see nothing to be proud of in my attitude, just as I see nothing to be proud of in the truth of existence. Suppose you had been poor my senses would be lasting better than they are, and when at last they failed, I should die quicker from want of food and warmth, that's all. Have you ever been in love, Mr. Vaness? I am in love now. And your love has no element of devotion, no finer side? None. It wants. I have never been in love, but if I were, I think I should want to lose myself rather than to gain the other. Would you? Sabine, I am in love with you. Oh, shall we walk on? I heard their footsteps and was alone again, with the old gardener lopping at his shrubs. But what a perfect declaration of hedonism! How simple and how solid was the Vaness theory of existence, almost Assyrian, worthy of Louis Keynes. And just then the old negro came up. It's a pleasant settin', he said, in his polite and hoarse half-whisper. Dar ain't no flies yet. It's perfect, Richard. This is the most beautiful spot in the world. Such, he answered, softly drawling, in the war time, the Yanks nearly burned the house here, Sherman's Yanks. Such they did. Powerful angry with old Massa they was, cause he hit up the silver plate afore he went away. My old father was de facto talum then. The Yanks took em, sir. They took em, and the Major he tell my father to show em where the plate was. My old father, he look at him and say, What you take me for? You take me for a sneakin' nigger? No, sub. You can do what you want with this child. He ain't going to act no Judas. No, sir. And the Yankee major, he put him up agin that tall lob oak there, and he say, You dern ungrateful nigger, I's come all this way to set you free. Now whar's dot silver plate, or I shoot you up, such? No, sir, says my father, shoot away. I was never going to tell. So they began to shoot and shot all round him to skeer him up. I was a little boy then, and I see my old father with my own eyes, sir, standin' thar as bold as Peter. No, sir, they didn't never get no word from him. He loved the folk here, 
Such he did, sah." The old man smiled, and in that beatific smile I saw not only his perennial pleasure in the well known story, but the fact that he, too, would have stood there, with the bullets raining round him, sooner than betray the folk he loved. "'Fine story, Richard! But very silly, obstinate old man, your father, wasn't he?' He looked at me with a sort of startled anger, which slowly broadened into a grin, then broke into soft, hoarse laughter. "'Oh, yes, sir, sir! Very silly, obstinacious old man! Yes, sir, indeed!' And he went off cackling to himself. He had only just gone when I heard footsteps again behind my azalea clump and Miss Monroe's voice. "'Your philosophy is that of fawn and nymph. Can you play the part? Only let me try." Those words had such a fevered ring that in imagination I could see Vaness all flushed, his fine eyes shining, his well-kept hands trembling, his lips a little protruded. There came a laugh, high, gay, sweet. Very well, then, catch me. I heard a swish of skirts against the shrubs, the sound of flight, an astonished gasp from Van Ness, and the heavy thud-thud of his feet following on the path through the azalea maze. I hoped fervently that they would not suddenly come running past and see me sitting there. My straining ears caught another laugh far off, a panting sound, a muttered oath, a far-away cooey and then, staggering, winded, pale with heat and vexation, Vaness appeared, caught sight of me, and stood a moment. Sweat was running down his face, his hand was clutching at his side, his stomach heaved, a hunter beaten and undignified. He muttered, turned abruptly on his heel, and left me staring at where his fastidious dandyism and all that it stood for had so abruptly come undone. I know not how he and Miss Monroy got home to Charleston. Not in the same car, I fancy. As for me, I travelled deep in thought, aware of having witnessed something rather tragic, not looking forward to my next encounter with Van Ness. He was not at dinner, but the girl was there, as radiant as ever, and though I was glad she had not been caught, I was almost angry at the signal triumph of her youth. She wore a black dress with a red flower in her hair, and another at her breast, and had never looked so vital and so pretty. Instead of dallying with my cigar beside cool waters in the lounge of the hotel, I strolled out afterward on the battery, and sat down beside the statue of a tutelary personage. A lovely evening, from some tree or shrub close by, emerged an adorable faint fragrance, and in the white electric light the acacia foliage was patterned out against a thrilling blue sky. If there were no fireflies abroad, there should have been a night for hedonists, indeed. And suddenly, in fancy, there came before me Vanessa's well-dressed person, panting, pale, perplexed. And beside him, by a freak of vision, stood the old darkey's father, bound to the live oak, with the bullets whistling past, and his face transfigured. There they stood, alongside the creed of pleasure which depended for fulfillment on its waist measurement, and the creed of love, devoted unto death. Aha! I thought, which of the two laughs last? And just then I saw Vaness himself, beneath a lamp, cigar in mouth, and cape flung back so that its silk lining shone. Pale and heavy, in the cruel white light his face had a bitter look, and I was sorry, very sorry, at that moment, for Rupert K. Vaness. End of Story 11
Story twelve of the best British short stories of nineteen twenty two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The best British short stories of nineteen twenty two by various. Story twelve The Bat and Belfry Inn by Alan Graham from the storyteller 1922 readers note boots is a term for a hotel servant who cleans and polishes boots and shoes carries luggage and so forth it was the maddest and most picturesque hotel at which we have ever stopped tony and i were touring north wales we had left Clendudno that morning in the two-seater, lunched at Festiniog, and late in the afternoon were trundling down a charming valley with the reluctant assistance of a road whose surface, if it ever had possessed such an asset, had long since vanished. On rounding one of the innumerable hairpin bends on our road, there burst upon us the most gorgeous miniature scene that we had ever encountered. I stopped the car almost automatically. "'Oh, George, what a charming hotel!' exclaimed Tony. "'Let's stop and have tea.' Tony, I should mention, is my wife. She is intensely practical. I had not noticed the hotel, for before us the valley opened out into a perfect stage setting. From the road the land fell sharply a hundred feet to a rocky mountain stream, the rustle of whose water came up to us faintly like the music heard in a seashell. Beyond rose hills, hill upon hill, lit patchily by the sun, so that their contours were a mingling of brilliant purple heather, red-brown bracken, and indigo shadow. Far down the valley the stream glinted, mirror-like, through a veil of trees. And Tony spoke of tea. I dragged my eyes from the magnet of the view and found that I had stopped the car within a few yards of a little hotel that must have been planted there originally by someone with a soul. It lay by the open roadside, five miles from anywhere. It was built of the rough grey-green stone of the district, but it was rescued from the commonplace by its leaded windows, the big old beams that angled across its white plastered gables, and by the clematis and late tea-roses that clung about its porch. I could hardly blame Tony for her materialism. The hotel blended admirably with its surroundings. There was nothing about it of the beer-house on the mountain-top so dear to the German mind. It looked quiet, refined, and restful, and one felt instinctively that it would be managed in a fashion in keeping with all about it. "'By Jove, Tony,' I said, as I drew up to the clematis-covered porch, "'we might do worse than stop here for a day or two. "'We'll have tea anyhow, and see what we think of it.' I clattered over the red-tiled floor, and when my eyes had grown accustomed to the dim light that contrasted so well with the sunshine without, found myself in a small sunshiny room with a low ceiling, oak-rafted, some comfortable chairs, an old eight-day clock stopped at ten-thirty-five, and a man. He was a long, thin man, clean-shaven, wearing an old shooting-coat and a pair of shabby grey flannel trousers. He smoked a pipe and read in a book. At my entrance he did not look up, and I set him down as a guest in the hotel. One side of the room was built of obscured glass panes with an open square in the middle and a ledge upon which rested several suggestive empty glasses. So I crossed to this hospitable-looking gap and tapped upon the ledge. Several repetitions bringing no response, I turned to the only living creature who appeared to be available. "'Can you tell me, sir, if we can have tea in the hotel?' I asked. The long man started, looked up, closed his book, and jumped to his feet as if galvanized to life. "'Of course, of course, of course!' he cried hastily, and added, as by an afterthought, "'Of course!' I may have shown a natural surprise at this almost choral response, for he pulled himself together and became something more explicit. 
"I'll see to it at once," he said hurriedly. "I'm uh, I'm the proprietor, you know. You don't mind if we're uh, if we're a little upset. You see, I I have just moved in. Left me by an uncle, you know, an uncle in Australia. I'll see to it at once. Anything you would like, specially fancy? Bread and butter now, or cake, perhaps? Will you take a seat? Two seats. Tony had followed me in. And look at yesterday's paper. Oh, yes, you can have tea. Of course, of, of course, of, of course, of— His words petered out as he clattered off down a like-flagged passage. I looked at Tony and raised my eyebrows. "'Seems a trifle mad,' I said. "'How delightfully cool,' said she, looking round the old-fashioned room appraisingly, "'and so clean. I think we'll stop.' "'Let's have tea before we decide,' I suggested. "'The proprietor is distinctly eccentric, to say the least of it.' "'He looked quite a superior man, I thought,' said Tony. "'Not the least like a Welshman.' Tony herself comes from far north of the Tweed. The hotel was small, and the kitchen apparently not far away, for we could not avoid hearing sounds of what appeared to be a heated argument coming from the direction in which mine host had vanished. We were used to heated arguments in the hotels at which we had put up, but they had invariably taken place in Welsh, whereas this one was undoubtedly in English. Snatches of it reached our ears. "'Haven't the pluck of a rabbit, Bill. "'All very well, but I'm not afraid I'll—' "'Then our host returned. "'It's coming, it's coming, it's coming,' he said, "'his hands thrust deep in his trousers' pockets, "'jingling loose change in a manner that suggested agitation. "'He stood looking down at us as though we were something "'he didn't quite know what to do with, "'and then an idea seemed to strike him, and be vanished for a moment to reappear almost immediately in the square gap of the bar window. "'Have a drink while you're waiting?' he asked, much more naturally. I looked at my watch. It was half-past four. Very free and easy with the licensing laws, I thought. "'I thought six o'clock was opening time,' I said. The thin man was overcome with confusion. His face flushed red. He shut the window down with a bang, and a moment after came round to us again. "'Awfully sorry,' he stammered apologetically. "'Might get the house a bad name. Deuced inconsiderate of, of my uncle not to leave me a book of the rules. Very bad break, that. What?' Evidently Tony was not so much impressed by the eccentricities of our host as I was. She approved of the hotel and its situation and had made up her mind to stop. I could tell it by her face as she addressed the proprietor. "'Have you accommodation if we should make up our minds to stay here for a few days?' she asked. "'Stay here? You want to stay?' he repeated, consternation written large all over his face. "'Good God! I mean, uh, certainly, of course, of course!' He bolted down the passage like a rabbit, and we heard hoarse whispering from the direction in which he had gone. Dotty, I suggested. Not a bit of it, retorted Tony, nervous because he is new to his job, but very anxious to be obliging. We shall do splendidly here. I shrugged my shoulders and said no more, because I know Tony. I have been married to her for years and years. Light steps upon the tiles heralded something new, different, but equally surprising. "'Tea is served, madam, if you will step this way.' She was the apotheosis of all waitresses. Her frock was black, but it was of silk and finely cut. Her apron, of coarse white cotton, was grotesque against it. She had neat little feet, encased in high-heeled shoes, and her stockings were of silk. Her common cap that she wore sat coquettishly on her dark curls, and her face was charming, though petrified in that unnatural expression of distance which, as a rule, only the very best menials can attain. 
There were no other guests in the coffee room, and this marvel of maids devoted the whole of her attention to us, standing over us like a column of ice which thawed only to attend upon our wants. There was no getting past her veil of reticence. Tony tried her with questions, but, yes, madam, no, madam, and certainly, madam, appeared the sum of her vocabulary. Yet when we sent her to the kitchen for more hot water, we were conscious of a whispering and giggling, which assured us that off the stage she could thaw. "'We must stay a day or two, said Tony. "'I'm dying to paddle in that burn.' "'My dear, how often have you promised me that you would never subject me to scotch after we were married?' I protested. "'When I see a burn, I e'en must just paddle in it,' retorted Tony, deliberately forswearing herself. So we'll book that room." At that moment the celestial waitress returned with the hot water, and Tony made known her determination. I drive the car, but Tony supplies the driving power. Uh, certainly, madam, I shall speak to Mr. Gunthorpe. Quickly she returned. Number ten is vacant. The boots and chambermaid are both away at a sheep trial, but we expect them back any moment. I shall show you the room, madam, and if you will leave the car, sir, until the boots returns, oh, that will be all right. No hurry, no hurry. While we were examining our bedroom and finding it all that could be desired, I heard a car draw up before the hotel and the sound of voices in conversation. A few minutes later, on going downstairs, I made the acquaintance of the boots. He was obviously awaiting me by my car and touched his forelock in a manner rarely seen off the stage. He wore khaki cord breeches with leather leggings, a striped shirt open at the neck, and chewed a straw desperately. In no other respect did he resemble the boots of an out-of-the-way hotel. "'Garage round this way, sir,' he said, guiding me to my destination, which I found already contained a two-seater of the same make as my own. "'Ripping little car, eh?' said the boots, chewing vigorously at his straw, as he stood, his hands deep in what are graphically known as go-to-hell pockets, and his legs well straddled. "'Hop over anything, what? Topping weather we're having. Been like this for weeks. If you don't mind, old chap, you might wiggle her over this way a bit. Something else might blow in, eh?' I looked at this latest manifestation with undisguised astonishment, but he was imperturbable, and merely chewed his straw with renewed energy. "'That's the stuff, old lad,' he said, as I laid the car in position. "'What now? Shall I give you a hand up with the trunk, or will you hump it yourself? Don't mind me a bit. I'm ready for anything.' He looked genial, but I found him familiar. So with a curt, take it to number ten, I strode off to overtake Tony, whom I saw halfway down a rough path that led to her beloved burn. I've seen the chambermaid, she said, when I overtook her. Such a pretty girl, but very shy and unsophisticated. Quite a girl, but wears a wedding ring. I watched Tony paddling for some time, but as the amusement consisted mainly of getting her under apparel wet, I grew tired of it and climbed back to the hotel. The bar window was open once more in the little lounge, and Mr. Gunthorpe was behind, his arms resting upon the ledge. "'Have a drink,' he said as I entered. "'It's all right now. The balloon's gone up.' I looked at my watch. It was after six o'clock. "'I'll have a small scotch and soda,' I decided. "'This is on the house,' said the eccentric landlord. He produced two glasses and filled them, and I noticed that he took money from his pocket and placed it in the till. "'Well, success to the new management,' I said, raising my glass to his. "'Cheerio, and thank you,' said he, smiling genially upon me. He seemed to me more self-possessed and less eccentric than he had appeared upon our arrival. I determined to draw him out. "'It's funny that an Australian should have owned a hotel away up in the Welsh hills,' I hazarded. "'Did he die recently?' 
"Australia? You must have misunderstood me," said Mr. Gunthorpe, with a hunted look in his eyes. "Very likely, very likely I said Ostend." "Ostend? Well, possibly I did," I agreed, feeling certain that I had made no mistake. "Had he a hotel there as well?" "Yes, yes, yes, of course, of course, of course," agreed the landlord, largely redundant. "And are you running that as well?" "Heaven forbid!" he exclaimed with a shudder. "You see, uh, th this, th this is just a small legacy. It'll be all right by and by. All right, all right. Oh, let's have another drink." "With me," I insisted. "Not at all, not at all. On the house, all for the good of the house. Come along, Bob. Have a drink." It was the Boots who had now entered, and he strolled up to the bar with all the self-possession of a welcome guest. "'Just a spot of scotch, old thing,' he said brightly. "'It's a hard life. Shaking down good and comfy, laddie,' this last to me. "'Ask for anything you fancy. It doesn't follow you'll get it, but if we have it, it's yours. Tinkle, tinkle, crash, crash.' With this unusual toast, he raised his glass and drained it. "'Have another,' he said. Three scotches, Boniface.' I protested. This was too hot and fast for me altogether. Besides, I did not fancy being indebted to this somewhat overwhelming boots. My protest was of no avail. The glasses were filled while yet the words were upon my lips. I thought of Tony and trembled common decency would force me to stand still another round before I could cry a halt. "'All well in the buttery?' asked the Boots, in a confidential tone of the landlord. "'The banquet is in preparation,' replied the latter. "'Everything is in train.' "'Heaven grant that it comes out of train reasonably, laddie,' said Boots fervently. "'But you know Molly. I wouldn't trust an ostrich to her cooking. Here's hoping for the best.' He drained his glass again, and this time I managed to get a show. Three more whiskies, please, landlord, and Tony in clear view, cut up into nice squares by the little leaded panes. I got mine absorbed just in time, and was on the doorstep to meet her, draggle-skirted and untidy, but enthusiastic about her burn. She broke her vows three times on the way up to number ten, and excused her lapses on the ground that the burn was the perfect image of one near a place she called Peth. When she rang for hot water to wash away the traces of her ablutions in the burn, I had my first view of the chambermaid. I found her even more ravishing than the waitress downstairs, and with the additional advantage that she was not standoffish. Indeed, she was a giggler. She giggled at my slightest word, and Tony altered her first impression and dubbed her a forward hussy. Personally, I liked the girl, though she broke all precedent by attending upon us in a silk blouse and a tailor-made tweed skirt. When I wandered downstairs before dinner, I came upon her again, this time unmistakably in the arms of the ubiquitous boots. I had walked innocently into a small sitting-room where a lamp already shone, and I came upon the romantic picture unexpectedly. With a murmured word of inarticulate apology, I made to retire. "'It's all right, old fruit. Don't hurry away,' said Boots affably. "'Awfully sorry, and all that. Quite forgot it was a public room, don't you know?' The chambermaid giggled once more and bolted, straightening her cap as she went. "'You don't mind, do you?' continued Boots, making a clumsy show of trimming the lamp. "'Warm is the greeting when seas have rolled between us. Perhaps not quite that, but you see the idea, hm?' He would doubtless have said more, being evidently of a cheery nature, had not the waitress of the afternoon appeared in the doorway, her face as frozen as a mask of ice. "'Bob! Kennel!' she said sharply and held the door wide. The cheeriness vanished, and the boots followed it through the open doorway. "'I trust you will excuse him, sir,' said the waitress deferentially. 
He is just a little deranged, but quite harmless. We employ him out of charity, sir. I may have been mistaken, but a sound uncommonly like the chambermaid's giggle came to me from the passage without. The sound of a car stopping outside the hotel drew me to the window as the waitress left me. I was in time to see an old gentleman with a long white beard step from the interior of a Daimler landelette, the door of which was held open by a dignified chauffeur, whose attire seemed to consist mainly of brass buttons. A consultation evidently took place in the smoking-room or bar between this patriarch and the proprietor, and then I heard agitated voices in the passage without. "'It's a blinking invasion,' said Mr. Gunthorpe. "'I tell you, we can't do it. Good heavens! They threaten to stop a month, if they are comfortable.' "'Don't worry, then, old bean. They won't stop long.' This in the voice of Boots. "'And they want special diet. Old girl can't eat meat, suffers from a duodenal ulcer. I tell you, we got quick intimate. We can't do it, Molly.' "'Fathead, of course we can. I'll concoct her something the like of which her what-you-may-call-it has never before tackled. Run along, Bill, and be affable.' "'Shall I stand them a drink?' Mr. Gunthorpe again. "'Do, old bean. I'll come and have one, too,' said Boots. "'You won't, Bob. You'll see to the chauffeur and the car and the luggage.' "'Hang the luggage. I'll stand the chauffeur a drink.' Then the female voice spoke warningly. "'You've had enough drinks already, both of you,' it said. You ought to bear in mind that you're not running the hotel just for your two selves. It's all right, old girl. There's plenty for everybody. Cellar's full of it. The voices died away, and I strolled out into the bar once more. Mr. Gunthorpe was being affable, according to instructions, to the old gentleman, while an old lady in a bonnet looked on piercingly. "'Quite all right about the diet,' the landlord was saying as I entered. "'We make a specialty of special diets. In fact, our ordinary diet is a special diet. Certainly, of course. We've got mulligatawny soup, sardines, roast beef, trifle, and gorgonzola cheese. Uh, perhaps you'll have a drink while you wait?' "'Certainly not, sir,' replied the old gentleman testily. "'You seem to be unable to comprehend.' My wife has a duodenal ulcer, sir, had it for fourteen years in September, and you talk to me of mulligatawny soup. I, I quite understand, of course, of course, replied Mr. Gunthorpe urbanely. Everything of a, an irritating character will be left out of the— Then it won't be mulligatawny soup, you fool, exploded the old lady, whose pressure I had seen rising for some time. "'Certainly not, madam. Uh, of course, indubitably. We'll call it beef-tea, and it will never know.' "'What will never know?' asked the old gentleman, with an air of puzzlement. "'Madam's duodenal ulcer, sir,' replied the landlord, with a deferential bow, dedicated, doubtless, to that organ. Each separate hair in the old gentleman's beard began to curl and coil with the electricity of exasperation and at every moment I expected to see sparks fly out from it. The old lady folded her hands across her treasure and looked daggers at the landlord. "'How far is it to the nearest hotel, John?' she demanded acidly. "'Too far to go to-night, Mary. I'm afraid we must put up with this—this this sanatorium,' replied her husband. As a diversion I demanded an appetizer a gin and bitters. Mr. Gunthorpe's face lit up, and he bolted behind the bar. "'Certainly, of course. Have it with me!' he exclaimed eagerly, his eyes full of gratitude for the diversion. I had the greatest difficulty in paying for our two drinks, for of course Mr. Gunthorpe would not let me drink alone, and I was equally insistent that the house had done enough for me. Well, then you must have another, he declared, as the only way out of the difficulty. Fortunately for me, Tony appeared on the scene, clothed and in her right mind, speaking once more the English language, 
and I contrived to avoid further stimulation. Mr. Gunthorpe looked at me reproachfully as I moved off with my wife. I could see that he dreaded further interrogation on the subject of diets. Nothing further of moment occurred before dinner. Tony and I went out and admired the wonderful view in the dim half-light, and just as the midges got the better of us, even my foul old pipe did not give us the victory, the gong sounded for dinner and covered our retreat. It was the maddest dinner in which I have ever participated. Three tables were laid in the little coffee-room, and, as Tony and I were the first to put in an appearance, I had the curiosity to look at the bill of fare at the first table I came to. "'This way, sir, if you please,' said the chilling voice of our exemplary waitress. Already I had deciphered beef tea and steamed sole on the card, and concluded that the table was reserved for the duodenal ulcer. At the table to which we were conducted I found mulligatawny soup figuring on the menu, and I wondered. The old lady and gentleman were ushered to their seats by the boots, now smartly dressed in striped trousers and black coat and waistcoat. I say smartly, because the clothes were of good material, and the wearer looked easily the best-clad man in the hotel. The two places laid at the third table were taken by a boy and girl of such youthful appearance that both Tony and I were astonished to find them living alone in an hotel. The boy might have been fifteen, and the girl twelve at the most, but that they were overwhelmingly at home in their surroundings was quickly manifest, as was the fact that they were brother and sister. This latter fact was evidenced by the manner in which the boy bullied the girl and contradicted her at every opportunity. There was something of a strained wait when all of us had taken our places. I saw the old gentleman, eyeglasses on the tip of his nose, studying the bill of fare intently. And then he turned to his wife. "'Minced chicken and rice, peptonized,' he said suspiciously. Did you ever hear of such a dish, Mary?" "'Never, but nothing would surprise me in this place,' replied his wife, looking round the room with a censorious eye that even included the innocent Tony and myself. The two children chuckled. They wore an air of expectancy such as I have noticed in my nephews and nieces when I have been inveighed into taking them to masculine show. They seemed on very intimate terms with the waitress, and the mere sight of the boots sent them into fits of suppressed chuckling. He, standing by the sideboard, napkin over arm, added to their hilarity by winking violently at regular intervals. Catching my eye upon him, he crossed to our table. "'Everything all right, eh?' he said, glancing over the layout of our table. "'Everything, except that so far we have had no food,' I replied. "'It's the soup,' he said, leaning confidentially to my ear. "'The cat fell into it, and they're combing it out of her fur. "'Have a drink while you wait?' "'No. All right, old thing. I dare say you know best when you've had enough.' "'Shut up, you kids! Don't you see you're irritating the old boy?' this in a horse aside to the children at the next table. It made them giggle the more. "'Surely they are very young to be stopping here alone,' said Tony, with a touch of her national inquisitiveness. "'Very sad case, madam,' replied the Boots. "'We found them here when we came. You know, wrapped in a blanket on the doorstep. Not quite, perhaps, but you see the idea. Sort of wards of the hotel.' He was interrupted by the entrance of the waitress with soup. She gave him a frozen glance and a jerk of the head, and he vanished to the kitchen to return with more soup, and at last we got a start on our meal. The soup was good, notwithstanding the story of the cat. It really was mulligatawny. There was no doubt about that. The old couple were not so well satisfied. They sipped a little, had a whispered consultation, and beckoned the boots. "'Waiter, why do you call this beef tea?' 
demanded the old gentleman. "'You can't have me there, my lad,' retorted the boots cheerily. "'From the Latin, beef, beef and tea, tea, beef tea. Take a spoonful of tea and a lump of beef, shake well together, simmer gently till ready, and serve with a ham frill.' The old gentleman's face showed deep purple against his white whiskers, and the waitress left our table hurriedly, hustled the boots from the room, and crossed to the old couple. I could not hear all she said, but I understood that the boots was liable to slight delusions, but quite harmless. The beef tea was the best that could be prepared on such short notice, and so on. It was the main course of the meal that brought the climax. It was roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, excellently cooked, and, so far as we were concerned, efficiently served. The irrepressible boots had, however, by this time drifted back to duty. I saw him bear plates to the old people's table containing a pale mess which I rightly concluded was the minced chicken and rice peptonized already referred to by the old gentleman. The couple eyed it suspiciously, while their attendant hovered near, apparently awaiting the congratulations which were bound to follow the consumption of the dish. "'John, it's beef!' screamed the old lady, starting to her feet and spluttering. "'Damn! So it is!' confirmed her husband, after a bare mouthful. "'Hi, you scoundrel! poisoner, assassin, send the manager here at once. He waved his napkin in fury, and Boots cocked an eye at him curiously. Uh, won't you have another try, he urged. Be sporty about it. Hang it, it looks like chopped chicken, and it is chopped. I chopped it myself. Have another try. You'll believe it in time if you persevere. It's the first step that counts, you know. I used to be able to say that in French, but he only got so far because the old gentleman had been inarticulate with rage. Fetch the manager, and don't dare utter another word. Confound you! he shouted. A few moments later our friend Mr. Gunthorpe entered. His eyes were bright, and a satisfied smile rested on his lips. "'Good evening, sir,' he began affably. "'I believe you sent for me. I hope everything is to your taste.' "'Everything is nothing of the sort, sir,' retorted the old gentleman. "'You have attempted a gross fraud upon us, sir. I find on the menu chicken, and it is nothing more or less than chopped beef. And peptonized? Peptonized be hanged, sir.' It's no more peptonized than my hat. Well, sir, as for your hat, I can say nothing but none of your insolence, sir. I insist on having this filth taken away and something suitable put before us. My wife has possessed a duodenal ulcer for fourteen years, come September, and be hanged to your duodenal ulcer. As this isn't its birthday, why should it have a blinking banquet? Let it take potluck with the rest of us. A sudden burst of uncontrollable laughter made me turn sharply to find that the reserve had fallen from our chilly waitress, who was vainly endeavoring to smother her laughter in her professional napkin. Oh, Bill, she cried, you've done it now. The game's up. The old lady and gentleman arose in outraged dignity and started to leave the room, when a diversion was caused by the entrance of a pleasant-faced lady in hat and cloak. I had been semi-conscious for some moments of a motor engine running at the hotel door. "'Oh, Mr. Gunthorpe, what luck!' cried the newcomer. I've collected a full staff and brought them all up from Dolgally with me, look you. Thank heaven, exclaimed the proprietor, as soon as your barmaid is on her job, we'll drink all their healths. I hope you won't be annoyed, Miss Jones, but I fear, I very greatly fear, you will lose a couple of likely customers at dawn or soon after. 
Here they are. Perhaps you can still pacify them. I can't. Miss Jones turned to the old couple, who were waiting for the doorway to clear, with a disarming and conciliatory smile. I hope you will make allowances, she said, with a musical Welsh intonation. I am the manageress, and everything is at sixes and sevens, look you. This morning I had trouble with the staff, and just to annoy me they all cleared off together. I had to leave the hotel to see what I could find in Dalgally. Mr. Gunthorpe and the other guests at the hotel very kindly offered to see to things while I was away, and I'm sure they have done their best, indeed." "'Done their best to poison us, certainly,' growled the old gentleman. "'My wife has a do -a "'That's all right, old chap,' interrupted Mr. Gunthorpe. "'Miss Jones is an expert in those things. She'll feed it the proper tack, believe me. Give her a chance, and don't blame her for our shortcomings." By this time the whole mock staff had taken the stage. Waitress, boots, chambermaid, and a pleasant-faced lady of matronly appearance, who, I learnt, was Mrs. Gunthorpe, and the mother of the two children of whom we had been told such a harrowing history. "'And just think, dear,' said Tony, smiling at me across the table, the boots and the chambermaid are on their honeymoon. He is a journalist. How do you know all this? I demanded suspiciously. I wormed the whole thing out of the chambermaid at the very beginning, said Tony. I didn't tell you because I thought it would be more fun. Miss Jones succeeded in pacifying the old couple somehow, mainly, I think, by promises of a new regime, and we left them in the coffee room looking almost cheerful. Tony and I went out to talk in the moonlight, while I smoked an after-dinner cigar. We were gone for some time, and on our return decided to go straight upstairs to bed. I noticed that lights still burned in the coffee-room, and heard the sound of voices from that direction. Thinking that some late guests had arrived during our absence, I had the curiosity to glance round the door. The whole of our late staff sat round a table, on which were arrayed much food and several gilt-topped bottles. "'Come along! Do join us!' cried Mr. Gunthorpe, sighting us at once. "'Come and celebrate the end of this bat-in-the-belfry sort of management,' added Boots, holding high a sparkling glass. It ended in Tony and I being dragged into the celebration, and that ended in quite a late sitting. Tony and I lingered on for over a week at the Batten Belfry Inn, as we all called it, and, so strange to say, did the duodenal couple, whom, indeed, we left there, special dieting to their heart's content. End of Story Twelve